Today we begin the second in a series of hearings conducted by the Joint Fiscal Committees of the Legislature regarding the Governor's proposed budget for the fiscal years 2015-2016. The hearings are conducted pursuant to Article 7, Section 3 of the Constitution and Article 2 and Section 31 and 32A of the Legislative Law. Today, the Assembly Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee will hear testimony concerning the budget proposal for transportation. I will now introduce members from the Assembly that are with us. Assemblyman Cusick, Assemblyman Scopus, Assemblyman Brennan Chair, and Assemblyman Oaks, who will tell us this. Assemblyman McDonough is with us as well. Assemblyman McDonough. Assembly, uh, Senator DeFrancisco, would you give us our... And I also have Assemblyman Otis with us. And for the Senate, we have uh, Ranker, uh, Liz Kruger, Tim Kennedy, and Diane Sabino, all senators. First person to testify is Acting Executive Director Robert Megner, New York State Thruway Authority and Canal Corp. Welcome and good morning. Or is it good morning and welcome? <laughs> Thank you, Assemblyman, um, Chairman. Chairman DeFrancisco, Chairman Farrell, and members of the Senate and Assembly Fiscal and Transportation Committees, thank you for having me here today. I am Bob Megna, Acting Executive Director of the New York State Thruway Authority and the New York State Canal Corporation. This is, as you all know, a very significant year for the Thruway Authority as represented in the executive budget. The executive budget proposes a capital appropriation of nearly $1.3 billion for the Thruway Stabilization Program. We are extremely grateful to the governor for this infusion of capital. From the more than $5 billion in settlements with banks and financial institutions that became available this year. Some of these funds will be used to eliminate the need for a toll increase this year. Some will be used to support capital projects throughout the thruway system. Of course, a significant portion will be invested in the new New York Bridge project, which will help keep tolls at the tap NZ as low as possible for as long as possible. Design build contractor tap NZ constructors has now driven 77% of the piles that make up the foundation of this 100 year Hudson River crossing between Westchester and Rockland counties. The first vertical pier columns rose above the Hudson in September 2014. The pile caps that will support the iconic open towers of the new twin span bridge are also already in place. In October, Governor Cuomo welcomed the iLift New York Super Crane to the project site, one of the world's largest floating cranes. iLift New York is one of the keys to helping save more than $1 billion on the project compared to early cost estimates, in part by allowing large sections of the new cable stayed bridge to be prefabricated off-site in a safer, more efficient manner and brought in by barge. The executive budget also proposes to authorize the Thruway Authority and the New York State Department of Transportation to enter into agreements to provide mutual aid through the sharing of employees, services, and resources when and where appropriate, which will help us maximize every opportunity for operational efficiencies and cost savings. As you know, our operations include the state canal system, which spans 524 miles and includes the Erie, Champlain, Oswego, and Cayuga Seneca canals. The canals in the Erie Canal bike and pedestrian trail are increasingly popular recreational destinations for New Yorkers and other visitors. The canal system generates an estimated $380 million in annual tourism spending and commercial and residential development along the canal is increasing. 
The canals are also still used for commercial shipping. And a 2014 report found that the canal system supports over 6.2 million annually in non-tourism economic activity across the state by providing water for local drinking water as well as agricultural, industrial, and power generation uses. One final note, an important one. We would not do any of what we do without our employees across the state, and I want to take this opportunity uh, to acknowledge their hard work, dedication, and ongoing commitment to the highest standards of safety and reliability in every area of our operations. I got to see that in my first few days on the job um, with the latest storm, um, how quickly, effectively, and efficiently they moved equipment around the state um, to help with the, with the storm downstate. Again, let me thank you for your time. I'd be happy to respond to any of your questions. And let me thank the chairman for accommodating my schedule today. I have a board meeting, and they moved me first on the list, and I want to thank them for that convenience. Thank you very much. To begin, Assemblyman Brennan, Chair of Corporations. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Uh, good morning, Mr. Magna. Good morning. Hoping you're well. Thank you. Good Doing to see okay. you actually testifying. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, the, uh, the executive proposal, as you just mentioned, uh, includes $1.285 billion for Thruway Authority Capital. Uh, of this amount, how much will be used for the replacement of the Tappan Zee Bridge? You know, we're still working with folks who run the numbers on, you know, what the most effective use of financing for the bridge should be. I would say at this point, the, you know, a big chunk, a vast majority of the money will be used for bridge financing. I don't have an exact number to tell you today, but I think the, the vast majority of that amount would be dedicated to bridge financing. Uh, okay, that's that's perfectly understandable. Uh, uh, how much will be used for uh, to prevent a toll increase? Well, again, I think, and I'm glad you asked that question because there's been a lot of discussion about, or at least some conversations I've had with folks that we were going to use the remainder of the money maybe for operating expenses <clears throat> to keep tolls down. Uh, I don't think that's our intention at all. I think actually that would be a mistake. The Thruway Authority has a significant amount of capital expenditures on an annual basis. So I think what we'd like to do with what's not used for the bridge is use that money for capital investment, repair, and maintenance on the rest of the system. And we think a combination of doing those capital investments in a smart way and getting our budget under control, our operating expenses under control separately, will allow us to go through 2015 without a toll increase. And I think that's what the governor's talked about, going through 2015 without a toll increase. So at this time, you are saying that this $1.285 billion will be used for capital and will not be used to subsidize the day-to-day -day operations of the Thruway Authority in 2015. You know, my in, in folks from my old job, Assemblyman, would bang me over the head if I used one-time money for operating expenses, and I think it would be, you know, a bad use of those resources. I think we have, as I get more and more into the Thruway Authority budget, and I'm not going to pretend after a week to be an expert. It's clear we have significant annual capital expenses on the non-bridge part of the throughway that we will have plenty of opportunity to invest this money to improve the, the capital infrastructure of the throughway. And so we do not want to subsidize operating <clears throat> expenses with this money. All right, and, and that gets me to another point here. Um, 
according to the information I have, you have a 2.29 billion 15 to 19 <coughs> capital program without the Tappan Zee Bridge. And do you, is it, do you anticipate being able to uh, handle uh, that capital program with respect to your current funding situation? Well, I think it's a, another good question, Assemblyman. I think one of the things I'm looking at is what our capital outlays are planned to be over time, how we can merge in whatever we don't use on the bridge to supplement that capital program, and how we maybe can prioritize a little bit to um, save money where it's possible um, on that capital program. So I'm kind of right in the middle of that process right now. All right. Uh, do you have a completion date for the, the Tappan Zee Bridge? Right now, we believe that we're on time, on budget, on schedule. I couldn't give you the exact dates of sure I could get them to you, but nothing has changed from the original schedule. Of course, this is, as you all know, the largest infrastructure or one of the largest public infrastructure projects in the country. And so it is a challenge to keep it on schedule, but we are determined to do that. And as of today, you know, we're pushing to remain on time on budget. Uh, the, there is Article 7 legislation to increase toll evasion penalties and other enforcement mechanisms. Uh, do you have a projection on how much additional revenue that might uh, make for the Thruway Authority? Again, with the Thruway Authority, I think the issue um, is the Tappan Zee Bridge and construction that's going to take place around the toll plaza. And because of that construction, it is possible that we're going to go to full easy pass during that period of time because of the construction. And so one of the things that would be good is if we could um, you know, get that Article 7 legislation passed. I well, I'm, I'm not suggesting that, uh, that it's a bad idea. In fact, we've been trying to work with the administration for several years on a proposal, and we're, you know, I think we should try to get it done. But you don't know how much money no, I can get you an estimate. I think I don't want to give an estimate for the off throughway part of the system because I'm not exactly sure what that is, but we'll get you that number assembly. All right, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, oh, just one second. I've been joined by Assemblyman Roberts and Assemblyman Ortiz and some uh, Assemblyman Gant. Yes, sir. And we're been, we've been joined by Senator DeLon, and the next questioner would be Senator Savino. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator DeFrancisco. Uh, good morning, uh, Commissioner. It's good to see you again. I actually got confused when I walked in the room. I said, why is Bob Magna here? And completely forgetting in your new role at the Thruway Authority. I'm going to be brief. I won't use the whole seven minutes. I do want to pick up on some of the questions that Assemblyman Brennan made, because I am not a budgetary expert. Um, but I listened to your testimony, I listened to the governor's presentation where he talked about using a portion of the settlement from the bank settlements for the Thruway Authority. And the language is, so correct me if I'm misinterpreting this, we are grateful to the governor for this infusion of capital from the more than $5 billion in bank and financial settlements. Some of these funds will be used to eliminate the need for a toll increase. Now, I heard you say, and I was happy to hear you say, that that would be wrong to take this one-time money and use it for operational expenses. But I don't know how to interpret it any other way than the way you wrote it in your testimony. So exactly how are we going to do that without taking this one-time money and using it for operational expenses? No, it's a, thank you, Senator. It's a, it's a good question, and I think the testimony maybe is a little confusing. What I have learned so far in looking at the Thruway Authority budget is that it's a very, very capital intensive budget. And so I think it's perfectly clear that we can use whatever money is not invested in the bridge on capital improvements on the rest of the system mm -hmm. that will, to a certain extent, lower our net need to go out to the market to borrow money to do those kinds of investments. That will save us money both in the short run and in the long run. 
but to keep tolls down, it's not going to be just that. It's going, those monies will be used for capital, but we're also gonna have to look at the operating expenses of the Thruway Authority, and we're gonna have to try to make some savings. So again, our intention is that all $1.3 billion will be used for capital purposes. Again, this is not a $1.3 billion check, as I understand it, that's gonna be written to the Thruway Authority. It's gonna be held off to the side by my former um, uh, workforce. <laughs> and they are going to uh, uh, make that money available for capital purposes, <coughs> not for subsidizing operating. So I'm sorry for any confusion, but we're not gonna you know, subsidize tolls with capital money. We're gonna use capital money for capital purposes. That will actually save us money, which will help us keep tolls down, but we're still gonna have to make operating savings within the Thruway Authority to make sure that's true. And again, we're talking about 2015. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Assemblyman McDonough? No. No, no, pass. Oh, no, 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 I know that there was an attempt earlier on to do, uh, to get use some environmental funding, whatever that was rejected. Uh, at that point, this, there was said that there would be a um, a status of challenge, or you know, challenging that. Just checking to see uh, how we're doing with that. Is is that in place? Have we had a, a reaction from that? Well, again, um, Assemblyman, thank you. I have talked to folks about it. I don't pretend to have all the details. We are challenging the position that we can't use the EFC money for that purpose. I think the EFC chair would be better positioned to talk about the details of that. But again, we've always felt that that was based on what EFC recommended to us, a, a proper use of those funds. And my understanding is we continue to challenge um, the fact that we cannot use those resources. Um, thank you. The, um, there is in this year's uh, executive uh, budget some opportunity for some uh, shared services between DOT and the thruway. Again, knowing you're uh, j just uh, recently on the job. Efforts toward that, uh, both in the short term and the long term, do you see those? And you, you know, are, we, uh, are those uh, opportunities already being taken advantage of? I mean, I think I saw them a little bit just two days ago. Um, I think there was an effort even within this latest storm to, you know, DOT handles a much larger and vaster road network than the thruway. And so when a major storm hits, they have a lot of roads to plow and a lot of things to do. I think there's plenty of opportunity, a lot of opportunity for us to share resources in a better way to make sure that we can efficiently operate in a storm situation. But I think even beyond storm situations, there's plenty of opportunities, engineering, IT, human resources. There are plenty of areas where I think there are room for efficiencies and savings if if we could get together a little bit better. Uh, next year, w hopefully when we do this, uh, we can have a greater discussion uh, on that. Uh, moving to the canal, I know the, um, the trail along the canal is something that has been, uh, we've made great progress on over the last number of years, uh, but we're kind of at a standstill. Is there anything in this budget that would work toward the ultimate completion of that? And, and do you know about where we are percentage-wise 
of the trail? How many miles out of the? Assemblyman, I'd have to get back to you on the percentage. Um, I don't think there's anything specifically on the canal. I have, I know Brian has, and I know he's worked with you and with all the members on the canal, and he's a tremendous advocate for the canal system. Has a lot of ideas of how we might even bring in outside funding to help finish, you know, the portions of the canal that aren't, you know, the bikeways and things that aren't quite done yet. So I'm working with him to try to educate myself on how we might do that. But I'll get back to you with the exact percentage. I, I think that and, uh, you, you know, working with, you know, certainly I would be and I'm sure others would be the last piece that was done in my district had some, you know, local um, uh, participation in that and helped make that piece of the trail happen. I think looking for other opportunities, uh, certainly being creative, uh, uh, I think that may, if that is the way, um, you know, hopefully we can be successful in doing that. I look forward to working with you. I think with the canal, you've hit it exactly right, Assemblyman. We have to be very creative, I think, and look for innovative opportunities to take advantage of a wonderful system that right now, you know, is, you know, we're not taking advantage as much as we probably should. Thank you. Thank you. Senator. We've been uh, joined by Senator um, Mark Panapinto, a new senator, um, and uh, uh, Senator Montgomery is back. Uh, we've also been joined by Assemblyman Crouch. And I've been joined by Assemblyman, we've been joined by Assemblyman Abenati. And the next uh, questioner will be Senator Kennedy. Good morning. Morning. <clears throat> Congratulations on your new position. Uh, we all know that uh, your budgetary expertise is essential these days at the Thruway Authority, and uh, we're very happy to have you is this in your new position. It's on. Yeah. So, uh, back to your point, uh, I understand the proposal to use the settlement funds this year to close the deficit, prevent toll hikes for at least a year. Uh, I know that there are uh, a lot of folks, residents and businesses alike, that are thrilled to hear that the tolls will not be increased this year. Uh, what assurances do we have moving forward that there won't be a toll hike in uh, out years? What sort of formulas are you looking at implementing? Well, again, Senator, that's what I'm trying to actually work on now, which is how do you best use this 1.3 billion how do we invest in capital? One of the, again, I know I'm making the same point over and over, but I think it's an important one. I think we can control operating expenses, and I think I'm going to spend a lot of time trying to do that. Then the next question is what the real question is on the throughway all the time. How do you invest capital? How do you maintain the road? It's the most used commercial roadway in the country. And that means that a lot of trucks use it and a lot of trucks wear it out. And so, you know, we have a very, very large capital expenditure every year. So I'm going through that now. We're trying to figure out the best way to allocate that money to make sure the system's in good shape, but that we're also investing our capital wisely and in the right places. And we're going out and borrowing money in the right way. I think we've had some issues with, um, you know, how we've gone to the market in the past, and we're trying to rectify those. Um, as we work through that process, um, I think we'll see what our needs are in the future. But again, I would hesitate to give you a plan for tolls, you know, for future years beyond 2015, because I couldn't give you an educated answer to that. I would say I think we can manage the system, given the 1.3 billion, pretty efficiently and effectively without significant toll increases over a period of time on the rest of the throughway. That doesn't mean no toll increases, but I think it means that we can minimize toll increases over the future. But I'd like to get a chance to look at 
the capital budget and the kind of projects we have in place before I gave you a definitive answer to that. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of the epic snowstorm that we had this past November. Uh, it was a historic snowfall up to seven feet or more in western New York. My district was particularly hit very hard. Uh, the city of Buffalo, the town of Chictawaga, the city of Lackawanna, uh, the Thruway, the 90 and the 190 Traverse, my district, uh, they were shut down. Uh, I believe that the Thruway Authority uh, has learned a lot over the years in fighting these epic snowstorms out in western New York. I know Governor Cuomo uh, hit the ground out in our community for almost an entire week straight. Uh, at every single level, we had government responding to the needs of our community. Uh, I'm curious to know what the Thruway Authority learned from the experience, what policies and procedures uh, that you, you're looking at and have looked at to, to implement uh, future responses to natural disasters out in our community and anywhere else in New York State. No, it's a great question. We've put um, a team together, and as you know, we're trying to come up with a set of recommendations based on what we learned in that storm. Um, again, one of the things we've done already is accelerated getting GPS on all of our plows, um, especially the ones in western New York, so we can see where they are all the time and have real-time kind of positioning so we don't fall into some of the same traps that we fall in, fell into during that storm. So um, again, I don't want to um, kind of prejudge because this group is coming back with recommendations based on what we learned on that storm. But what we are trying to do is work with local officials, work with, um, because it wasn't just, you know, an issue for us, it was an issue for locals as well. So we're trying to work with the locals to know what they saw that we did, maybe not as efficiently or effectively as we could, or how they could have helped us more, or we could have helped them a little bit more in the process. So this is an ongoing analysis? Well, it is, but I think we're going to get a set of recommendations based on that, and when we get those recommendations, I'll make them available to you. And, and do you have a timeline on that? Mm -hmm. I don't have an exact date, but I'll get back to you, but I think this is something that's relatively, you know, short term, soon. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. As Assemblyman Otis. It's great. I'm I'm over here. <laughs> Great to see you, and I, and I have to compliment the governor because if we're trying to solve a financial problem at an important agency like the Thruway Authority, how better to do it than to have the budget director go solve the problem? I understand that you're, you don't have all the answers yet on, on what is going on, uh, but uh, do you have any sense of how long in the making the financial problems of the Thruway Authority uh, how long those problems have been, or is this something recent? And, and um, to the extent that you're going to, a few weeks or months from now, figure all this out, would there be a mechanism to share that information with this committee um, rather, you know, on a timely basis then, so that we know what the, the solutions are and what the cause of the problems were? So uh, make that offer. Maybe you could share a little more about where you are so far after a week and a few days. Not that far, Assemblyman, but I think what I have asked people to do is we need to relook at our expense budget, our operating budget. For almost all of the members have mentioned that as part of their questioning to me. We need to get our operating expenses better under control. I think we can do that. And I think we can do that without jeopardizing safety or without jeopardizing snow plowing. I think there's, there's some opportunities I've seen already for some savings. I think the other piece we need to look at, and again, I, I'm sounding like a broken record, but is how we're investing our capital, where we're investing our capital. Are we doing the right projects? Are we doing them at the right time? And are we doing them in the right locations around the state? And those are the kinds of things that the Thruway Authority <coughs> folks are, are presenting to me now. And this is a great workforce. They're very good. The engineers 
are fantastic. I'm very happy with the folks that I've met at the Thruway Authority. So I don't think it's a question of um, the workforce. I think it's a question of focusing on the right things and on the right priorities. And I think we have plenty of opportunities to get the finances of the Thruway Authority under control. Thank you very much. Good luck. Uh, Senator Pan Pan Panapinto. Yes, uh, over here. Uh, good, good morning. Um, Hello, I wanted to follow up on Senator Kennedy's question uh, regarding the Thruway Authority and, and this November event um, in, in Western New York. Um, you know, we had you know hundreds of motorists stuck on the Thruway for you know over 24 hours, um, and, and I know you're doing a, a study and interacting with local officials on this. But it, it seems to me, what was what were the processes in place? at the time which led to this situation and, and may have led to you being in this, in, in this job right now. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, we've had these occurrences before on the New York State Thruway in the Buffalo area. Snow was not new in upstate New York. And to have, you know, people stuck on the Thruway for 30 hours was, uh, it was, it was life-threatening, it was embarrassing. So what, were the, what procedures were in place at the time of that event that, that didn't work? Senator, I'm, I'm actually going through that now and trying to learn more about what happened in November. Um, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and make excuses for it. I'm still trying to learn what happened and what really went wrong. There were issues, obviously, with the weather forecast and how quickly the snow hit, and I think it caught people off guard from what I understand. Um, and three hours of being off guard at four inches an hour or eight inches an hour of snowfall really put them behind the curve. And we really didn't know where all of the vehicles were. We really didn't know, you know, how to mobilize to get to areas we really needed to get to faster. Those are all things this group is working on. Also, I don't think coordination with the locals was very good or as good as it could have been. And those are all things I think we're going to emphasize that we have to improve. Who's, who's part of this working, this local working group that you've got right now? I'll, I'll get you the names of the folks on it. Okay. And then my follow-up question is um, the canal system. I mean, I, I realize you're, you're, you're new in the job. Um, what, do you, what are your long-term thoughts, mm. long thoughts on the viability of the canal system maintaining as part of the Thruway Authority? Well, that's a great question, Senator, and I think it's one that requires some, uh, a significant amount of exploration. You know, it's a, uh, still a significant commercial waterway within New York State, which, quite honestly, I didn't realize how much commercial traffic still goes across the, uh, the canal system. And also, it is a significant recreational area. I am in the process of going through that with um, my staff right now. You know, there is a significant subsidy that goes to the canal system. Um, I'm not sure, based now putting on the hat from my old job, um, where that subsidy today could be better handled in state government. I'm not sure there's a good answer to that question. What we have to do is improve the viability of the system so we reduce the subsidy, and then I think a lot of options become available for, you know, the long-term viability of the canal system. I mean, I mean, it's certainly part of New York State history. I mean, you know, oh, we absolutely. were the terminus of the Erie Canal, and, and uh, you know, we need, to, we need to have that as part of our cultural history, but um, we're subsidizing it right now to the tune of $85 million a year. What, what is the canal system, what are they generating at this time? Um, I'll get you the exact numbers, but not very much on an annual basis. Um, again, uh, you know, you are talking about a system that's old. You're talking about a system that needs capital improvement, but still serves a significant, you know, commercial sector. But again, the revenue we're bringing in from that commercial sector is, is not very significant. I'll get you the exact numbers, but... Um, is not very significant. So it is a significant subsidy. But again, I don't know yet 
if we've taken full advantage of the possible opportunities. And again, Brian Stratton is a great advocate for the system. I think he has some ideas for how the system can be improved and generate more revenue. Is it possible to privatize a little bit more of the system to get people to be more um, recreational activities or improve recreational activities on the system? These are all things that I'm looking at right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been joined by Assemblyman Steck. Uh, next to testify, Assemblyman Abenanti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning, sir. Um, thank you. Let me start off by, by saying um, I have a, a, a very great interest in the Tappan Zee Bridge. I represent the Westchester side. My assembly office is the building immediately next to the plaza. Uh, so I get to see the construction progress every day. Um, and I was a county legislator for almost 20 years, so I was at the first planning meeting when the idea of replacing the Tappan Zee Bridge was, was originated, and I've been to so many meetings. In fact, I make an offer. I have a file cabinet full of information. If you can't find something, I'll be glad to share it with you. Um, I, first of all, applaud your, your attitude and the way you're coming into this, and I think that change in attitude is important for the, for the way the Thruway Authority is run, and I'm hopeful that we will see some improvements and some changes. There's three points I'd like to discuss with you. I, I kind of facetiously but seriously said I'd be glad to share information with you. Sure. But we're finding it very difficult to have the through authority to share information with us. And I'm hopeful that that can be changed. And I would like to see some kind of, a, of, a, of an out. There, there's been a very expensive outreach to the community. The, the authority has hired outside consultants. Uh, we have dog and pony shows. But in fact, the community doesn't feel part of what's going on. So I hope that the sharing of information and the sharing of approach and the sharing of planning uh, takes hold. Um, and I would hope you'd be able to do something about that. I'd be pleased to meet with you, uh, but not just alone. I'd like to bring the, the mayors of the communities around the Tappan Sea Bridge to sit down with you and let you gain from their experience as to what's been happening on the ground. I guess basically I'm talking about community friendly planning. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Okay because we have some very good mayors who've been there for a long, long time, have done a very good job with their communities, and now everything is disrupted because of, of, what, of the bridge. Right. And it goes from having parking facilities just pop up in their community, uh, traffic being rerouted, and also changes on the river that are really not voter friendly. So I'd like to continue that conversation if we could. Absolutely. Uh, now, not to beat a dead horse, but I would now like to go to the question of, of, of tolls on the Tappan Sea Bridge. Right. Um, we have managed to glean some information, and we have come to the conclusion that over the years, uh, maybe not recently because of all of the work that's going around on the Tappan Sea Bridge, but over the years, the Tappan Sea Bridge has subsidized the entire throughway system. And so we have proposed three different approaches which we believe can keep the Tappan Zee Bridge tolls perhaps $2 more. Um, one is to separate the bridge into an island account. Take all of the tolls from the bridge and let it meet all of the expenses of the bridge. Number two is to take your newly designed downstate region and make that an island account and take all of the tolls and the revenues from the downstate region and let it pay for all of the expenses downstate. The third would be to take the present formula, not pile all of the costs on the users of the Tappan Zee Bridge, but take the present formula and spread it out over the entire throughway. Any one of those, according to our numbers, increases the tolls at the Tappan Zee Bridge a minimal amount. Well, certainly I'd love to look at the analysis because that's what we're doing now, especially with the infusion of the extra money proposed in the executive budget by the governor. I think one of the things we've been reluctant, as I think all the members know, to talk about the tolling policy is because, again, the financing has been an open issue. Um, 
you know, we had the federal loan that had to come through. We had the EFC issue that some of the members have already raised. And then we had the settlement money, which we didn't expect. I think as part of that process, um, we've put together a pretty good team of people, not just within the throughway, but, you know, kind of multidisciplinary the, um, group within um, government to kind of look at the toll structure and how we might proceed. So we'd love to look at the stuff that you have um, and see how we could go forward. But again, the intent was to, you know, build a bridge with a significant infrastructure cost but to do that in a way that we minimize tolls. So that's certainly a priority. I appreciate that. One of the concerns that I have is by your toll structure will shift traffic in various directions. And if the toll is too high, then we start to impact the next bridge up. Local roads. And the local roads. And so again, that's a, that's a community friendly planning issue. Just lastly, the last minute I have is, we, we've, several of us in the, in the Assembly and the Senate have put in legislation to um, impose various types of discounts, like resident discounts, et cetera. And I would hope that you would consider that, because this is a, a, a national roadway. And frankly, I, I, I believe that the residents who suffer the inconvenience of the traffic um, should get a, 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 the benefit of a lower toll, while those who are using this for nationwide transport uh, could bear the higher cost. Well, I can, I can assure you that we're looking all of the plans that we're looking at, um, or some of them at least, would, would absolutely include that factor. The, the, last, the last thing, back to the community friendly planning. The other thing is I would hope that your planners would take a look at the, um, the impact on local roads and exits, on, on, on what it is that you're doing at various times. Because uh, we have some very, the, the next exits coming off the Tappan Zee Bridge on the Westchester side are really very small roads. Right. And the traffic is starting to back up on the e exits and impact the traffic on 287 coming off the Tappan Zee Bridge, which defeats the whole purpose of trying to move the traffic through faster. Um, I look forward to further discussion with you. Thank you for coming this morning. No, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. No, I, listen, I've, I look forward to working with you on it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kruger. Good morning. Congratulations on your new job. I feel like I want to ask you about the 82 other sections of the budget, not the New York State Thruway Authority, because I figure you know the answers to those sections also. <laughs> but probably someone will say I'm not allowed to do that. Um, but maybe after the hearing. So obviously you've gotten a whole series of questions around what did the governor mean when he said some of the settlement money going to the Thruway Authority um, might be used for avoiding toll increases. And I, I'm not sure I'm satisfied with the answer, but I'm not going to ask you again. I'm going to take a different approach to the same question. So in 2014, the projected increase in toll revenue needed for 2015 was higher than you're saying in 2015 it will be. So you're saying you don't need as much toll, you don't have a, as large a hole in toll revenue than you thought you would be at a year ago, what changed? You're talking about efficiencies, I'm curious. Where are you making more money that your toll revenue shortfall is not a big a deal as a year ago your predecessor thought it was gonna be? Well, I think several places. I think traffic did a little bit better than we thought because the economy's improving, so we did a little bit better on toll revenue. But I think, you know, rolling in so the base is a little bit higher. But no, look, we still have some tough decision making to make. We still have a hole on the operating side that we have to close, and we're going to have to close that. And again, I'm assuring the committee members that we're going to do that without using the 1.3 billion, because that's not the intent of the 1.3 billion. So we have to find some operating efficiencies within the department. We also have to operate our capital budget more efficiently and more effectively. It continues to grow over time, and that's important because maintenance of the throughway and keeping it in good condition is obviously important. It's a vital commercial artery. But 
I don't know that we've been investing our capital in the most efficient, most effective way. I don't know that we've been borrowing money in the most efficient and more effect, most effective way. And I think there are opportunities for us to improve our capital structure and within doing that, significantly reducing our costs, which will help us in 2015. Again, as I mentioned to um, one of the senators before, I think you know, on an ongoing basis, we have to then look at what we, you know, think is possible, but to do something within a reasonable, practical level um, that people would support um, um, when people come back here next year to talk about 2016 and people talk about 2017, that we have a rational plan that makes sense given what we've invested. I think we can get there without a, you know, significant and, increases in tolls beyond 2015. And you said already that much of what the Thruway Authority does and is responsible for our capital needs, and I agree. So you've reached approximately $8 billion. Um, a second. The Thruway's outstanding debt is projected to reach nearly $8 billion, roughly eight times its annual revenues including Tappan Zee Bridge. One, how much more can you borrow within your own limits or how much are you expecting to borrow? And two, what are your concerns about further potential credit rating downgrades? Well, I have concerns about both. I think we have not done a great job of structuring our debt at the Thruway Authority. And I think it, and Senator, it's a good question. It has, I think, limited our ability to go to the market. That's why I think we have to carefully look at this 1.3 billion and see how we use it in a way that helps us improve the capital structure of the Thruway Authority so that we can start to go back to the market a little bit more confidently um, to borrow the money for the capital needs we do have then quite honestly, I think we have to have a more realistic capital structure. We can't, you know, again, I haven't been there long enough to know, you know, what our exact needs are on the capital side. What I can tell you is I think we can be much more efficient in our use of capital dollars and still maintain and improve the throughway system. To your other question, we are going to have and again, we're going to have issues with the rating because of past borrowing practices. And I believe, given the 1.3, given our ability to control operating expenses, which I think we have, given our ability, I hope, to restructure our capital um, spending, we will um, be able to maintain the rating, but it is not going to be easy. And I think a lot of it is just, um, quite honestly, bad um, prior practice. The governor in May announced the authority and the State Department of Transportation would co-locate to a new transportation resource center to be built on the site of the current Thruway headquarters in Albany. Are you going forward with this plan? How does it help you um, with your goals for efficiencies and saving money? It's a great industry? question, and it's one of the first things that I've gotten involved in. Um, they're going through an RFP process now to determine you know, the kind of scope and scale of the building. Um, it's a good project if there are synergies in the future that save us money. It's a bad project if there aren't. I'm not there yet on whether it's a good or a bad project from that point of view. We are continuing to do it because we think that there is the possibility of significant synergies. Why should the engineers for the Thruway Authority and DOT be in separate buildings? Why shouldn't they be working side by side? <laughs> Why shouldn't the guys that are planning snow removal in Buffalo, like the questions we've had today, be sitting right next to each other 
talking about where those resources are and how they could be used more effectively. If we can do that, this building makes a lot of sense and will save the state money over time. And that's what we're looking at right now. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Assemblyman McDonough. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and good morning again. Uh, one point that was just briefly mentioned just now and uh, something in your testimony about shared services. And I think that the shared services will absolutely definitely increase efficiency, but cost reduction, which could help remediate the need for higher toll increases on the Tappan Zee Bridge. My concern is, will that be one of your early priorities to look at the shared services? It's proven in the past with other agencies and in private industry that the shared services can save a tremendous amount of money. Well, by, it will be by definition, given Senator Kruger's question, one right. of the first things on our plate is the building. Um, and the question is, the building provides a real, real opportunity for shared services. It includes opportunities for shared services on engineering, on human resources, on IT, on all of the things that the private sector and what we've tried to do in government would provide significant savings. So I think the building is a real opportunity for that, but we have to make sure that we're going to lock those savings in, because we don't want to invest significant money um, in infrastructure that we could be using to fix roadways and keep tolls down unless we really think we're going to get the efficiencies. I do think those efficiencies are possible, and this is a project that could be very helpful. But even before that, there are things we can do. The executive budget proposes that we um, look for opportunities for those kinds of shared services now, right away. And I think those opportunities exist. Again, one of the things I've learned in a very short amount of time, Many of the chief staff people that work at the Thruway Authority have DOT experience. Many of the DOT people have Thruway experience. The fact that we're not kind of taking advantage of that to share services and figure out how to do things jointly is really a missed opportunity. Well, uh, while the um, commonality of some of the people, as you just mentioned, who have dual experience and stuff like that, working together, you said a moment ago, but in the long run, the shared services would reduce the need for that number of employees, right? Correct. Absolutely. Okay. And, it would, and, and beyond that, it allows us to focus on things that we really do want to do, like not only keeping tolls down, but having enough snowplow drivers and having enough snowplows and, you know, the other pieces of investing in capital. So it's not just saving money, it's then reinvesting that in the kinds of things that make sense. Well, I think your background as budget director will probably, and I hope that becomes a priority. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I have a few questions. Just to put this uh, capital operating cost issue to bed, you've said several times you intend to use whatever money comes out of the budget process for capital only. Uh, <coughs> would it be appropriate, so that there's no further understanding in the 30-day amendments, for the governor to say that specifically, because it doesn't say that now. You know, Senator, I'll go back and look at the language from my old job. Um, I think we were trying to be pretty clear that, you know, this money was for capital purposes, not for operating purposes. I'll go back and talk to them about But how, that. for capital purposes, does it affect the operating budget? It's money Well, capital person, you know, again, there's the thing with something like the throughway because a significant part of the throughway's budget is, you know, ongoing capital. Um, I will go back and talk to folks. Right, it is not our intent okay, to spend to use the one point three million dollars to subsidize operating within throughway. Okay. Number two, you mentioned that the canal authority, the canal part of the throughway authority is in dire need of I forgot the exact words of capital as well. And uh, I, if, you're, if you do get this, this type of money, uh, I would s strongly urge you to consider using some of it for the, for the, the tourism uh, 
that we are generating in uh, upstate New York through the uh, canal, canal uh, part of the Thruway Authority, uh, because you did say it generates 380 million or something like that in uh, in um, in tourism income, and that will help me come to a point where I can realize that we have. I, 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 advocate for, but I want to realize the fact that this $5.4 billion that's been spent six times now, I think, and we're only in the second hearing, but that that money is distributed equitably upstate, downstate, or regionally. So uh, that would be a way to help your throughway authority and also assuage the fears of some of these people like me. Um, the other thing, um, the governor had said that when the, through it, the Tampa Sea Bridge was starting that he was going to appoint a committee that was going to come up with a financial plan, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's no committee as yet that I know of, and that keeps going up. Uh, is it the Thruway's authority, since the Thruway is building this, is it their responsibility to provide a financial, financial plan as opposed to the governor? Well, Senator, we are going to have to provide a financial plan for, for the bridge and the rest of the throughway, and we do that on an ongoing basis. I think what the governor has said, and I think what throughway has said in the past, and has been true over the past six to eight months, is what we've tried to do is say, look, we don't want to get too specific about a tolling plan until we know all the possible financing sources, until we had nailed down the federal piece, the EFC piece that I think we all know about, and then the settlement funds, which kind of thankfully was manna from heaven, which a piece of that could be invested in this very important infrastructure project. I think as all of those pieces fall into place, we'll be able to come forward with a financial plan that I think will make sense to everybody. Well, somehow I think you as budget director, if, some, if I came in and said part of the Senate budget should be a plan to build a new section to the LOB, I got a feeling you'd say, how are you going to finance it before you said yes? Is that fair to say? It might cross my mind. All right, so now let me see if this might cross your mind as well. <laughs> so now we're well into the project. It would seem to me that now you're chairman of the Thruway Authority, at least acting chairman, it would be a perfect time to try to say, as of this point, this is how we're going to finance it. Things change, obviously, in any project. But no, and I think, no, Senator, it's a good question. And I think now that we have the Excuse settlement. me one minute. Sure. You've Complimented many people on a good question. Let's assume my questions are good, so you don't have to say. <laughs> I, I'm always happy to answer good questions from all of the um, senators and assembly people. Of course, we need to provide a financial plan on the bridge. We, again, are working through what the implications of the 1.3 billion will be on what our options are, how much should be allocated to the bridge. Once th that's allocated to the bridge, what effect would that have on the total financial package and what effect would that have on the rest of the throughway? I think as we get to that point, um, and I have a chance to go through that with the folks and the outside folks that are looking at that and the impacts that that will have, you know, we can get back to you with what we think the impact will be. But I think we're closer to being to that point once we know how this 1-3 gets allocated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to close, Assemblyman Brennan. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Farrell. And Forgive me for coming back a second time, but uh, okay. no. <laughs> this is more of an admonition. Uh, up until we gave the Thruway Authority the $85 million a couple years ago to avoid a toll hike by picking up the expense of the state police, yep. the Thruway Authority's been self-funded yes. the whole 60 years, and that's been great for the taxpayers and the people of the state of New York. Uh, 
and you, you've indicated that the $1.3 billion is not just for the Tappan Zee. It's also for other ongoing capital projects so that you don't have to borrow the money and then pay interest on that debt. And, uh, and that extra cost is certainly a factor in why toll increases might otherwise be needed. And so, so that's, you know, that's what's happening. And uh, so now that the Thruway Authority is going to start getting lots of money from the general fund, I think it's very important for you to provide the legislature with as much detail about these plans as possible. And certainly I don't suggest that the Thruway Authority is suddenly becoming a ward of the state. And I don't, and you know, the, we write taxpayer checks to the MTA for billions, so subsidizing operations of public authorities is something that, that has been known to happen. Uh, and I don't object, but um, I think it's very important for us to start getting into details of how the Thruway Authority is going to spend this money and what, it, what the impact on the tolls is going to be and, and uh, going forward because uh, we, we may be providing substantial financial assistance to the Thruway Authority from the general fund for, for some years. And I think it's important to kind of change what's, what kind of information is being made available. I'm not going to say good question, Assembly. Um, that in my old job, and I know for all of you, was a very hard decision to make about providing general fund assistance to a public authority and the throughway. So I absolutely understand that and you know, hope we can work to, to provide the kind of information you want because that was a significant um, move by the state to provide, you know, funding to the thruway. And I think the thruway needs to show that we are being as efficient, effective, budgetary conscious, using the 1.3 billion in the most effective, efficient way um, so that you feel you're not wasting your money. Thank you. One question and then close. Um, did you say that you're going to do the um, easy pass or something with the toll on the, on the uh, Tappan Zee Bridge? I and probably, it, I'm sorry. No, and, and does that mean you're not, uh, are you going to do what the MTA has done? Which is they're going to not, they're going to mail you a letter if you run through it and you don't have easy pass like I don't do? I don't want to talk too much about stuff that I'm just getting briefed on, but my understanding is that there may be construction issues with the toll plaza mm -hmm. that might lead to a period of time where they have just kind of an easy pass process. And Which, only easy pass. And, and if you don't have easy pass, you're going to mail to them? I think that's the case. Now, yeah, again, I, I need to, and I understand, when I heard about this, I said, well, I understand from my former life that this is going to raise some issues with folks that we need to be able to talk to them about. So I'm still trying to work through that. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, uh, on the entrance to the throughway, when you go to Old Porsche, and the way you have it set up there is perfect. Yeah. You know, you go around, and then you, those of us that don't use uh, Easy Pass, I want them to follow me, not make it easy. Uh, you can go through and pick up a ticket. Yes. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Oh. No, thank you all. Thank have you. a good day. You too. Joe McDonnell, Joan McDonnell, Commissioner, New York State Department of Transportation. I want to thank the Commissioner for allowing us to put Robert first because he had an important appointment he had to go to in another 10 minutes. <clears throat> Thank you.
We have been joined by Senator Ritchie. Chairman DeFrancisco, Chairman Farrell, Chairman Gant, members of the Legislative Fiscal and Transportation Committees, thank you for this opportunity to discuss Governor Cuomo's executive budget for 2014-2015, or 2015-2016, as it pertains to the Department of Transportation. I'm Joan McDonald, the Commissioner of DOT. One of the primary functions of state government is to ensure the safety of its residents. Each and every day, DOT and our 8,200 employees play an integral role in assuring the safety of the traveling public. From bridge inspections, to traffic signal maintenance, to winter snow and ice control. Snow and ice control is one of the more challenging aspects due to the unpredictability and volatility of weather patterns. Following on the heels of several years of extreme weather <coughs> events, this winter season started early with the November lake effect snowstorm in western New York. That storm resulted in the largest winter deployment of personnel and equipment in the department's history. At its peak, nearly 1,000 DOT staff and more than 600 pieces of heavy equipment were mobilized from as far away as Long Island to assist impacted towns, counties, and cities with the response and recovery efforts. Earlier this week, a winter storm and blizzard inundated parts of Long Island with more than two feet of snow. In preparation for this major event, the department deployed approximately 300 pieces of heavy equipment and more than 580 staff from regions outside of the impacted areas. To enhance DOT's capacity to respond to these extreme weather events, the executive budget provides $50 million for versatile emergency vehicles, including additional snow plows. This funding will also support equipping the department's existing snow and ice control fleet with a state-of-the-art GPS system that will track assets in real time and aid with emergency deployment. Last week, Governor Cuomo detailed a six-point infrastructure plan that outlines his vision to strengthen and modernize New York's infrastructure. The plan recognizes that the demands of the 21st century economy require that New York State not only renew its investments in transportation systems, but that we need to build faster, better, and stronger to compete. The executive budget makes new state investments to improve the transportation system, enhance the system's resiliency, create jobs, and deliver operating aid for transit systems. The executive budget includes more than $3.5 billion in new capital program funding during state fiscal year 2015-2016. Of that amount, more than $2.5 billion in new funding is provided to support the department's highway and bridge program. Building upon the governor's support for sustained investments in roads and bridges, DOT's budget utilizes the first $150 million of a new $750 million five-year bridge initiative. This initiative will strategically accelerate the rehabilitation, reconstruction, or replacement of more than 100 bridges statewide serving critical freight, agriculture and commerce corridors. DOT's budget also provides $438 million in additional funding for local highway and bridge projects under the Consolidated Highway Improvement Program, CHIPS, $39.7 million for the local matching share of federally aided projects under the Marcuselli Program, 
and more than $4.9 billion to support the operation of local transit systems. Prior to the enactment of the Infrastructure Investment Act of 2011, DOT delivered all of its construction projects through a traditional design, bid, build process. By combining the design and construction phases of a project into one design build contract, project delivery is faster and more efficient and project benefits are delivered to the public sooner. Since being signed into law in 2011, DOT has awarded 10 design build contracts valued in excess of $811 million, including the department's largest ever single contract, the $550 million Kosciuszko Bridge. These projects are underway throughout the states and the results are overwhelmingly positive. Projects are being delivered sooner, on budget, and jobs are being created. In addition to these 10 contracts, there are currently 13 more under procurement, totaling an additional $290 million. The Act's benefits are clear and design build authority should be made permanent. After a series of tragic events, Tragic accidents in Quebec, North Dakota, and Alabama demonstrated the volatile nature of crude oil. New York State DOT, New York State DEC, and the Department of Homeland Security worked with Governor Cuomo to push the federal government for closer regulation of the crude oil transportation industry. To better prepare the state, Executive Order 125 was issued, which directed a crude oil interagency work group to comprehensively assess emergency response preparedness, implement aggressive enforcement and inspection initiatives, and work with partner railroads to coordinate preparedness activities. During calendar year 2014, DOT inspectors and our federal partners have conducted an aggressive targeted track and rail car inspection program. During the course of the year, we have inspected 7,368 rail cars and 2,659 miles of track. We've uncovered and required corrective action for 840 defects, and we've issued 12 hazardous materials violations. The defects that we have found prove that efforts to increase inspections are working to identify the problems and help reduce the risk of transporting crude oil in New York State. In closing, the investments being made in the state's transportation system will move New York forward so that it will meet the demands of the 21st century economy. Thank you very much for having me testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you Thank might you have. Thank you very much. First to testify to question Assemblyman Gant, Chairman of the Transportation Committee. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much, uh, Chairman Farrell. I uh, welcome you here this morning. Commissioner, you know you and I have had a lot of fun all summer talking about whether or not you will give me the authority to recommend to you on the rail station in Rochester where the pillar should go and the rod should be stuck in. So I don't want you to forget that deal and I don't want anybody to think we have some secret because we don't. I right. just want to make sure that station's built correctly as when I was a kid. But given that, um, I'm concerned really about uh, deficient roads and bridges as we have for some time now. Uh, I had our roads and bridges very deficient in this state. Can you tell me whether or not we've improved on the condition of the bridges and roads in the state? <coughs> and when can we expect that uh, we will have that done or uh, make some improvement thereof? Yes. Um, First of all, we do have some great projects uh, that we, uh, we saw in uh, Rochester this year between the, the Rochester Station, which is uh, one of our design-build uh, uh, contracts moving forward, so we're very excited about that. Um, but as it regards the condition of our assets overall, um, New York State is responsible for the oversight of 16,000 uh, state and local bridges, uh, approximately We've, we've held constant on good and excellent, and year over year, approximately 68, 66% of them are either good or excellent. Um, what we instituted back in 2011 when I became commissioner 
was a very rigorous uh, capital planning asset management process so that we would make sure that those bridges that are good and excellent don't slip into fair and poor and then address the fair with uh, lower cost treatments. So we are continuing to make those investments and will continue to do so. So we are making improvements up over the last yes, we few are. years? Yes, we are. There's no slippage? There's no slippage, absolutely okay. not. Uh, uh, you and I have had conversation, at least you, your staff and I have had conversation about a subject that's important to me, and that's summer youth jobs. Uh, we had a particular one at, uh, at um, Edison Tech there in Rochester where they, those young people went out and built houses, and the unions joined them with them to provide for uh, the capital in investments that they had. Uh, we seem to have lost that even though in a conversation that uh, the Assembly and the uh, Board of Regents had sometime, and I informed them that there are some young people who will never go to college, I ever, if we could prepare those young people with jobs such as Bolsies. Uh, but unfortunately, the city of Rochester doesn't have a Bolsies. And uh, somehow, somewhere, we need to find some money to try and do that. Can you tell me where we are with that? that particular investment in young people. I, I'm not exactly sure where that contract is, but I'll be happy to get back to you. But uh, I couldn't agree with you more that um, as the workforce ages, investments in uh, our future workforce, both on the engineering side and the technical side, um, in construction and construction inspection is, is more critical. So so I'm happy to continue to, well, to partner I'm, I'm with you. I'm sure and I that will the regents would we're glad to have you invest some of that money so that they could do some of the kinds of things that some of us think is necessary it, in order for young people, particularly in urban areas, to make it. Exactly. Okay, so uh, your position on design build is one, even though you have agreed to give me the, the piece of the, the train session there, you know you and I don't necessarily agree on design build. It's a position that I've, I've had over the years. And, Hopefully we can continue to talk about that because I don't think it's something that's good for uh, taxpayers of this, this great state of ours. Um, the other concern I, I have is the one about 50-50 in terms of engineers inside and outside. And I would like to know where we are with that particular part of the program. Sure. Um, we don't set an actual uh, target for in-house resources versus consulting engineers. You for don't our set design. a target? We don't set a target, but it equates. But you know that we have, over the years, asked that be, be set. Right. Okay. I, I do so know that. But it, it equates to approximately a 50-50 split, about half in-house and half uh, through consultant services. Do we fulfill that or, or, or do we not? Because my understanding from particularly the union officials from your shop that we do not fulfill that. Fulfill no, that. that we, we fulfill it, and, and I'm happy to get uh, the exact trend uh, analysis to I, you. I, I would like to know that, yep. and if you get it to the rest of, rest of these persons who sit here. Now, the governor has agreed that he was given Buffalo a billion dollars. My question is how much of that is coming out of your shop? The additional... The billion dollars that the governor has agreed to, that he will give uh, to Buffalo. Does that include oh, the I don't roads think and bridges there? Or? The additional billion, the Buffalo billion yes. you're talking about, that does not include the, the road and bridge so how, budget. How, 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 how much are you giving the, the Buffalo area? Okay. I, I don't have that number in front of me, but we'll get we'll get that number. Can you. you get that for me and plus yep. the other the other the other regions included, so I can have some reference points. Went for for yeah. for, for Rochester as you move forward. And Rochester, so, Hudson happy Valley, to, and yeah. Okay, because I'd, happy I'd to do just that. like to know how much that is because uh, as you know, most of us in this state today are training. The I guess the chips is going to be the same. Marcus Sellers is going to be the same. Is that correct? Chips, Chips and Marcus are the same level They're that they were last year. Correct. Okay. When are we going to have 
another five-year program. You know, last year, we, two years ago, we did a two-year program. I don't see us doing a program this year. I'm right. wondering we, if we're going to do a five-year program again, or are we planning on doing a five-year program? Uh, we're, we're happy to continue those discussions through uh, our budget division, through with uh, the legislative uh, uh, Ways and Means and Senate Finance Committee um, as far as a five-year program. Um, and, uh, of course, it has to be done in the confines of uh, the fiscal picture. So, so we're happy to continue that. Um, we continue to plan our projects right now within uh, the funding envelope that we have and um, uh, invest those funds very wisely. High speed rail? Mm hmm. Could you tell us where that is? Yes, uh, we completed uh, the public hearings uh, after the draft environmental impact statement. Um, those took place last spring uh, and uh, we're collecting all the comments, working with the Federal Railway Administration. Uh, of course, the uh, investments to institute uh, high-speed rail in New York State range from $5 billion to $16 billion. So the funding envelope for high-speed rail uh, is, is, uh, is a tough one. But we continue to make strong investments uh, through President Obama's high-speed rail initiative. Uh, we have uh, close to $200 million worth of projects underway including the Rochester Station, um, including some additional track work between Albany and Schenectady, and some signaling work. But it's going to, depending on which... The, Roch the Rochester Commissioner. That, that's outside of Rochester, isn't it? More like Batavia? Um, the... I just want these people in this room to think you're doing me any special favors. No, I'm not, no I would never I, do that. I don't, I don't, think, do I don't think Rochester is involved in that I deal. I would never do that. According to the information I have. Yes. Okay, but I think that's somewhere else and not necessarily in, 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 the, in the Rochester when it's nearer yes. to Buffalo. Okay. Yeah, I know. Is that correct? That, that the high speed, the high, yeah, speed, high speed piece, the high people speed. keep talking about Rochester is not, not a Rochester project. No, it's part of the high speed rail initiative. Okay. The, the Rochester Station. Which is nearer to, uh, to Batavia than it is to Rochester. It is. It is. Okay. And the Depew uh, Station I, is I part of that I just want to make also. sure we're on the same wavelength. We are on the same wavelength. Commissioner, let me, uh, first of all, thank you for answering these few questions that I have. I may come back with some others as we sit here. But thank you for doing a great job for us. And thank you. Hopefully uh, we can get a piece of Rochester for high-speed rail because we could use the jobs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Senator, Senator Ritchie. Commissioner, welcome. I just have a couple uh, questions. First, um, I would like to say that your DOT staff and the counties that I represent really do a phenomenal job clearing the roads. And as you know that on any given day, um, we could have a foot to you know, 10 feet of snow. So that is a real a real issue, uh, especially on 81. So as uh, we go forward, um, we've had conversations between myself and your office back and forth about possible closure gates on 81. The issue that last year we had over 100 vehicles that were stranded in the village of Adams that couldn't make their way out and 200 people who had to stay in a fire department and some homes there in the village. And so I guess I would just like um, you to give me maybe uh, your views on why you think the closure gates, not on every uh, entrance to 81, but in that small area that gets the lake effect <coughs> snow wouldn't be beneficial. Sure. Um, thank you, first of all, for uh, your compliments about the DOT staff because, yes, uh, uh, that part of the state does, does get hit pretty hard on a regular basis. Um, what we've been... What we've used in the last few storms on the I-81 corridor and on the parallel Route 11 corridor is, um, first and foremost, we, we reduced the speed limit, and we have found that that has had very beneficial results to uh, a tractor trailer, because what happens sometimes is there's one incident, one jackknife, and it can cause delays and uh, pileups for uh, extended miles. Um, so I think that that is one of the tools that we've started to use much more regularly, and that seems to be working pretty well. Um, as far as the gates, um, I, don't, I haven't seen the data on kind of where we would put them, 
but I'm happy to sit down with you and pay a field visit and take a look at where that might be beneficial. Okay, that's great. Um, another issue that we're having in the district is um, with the storm sewer and the catch basins. And I understand uh, in response from your letter that be prior to 1971, uh, that the state doesn't maintain those. Uh, but I guess I would like to hear your views again on the fact that in two of these municipalities right now that have this problem, it's going to be a huge co uh, cost, and it's on the state highway, uh, in the village itself, and on Route 37, which of course is a, a main highway through St. Lawrence and Jefferson County. Uh, so it, it's kind of hard for me to go back to my constituents and tell them that the state shouldn't be responsible when they're not allowed to dig on a state highway, but they are responsible for the cost for the storm sewer. That's a, I think what we've discovered through these many major uh, weather events, whether it's uh, uh, Sandy, Irene, Lee, the, the winter storms, um, is just how, I guess for lack of a better word, discombobulated some of the laws and regulations are as to who does what uh, between the state and municipalities across the state. So I think what we should be doing, and we're, we're doing it uh, in a big way under the governor's uh, Renew uh, New York initiative, uh, is take a look at those and where it doesn't make sense um, for the state to do something and the locality should do it or vice versa, uh, we need to be open to that and through our municipal assistance agreements we can figure out a way to make some of those things work. So um, I'm happy to, to continue that conversation with you also and our folks in uh, Region 7 about those catch basins. And I certainly appreciate your willing to look at that because it is something that it's going to be a major cost to some of these small municipalities that they don't have the resources for. And then the last issue, of course, is the, uh, the town of Orleans salt issue. And I would just like to say for the record that we're getting closer. Mm -hmm. um, we just have a small gap now and appreciate uh, Diane has been involved. And as we move forward, we're pretty close to getting that water contamination problem solved and would hope that you would continue to help us uh, find our yes. way to a solution. Yes, I've been briefed on that issue also. So yeah, I know that uh, uh, that's been a long road, but we're, we're almost there. Yes, great. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Assemblyman McDonald. Thank you, Chairman. And good morning, Commissioner. Good to see you again. Good to see you. A couple of things. We, you talked in your testimony about the bridge repair and stuff like that. You, you scheduled in the first year to do 100 bridges, I think you said, right? Correct. How are they selected? Are they selected by those that are in the worst condition, or are they selected geographically? Or You know, when, when I mentioned uh, the 16,000 bridges that are in the state, that includes both state and local system. And uh, uh, what we do is we have our bridge inspection programs and our condition ratings that we, we do every, every two years. And um, then when we look at, we have, so we have our core program and we keep moving that along. Yeah. And then when uh, additional revenue sources come available, uh, we look at what the type of revenue it is and what bridges fit best. For the, for the hundred uh, bridges that we're talking about in uh, in the uh, additional funding. We have identified corridors that are freight corridors, uh, agriculture corridors, and commerce corridors, and the bridges on, the, on those routes. And, but we would absolutely also look at current condition and what would need to be invested to make those bridges more resilient. And there's some local share of investment in that repair work, right? Depending on the bridge? Depending on the bridge, it would be either 100% state. It would be, a, if it's a state bridge, it would be our responsibility. If it's a local bridge, it would be a shared responsibility. But the inspection process is done by the state to make Correct. sure, right? On all Correct. of them, whether it's On all the or... bridges, yes. Okay, and as I understand it uh, from previous years, that there's a rating system of bridges, and I think it's one through seven, is it? One through seven. And you said before that 66% of the bridges are considered acceptable are considered good or excellent okay if you could say good or excellent on the scale of one to seven where would good become would it be four or more five 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 okay and as i understand it three and a half is where it begins three to and a half down. is that is that tipping point yes okay and then worse than that is unacceptable yes so okay so you would 
we would actually cease the operation of a bridge if one was that. We, a bridge that is in poor condition does not necessarily mean it is unsafe. When we, ins when we inspect bridges, if it is unsafe, um, what we do is we either load post it for mm -hmm. lower weights or in extreme situations, uh, we, we would shut it down and then do what we call emergency bridge repairs. Um, but, uh, and that, that's how we do it. Okay, thank you. A previous testimony by Bob Magna, who's now just getting into the job, I asked the question, would he make the shared services thing a priority? Because I think it would create early on savings, which could be very significant. You'll be working on that with that department. Was that going to be a priority Abs with you? Absolutely. Early, an early priority? Absolutely. Okay, I think we could save a lot of money there right, right off the bat and would help other things. Something in the executive budget is concerned me, and um, it was the statement that I'll just want to read what we wrote, that DOT would be authorized to collect a new $100, $100 fee from for-profit passenger carriers to pay for the safety inspections of privately operated for-profit passenger carriers. Now, let's define a for-profit passenger carrier. In Nassau County, as you're aware, mm -hmm. back in 2012, they initiated a public-private partnership with Veolia, Veolia Transdev, which is now called the NICE bus system. Right. And they are a private company, and they're a for-profit company, but they're under contract right. to a governmental authority. Would this $100 fee apply to them? No, it would not. I, I didn't think so. I just wanted to confirm. It would not. That's good news, because that'll yes. save some money. Yeah. In, uh, and also, the whole downstate transportation um, budget is flat. There's no increase, not even a 2% increase in most of the downstate operating systems. The, the, in the public transit. Uh, right, public transit. Right. right. It, it is flat, um, and as you know, the, the public transit systems in the downstate region, putting the MTA aside for a minute, but in you know, Westchester, Rockland, and on the, on the island, they're covered by both some general fund, uh, right. state dollars, and also by various taxes and fees. So, so they are flat, but it is the state contribution is flat. Well, it looks if it remains that way through the budget negotiations, it looks like it's a definite thing for a fare increase, especially in Long Island and Nassau County, where I am. And that fare increase could be very significant because that bus service serves um, middle and lower income people mostly. It would have a tremendous impact on them, and they service over 100,000 passengers per day. So 25 percent doesn't, 25 cents doesn't sound like much, but you add it up and it is. So I'm hopeful that we can get that aid increase to eliminate that. I know there's going to be a rate increase on MTA, mm -hmm. and it's the sharing of that that's still under discussion of um, what the Long Island bus service would get. It, it will be under, under budget discussion, sure. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Senator, Senator DeLon. Yes, thank you very much. Hi, Commissioner. Good morning, Senator. Um, I have questions with respect to, um, can you enlighten us a little bit about the capital plan? As you know, we have to come up with a new five-year plan, both for uh, DOT and the MTA. Uh, if you can give us some highlights of what you anticipate in that plan. And uh, I'll have other questions first. Answer that one. Sure. As 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 I as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, you know we we work within the confines of the the annual appropriation, and um, we do approximately uh, three point excuse me two point three billion uh, every year, and that includes the construction of one point eight billion plus uh, associated costs for engineering, inspection, uh, any right-of-way, environmental issues that need to be addressed. Um, and that has traditionally been what uh, DOT's program has been. Um, we, are, uh, uh, we are adhering to the, the parameters of the MOU that was signed between the legislature <coughs> and the governor uh, as part of the 2013-2014 budget. And, um, we continue to look forward to uh, assessing what those needs are and moving the program forward. And what do you anticipate the cost or, or the dollar amount? 
we, you know, our cap, our capital program is about, uh, like I said, it's about three, two point three billion a year, and that's that's what we've been, that's the assumption that we've been working under because we know how important it is to uh, uh, stay within the governor's uh, two percent cap. Um, we take advantage of additional funding that becomes available. Uh, we received an additional 1.3 billion as part of the Governor's New York Works Initiative in the 2012 budget. All of the, that 1.2 billion has been committed. Uh, we also are taking advantage of the FEMA money that's available. We've got 518 million there that we're investing in bridges. So. So that, so my perspective is we, we continue to look for those uh, resources uh, that don't put an additional burden on the taxpayers of the state of New York and make wise investments uh, with those dollars that we have. Well, as you, as you know, um, the MTA came out with its capital plan, and I believe it was about $32 billion. Correct for five years and you vetoed it as a member of the MTA Review Board, why? Yes, uh, I, I am the, the chair of the MTA Capital Program Review Board. Uh, they have a statutory requirement to submit uh, a five-year plan to the, to the board and uh, we, uh, we are reviewing that right now. But, um, why, why, did, why did you vote against it, uh, or why did you veto it? We vetoed it without prejudice because we needed more time to take a look at, because the, the statute says we must take an action within a very limited uh, time period. Uh, and we made the decision, the members of the review board, uh, mm -hmm. to, to deny it without prejudice so that we could continue to look at the, uh, at the needs and look at the various ways of funding it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, another subject in terms of uh, the $50 million for new plows, I believe, uh, and uh, GPS, um, are those replacements of existing plows or will new staff be hired for that? That would be uh, beyond our normal replacement. Um, it would be, you know, as as I was explaining in my testimony, depending on where a storm hits, uh, if it hits Buffalo, uh, for example, uh, it takes, if we need to redeploy resources, both equipment and people from Long Island, it takes approximately 12 hours to drive mm -hmm. uh, a heavy plow uh, across the state of New York. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the plan would be to purchase some additional equipment and have them strategically located across the state so that the equipment could quickly get to the event and then we could more easily transport people uh, to, to man that uh, equipment. So that, that is the plan. But is it replacement? No, it is not replacement. It is, it so, is beyond. So we, that, we, we therefore you need new, new, new staff for it? No, what we would do is, like I said, when um, they would be strategically located, across the state mm -hmm. so that rather than deploying equipment from Long Island to Buffalo, we would just transport some of the operators uh, for that particular event because the equipment would be there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, just one minute, Commissioner. Um, New York State Department of Motor Vehicles Executive Deputy Commissioner David Sampson, are you in the room? Okay. <laughs> he hasn't turned in his papers yet. Maybe he's been appointed to something else. <laughs> <laughs> he's coming in next week. Uh, Assemblyman Cusick. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner, it's always great to see you. Thanks for being here. I just want to start off also by saying I want to, I want to thank you, uh, your staff, uh, both up here in Albany and uh, uh, the regional staff down in New York City are great and they're always accessible uh, for, for myself and my colleagues. And uh, I just want to get that on record because I, know, I know staff isn't always uh, recognized. Uh, I have a, my, what might come off as a selfish question, but 
I am just, um, I'm just kind of sick of hearing my colleagues ask me what's going on with the Staten Island Expressway. Uh, so I, I just want to uh, see if you could give me an update uh, so I could answer uh, my colleagues who travel down from Albany and go through Staten Island to, to get home, uh, what the timeline is on, on, the, uh, on that project. Sure. Um, the HOV bus line, bus lane will be 3 plus 24 7 um, from Victory Boulevard to the Verrazano Bridge upon completion of the SIE construction, which is on schedule for December 2015. And um, it's currently 2 plus during peak hours. And we have been coordinating um, all of our efforts with the MTA and their project on the uh, Verrazano approaches. Okay. Twi December 2015, we'll, we'll, we'll both be there um, for the ribbon cutting. How's that? <laughs> yes, yes, December 15th. And, we'll and we'll let Senator Savino come too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, well, I'm sure she'll be there. Yep. Commissioner, I want to also ask, in your testimony, you had mentioned some of the funding uh, that, that's uh, in the budget for transportation, and there was uh, $4.9 to support the operation of local transit. Uh, I was wondering, how, is, how does that break down, um, and how, is that, how are those projects or those local transit uh, projects uh, chosen by DOT? The, the majority of the funding in, in the budget is for the MTA, um, but approximately, uh, there's approximately 180.7 million for upstate transit systems. 290.4 uh, million for the downstate suburban transit systems and 4.482 billion for the MTA. And um, uh, following up on, uh, on, on some of the prior questions, um, the, the local revenue sources are different uh, depending on where you are. Uh, downstate uh, imposes revenues and fees, including a supplemental sales tax, corporate franchise tax, and insurance and bank tax surcharge. All of the upstate transit systems, um, it's the petroleum business tax, which primarily funds them. Right. Now, now with the, the money that goes to the MTA, does the MTA have to provide to state DOT uh, what they're going to allocate that money for before they, they get the money from State DOT? Yeah. Through, the, through the, the STOA fund, the State Transportation Operating Assistance Fund. Yes, they do. Okay. And just one more question. Uh, last, uh, last budget hearing last year, I had mentioned the, uh, the West Shore Rail Line. Uh, and I yes. see you smiling, um, which I'm going to take as a good thing. Uh, but the, I had asked last year for the consideration of a uh, five, uh, five million dollar study. Uh, and I know that this will be a combination between state DOT and probably the MTA, but it will be on the West Shore. Uh, whether it's going to be a rail line right now or for now a bus rapid transit uh, until we get to the point that we're ready for, for rail, uh, could you tell me, it, uh, is there any progress on, uh, or possibly, that's why I was asking about the local money, uh, if we could get a study uh, done this year? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, I'm happy to look into that, the West Shore. Okay, and I'll, I'll be calling and then, on right, you. And there, I know there are a lot of right-of-way issues, so. Yes, so that, yes, that's and we're, what we're in talks with your folks yep. now on that. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Assemblyman. Uh, Senator Kennedy. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Senator. Uh, first of all, let me start by thanking you for your efforts on behalf of uh, the DOT and the state in November. I know you were on the ground out in Western New York. Yes, uh, I was us. there for nine days. Yeah. Nine Thank days. You very yep. Much. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Uh, so I want to switch gears from the MTA out to Western New York, the NFTA. Um, the NFTA, as we know, we've been talking about this for a number of years. Uh, they receive less state transit operating assistance per passenger trip or revenue mile than other major upstate agencies, despite the fact that we have the light rail. Uh, which I want to get into some of those issues as well. Uh, and last year we had an increase of about 1.3 million. We were very pleased with that, but 
Uh, according to the NFTA's own numbers, they remain underfunded by about $8 million when looking at the formula and taking into account the light rail system with 6.5 million riders uh, that is not weighed in on the formula. Uh, and so it really puts this financial strain on the NFTA that uh, we would like to rectify so in future years we don't have to continue to come back uh, having this same discussion about being underfunded. So what can we do differently this upcoming year in this budget for the NFTA, uh, for those individuals, the families that utilize this service to get to and from work, to uh, go through the community? Um, how can we recalibrate these outdated and what some would consider, including myself, unfair formulas for determining that funding? And should we consider a separate funding source for the upstate agencies that are providing public transportation? Well, I think uh, any analysis uh, or any discussion should, should start with the analysis of, of, like you're saying, you know, what, what are the ridership projections, what are the fare structures, what are the existing revenues. As I mentioned, uh, the upstate systems are funded primarily through the petroleum business tax. And are there other ways to fund it? other way, additional ways to ensure efficiencies. Um, and I think the whole, the whole, like you said, the whole formula should be looked at. And we're happy to uh, uh, participate in that discussion with you. So can we count on the DOT then helping to drive this forward, driving the formula change forward? Because I, I think it's critical to the future of the NFTA. Well, I think, I think the answer to that is we're willing to work again, within the confines of the governor's budget, um, discuss with uh, uh, the budget division and the appropriate uh, legislative fiscal staff on different uh, opportunities, and we're happy, to, we're happy to take the lead and work with DOB on that. That's great, thank yep. you. I wanna stick with the NFTA. I wanna talk about the <clears throat> capital improvements that are necessary. Uh, the NFTA, the light rail system, built in 1984, so you know, over 30 years, the system is in dire need of improvement and substantial investment. I know you're aware of this, uh, just to hit a level of uh, functioning that uh, taxpayers can be proud of. You know, upgrades to the light rail infrastructure are necessary, overhead power, underground and above ground track improvements, escalator rebuild projects, completing the light car rebuild. I, I could keep going on. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is we're looking at about $50 million or more from estimates I'm told from the NFTA of capital funding specifically just to upgrade the system to a level, again, uh, that it can function appropriately. Uh, is there a multi-year state funding appropriation for capital that we can look at, uh, similar to the M MTA, a, a capital program, a five-year long-term outlook where we can count on funding coming in for capital, again, so we don't extend this, where we're pa playing roulette with the, uh, the entire system. You know, that is, that is the premise behind uh, any capital budget, is you have uh, some type of two-year, three-year, five-year certainty so that you can plan accordingly and make those investments accordingly. So um, I don't know how specifically how the, M the NFTA does their capital planning and budgeting. Um, but again, um, happy to make that part of the discussion when we look at the overall financial situation. Great. And uh, again, on the NFTA, uh, the New York Works mm -hmm. program uh, put funding forward. Will uh, some of that money be released for NFTA uh, projects funding? Uh, I've been advised that there's, there's $5 million uh, in this year's budget for for that specifically, so so we'll take a look at that. Excellent. Uh, on another note, uh, back to design build. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question regarding the Article 7 language. Um, with the executive budget proposal making the design build permanent, expanding it to all state agencies and authorities, including SUNY and CUNY, uh, what measures are being taken to ensure that the upstate <laughs> contractors, local residents, are getting the work? Um, you know, it's. As I mentioned in my testimony, we have awarded 10 contracts. Um, we have 13 underway. Um, we have been seeing much more participation 
um, by the upstate contractors uh, in the work that we're doing in the upstate regions. I know when uh, the legislation was first enacted, there was uh, some concern that all of the work would go to outside of the state contractors, and that has not been the case, uh, particularly in the upstate work. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to provide you a list of what those contracts are and who the, the contractors that both participated in the process and were successful in getting the work. And I have one more question, uh, just turning to the Skyway out uh -huh. in Western New York. Uh, and it may not be the question you think is coming. Uh, this has to do with the on-ramp and off-ramps, the, the gates. The gates, uh, First yes. of all, thank you for your assistance in the DOT in, in, in helping us to begin the process of putting in gates that, uh, you know, it's a simple um, solution where Buffalo police officers would actually have to be taken off of the streets otherwise during inclement weather when the Skyway is closed uh, to prevent cars from gaining access to uh, that Skyway. And uh, we would like to just continue that process of implementing these gates. I'd, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on it uh, and if the DOT can be counted on to continue this implementation of these gates where we can put the police officers back on the streets, back into the neighborhoods uh, where they belong and the taxpayers uh, deserve them to be. Yes, uh, you know, what we've, what each storm that we have, uh, we learn more lessons. And, uh, uh, you know, the governor has made it clear that when these events happen, uh, we're one state. It's not, uh, it's not state of New York, it's not Erie County, it's not city of Buffalo, it's, it hit the Buffalo region, and how do we best address the needs of the time? And um, gates are something that uh, we, 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 we have utilized on the Skyway, the throughway utilizes them. Um, I had the discussion with Senator Ritchie, so that will continue to be something um, that we, we discuss because when we, when we assess, it's where are the resources, both equipment and personnel, uh, best utilized. And um, in some instances, it's gates. In some instances, it's, uh, uh, it's National Guard, depending on, on, on what we want to do with each individual event. But we're, we'll keep that Skyway discussion going. Look forward to working with you on that Good. project. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we've been joined by Assemblyman Dillon. And our next is Assemblyman Ortiz. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Sherman. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. <clears throat> uh, my, uh, I have a few questions, and uh, one of them has to do with the, uh, as you know, the, uh, the will be an expansion of the uh, Panama Canal, and uh, New York, uh, uh, the New York uh, Port Authority and New Jersey, um, the, their, the port and rail volumes at the Port Authority and New York and New Jersey are up by five percent over the last year and the rail freight traffic nationwide is up to 4.5% over 2013, the highest volumes uh, since uh, 2007. At, uh, as a result of this, uh, we will see uh, a distribution of product from across the country uh, coming to uh, increase cargo through, new, through the Port of New York and through our highways and so on and so far. Uh, my question to you is that New, do New York uh, has began uh, to prepare themselves and to develop a plan as a result of what is happening with the, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, pa Panama Canal? Um, we work very closely with, uh, with the Port Authority, who, uh, as you know, uh, controls the ports in the downstate area. Um, but uh, uh, we make investments in our facilities to complement uh, their investments to make sure that uh, uh, our freight traffic, uh, particularly for those uh, goods that are manufactured in, not only in New York State, but manufactured throughout the country, uh, come in and out as expeditiously as we can. And um, making those investments in ports, uh, the governor's budget includes a, a $65 million port initiative uh, for the upstate regions, uh, mm -hmm. Ogdensburg, uh, Albany, um, so, and Oswego, because that is vital to making sure goods from the downstate region come upstate and vice versa, and we will continue to do that. Okay. I, do, uh, I do have introduced a bill uh, to address some of this uh, and to be helpful a little bit on this matter. So I would like uh, for, for you and your staff probably to look at it and I, uh, give you some Absolutely. feedback on the bill. 
Absolutely. Uh, uh, second question is, uh, as you probably know, uh, uh, some of the legislators sitting here from New York City, uh, uh, we represent the BQE. And the BQE, when you put 10 10 wins, the first thing at 5 10 in the morning, say, do not take the BQE. Go through local street because it's always jammed. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we've been having this problem for many, many years. Uh, it's not a problem that is going to be solved overnight. Uh, but the other, the, one of the issues here is that uh, we have a lot of construction going on. And, uh, and to some extent, I will say, you know, we'll thank uh, your staff on to some extent because when we call sometimes they've been uh, uh, responsive. Uh, and, uh, but the bottom line is that we have community boards uh, in New York City. We have 59 community boards. We have a community board uh, that the BQE cross by. It's community board 10, community board 7, community board 6. And it's go from Bay Ridge, Sunset Park, and through uh, Pass Slope. And, uh, and um, I represent those community, and the BQE mainly is in the heart of my district. Uh, so therefore, uh, I would like to know, you know, do you have any update about the one is about BQE, what is happening with the BQE, uh, number one, reconstruction, and number two, uh, you know, I would like to post to you personally uh, that I would like to have a town hall meeting uh, uh, with you folks, and if you cannot be present, but uh, the community board has been very active, reaching out to the commissioner's office, and uh, we haven't gotten nowhere. Uh, the opposite about my colleague from, Lo <coughs> excuse, excuse me, from Staten Island, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's been month. It's not it's just a phone call from one day. Uh, so, so I will be uh, very happy that if we can hold a town hall meeting uh, to include the community boards in my community as well as uh, to give them a real update of what is happening with the with the governance, what is happening with the BQ, what is happening uh, also as a result that you have so many repairs on the that BQE. And this subcontractor leave everything behind. I have a bunch of pictures that I take on a Sunday, on a Saturday, because they leave everything over, all over the place. Uh, again, your folks have been very responsive and to some extent by calling the contractor. One day I had it to be there before Christmas because uh, they could not, uh, nobody could, can come out to clean up the whole thing. So I have my staff coming over with myself to do it, which is very responsive. So, uh, you know, so uh, first question is about the update on the Gowana. Second, hopefully we can follow up uh, to have a town hall meeting. And number three, to have a better oversight about these contractors who think they can do whatever they want. They don't have to listen to nobody. And they continue to leave everything behind uh, without being picking up all the garbage that they leave at the end of the day. Well, I'll, I'll start with your last one first because the uh the, if the contractors um, are leaving the work site uh, in a way that is not acceptable, there are penalties that we can impose. So we're, um, and that is not acceptable. So we are happy to follow up on that one specifically. Number two, um, happy to, to participate in a meeting with the various community boards on both um, uh, the BQE and the Gowanus. Um, the Gowanus is um, its last uh, contract is going to be awarded shortly, and then all of the work on the Gowanus will be complete. So if you look at the uh, Staten Island Expressway across the Verrazano, the Gowanus right to the, um, uh, right to the BBT, um, mo that work will be complete from uh, the state standpoint. Um, uh, it's primarily uh, replacement work on the Gowanus, replacing the deck. Um, but uh, that will be that will be the last project will be started this year, and then um, then that work will be completed, and the the three plus bus lane will be in effect uh, during the commuting hours. But I'm happy to come and and give an update on the BQE uh, and uh, more specifics on the Gowanus. Commissioner, thank you. Okay. Senator Savino, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McDonald, and following up on <laughs> the extension of, uh, of the work, I I'm not going to ask you to reiterate the answers you gave to Assemblyman Cusick and uh, Assemblyman Ortiz on the two main road areas right. of the Gowanus and the Staten Island Expressway. First, I want to say thank you. On the Staten Island Expressway, your, your department really has done amazing work, and your staff down there has been great. You know, Charlie has been amazing in keeping us um, up to date. And 
I just want to say thank you for that. Also, a couple of years ago, Assemblyman Cusick and I raised the issue with you about the, creating the idea of a, a, a transportation czar, someone who would oversee and coordinate projects. It was rejected by the administration, but what has happened, and I will be the first to say, there has been coordination between your agency with city DOT, so we don't have a situation where you have you working above, city DOT shutting down the roads underneath and just crippling the region. So for that, again, I want to say thank you. Thank you. On the Kiwanis Expressway, though, um, it's, it's interesting. I think it's a project that started before I was born, and it will probably not be completed until after I am long gone and dead. Uh, it is a perpetual project, and the only concern I have about this project is we tend to be just patching it, you know, and that's what we've been doing for a very long time. But unlike the Staten Island Expressway project, we're not adding capacity on the Gowanus. So I, what I see, no matter what happens, and I'm sure Assemblyman Ortiz can agree with me and anybody else from Brooklyn, S Senator Dillon, uh, Senator Montgomery, we're just gonna have the same bottlenecks. You may have a smoother surface, but we're not gonna move the traffic any further. And I would hope that if we're gonna continue to invest tremendous amounts of money <coughs> in the BQE that we look at the possibility of expansion in some way, shape, or form. Otherwise, an 11, mi 11 miles from my house at the foot of the Verrazano Bridge to the Battery Tunnel is all of 11 miles. Actually, through the Battery Tunnel is 11 miles. Depending on the time of day, it can take me eight minutes or it can take me two hours. So if we don't address capacity and just continue to patch the roadway, we're not going to improve the transit flow through the area, and we're going to continue to cripple local streets and roads. And I, I know that roadway network very well. Um, I don't disagree with you, um, and we're happy to continue that capacity discussion. Uh, we do believe that when all the work is completed in Staten Island and um, on the Gowanus, that the three-plus uh, HOV lane will improve, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, you know congestion is, is good and bad. Congestion means that uh, the economy is is moving and things are moving, um, and that's a that's a heavy truck route. Um, but uh, uh, we do we are happy to continue that discussion and sh and share the numbers from the HOV lane once it HOV uh, three plus. Mm -hmm. We we believe that will improve traffic flow. Uh, with that, though, comes enforcement. Uh, right Absolutely. now, there is no Absolutely. enforcement in the HOV lane. People use it. You, you can see it you know, any day. There are single you know, riders going down the HOV lane. They get down to the battery tunnel, and nobody even stops them there. So that's got to be part and parcel of it. Otherwise, we're just creating a, an express lane for people who are willing to, to violate it. the law. Exactly. And, and you mentioned the coordination between uh, state DOT and city DOT, mm -hmm. and for that piece of it, we have to bring uh, NYPD traffic enforcement into the mix. There's another, there's another project that's been proposed for a different section of Brooklyn, um, the Ocean Parkway, redesign of Ocean Parkway. Do you have an update on where they are? They, they're make, they made the proposal recently to the community board. It's talking about changing uh, the flow of traffic on Ocean Parkway and where people can turn. It's gonna disrupt, uh, in some ways, where, you know, People are not even going to be able to turn off their own street. They're going to have to go three blocks out of their way. So I was just wondering if you have an update. If you don't, if you could get that to me, I'd appreciate that. I don't have it in front of me, and I'll, I'll get it to you right away. And, and finally, on design build, back mm -hmm. to the issue of design build. Last year, when we were trying to extend design build, um, it, we, we broke down over the threshold of the projects. There was a dispute as to whether $5 million downstate and $15 million upstate or whatever the the thresholds were, would trigger a PLA. I noticed in the governor's language, though, they've completely walked away from that idea. It's design, build, um, making it permanent, and I believe there's a, dis a discussion of if a project is 50 million or more, it would require a PLA study. What exactly is your understanding of what that means? Yes, uh, for any project that is 50 million or greater uh, would require a due diligence study and then identify what the potential savings are uh, from a project labor agreement. Um, and if the savings are there, include a, a project labor agreement as part of the design build contract. So what if the project was $49 million? We wouldn't even examine it? It, it, it sets the threshold in the statute. It doesn't mean that we can't, we can't do it anyway um, if, it's, if, it's a, if it's around that price range. There's, there's nothing that prohibits uh, DOT or any other agency from doing that.
It just sets the threshold and statute that it must be done. Would, would, the, would the work be postponed until after the analysis was done as to whether or not a PLA would provide savings? Um, no, we, I mean, we, we, we did a due diligence study, for example, for the Gowanus, and we did that um, as we were moving uh, the, the project through the procurement process. We didn't slow anything down for that. Um, so is it, maybe I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but is it possible we could do all of these projects without a project labor agreement? Without a project labor agreement? We could. Well, that would be distressing, I would think. But, I would we, think. but, but I think the due diligence study um, you know, if labor comes to the table, the contractors uh, association comes mm -hmm. to the table and says, what are the ways that we could uh, generate savings, generate time, and uh, if it saves money that, you know, as Bob Magna was saying, you save money on one project, you reinvest it into another project. Well, project labor agreements provide um, disruption protection. Yes, um, I'm, they do. A, I'm a bigger fan of that than I remember the idea of the open shop where you may have a union contractor you know, part union, part not union, that's, that's much more disruptive to a job, um, and I would think that we would be looking to, to utilize PLAs whenever we possibly can. It's good for the employer, it's good for the state, it's good for the contractor, it's good for the taxpayer. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Scoopus. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Uh, it's good to see you again, good and to see like you. many of my colleagues, I wanna first thank your staff um, Region 8, Lower Hudson Valley, they've always been very <coughs> responsive and, and they do a great job. Um, I want to ask one sort of general question before I get to my more specific local question. Uh, you know, I've seen over the past couple of years I've, I've been in office, uh, you know, certainly you know, you've got the, the budget and everything that's appropriated for DOT in the state budget, and, but then there, there are sort of these ad hoc announcements throughout the year of different uh, appropriations for various projects throughout the state. You know, last year I just pulled up on my phone, for instance, $100 million to, to uh, a large stretch of Long Island to repave <coughs> there. And you know, so there are these announcements all over the place, and I, I guess my question is, can you walk me through the evolution of how these announcements are made? Um, which projects are decided on? Uh, do they bubble up completely from staff? You know, do you get a call from the governor's office and get direction from his staff? Uh, who makes the ultimate decision? You know, do you sign off on them? Can you walk me through that sort of decision? Sure. Um, the ca our, our ca when you look at our capital program, um, by necessity it has to be fluid. Um, and you mentioned uh, the additional money for uh, Long Island when we did some additional um, paving projects. We also did additional paving projects throughout the state. Um, last winter was, uh, was uh, particularly harsh and we saw what the winter did to the pavement. And so when we, we have regular capital program meetings and we're always looking at the timetable of contract lettings, and we reallocated some of the funds within our existing program, projects that, that weren't going to get awarded, um, and did, made the decision to, uh, uh, to do the additional paving projects both on Long Island and across the state. So and and who, who specifically is we? Um, are you, know, are, we, are you we, involved in we, those? Oh, of course. We, yeah. we the department, primarily. Um, we take input from... Uh, uh, from state elected officials, input from the localities, um, uh, input from uh, uh, various advocates, whether it's AAA, um, uh, Tri-State, others, where, where the needs are, and, and that's how we assess uh, uh, our investment decisions. And okay. it's, it's, like I said, it's, it has to be fluid um, so that we can address any of these issues that come up, and just uh, a capital program by its nature uh, Projects sometimes slip, uh, an unforeseen utility issue, for example, comes up and a project that we thought was gonna happen in 2015 slips to 2016. Okay, uh, thank you. You're and uh, so I guess you know, that sort of directs me to my more specific question. Um, and if you remember our conversation last year, you probably are anticipating what I'm gonna ask. Um, the exit 131 interchange yes. in front of Woodbury Common uh, it was, uh, phase one was supposed to start in 2013. It was delayed, as, as you well know, until uh, at least as of now, 2017, the earliest. Um, I believe it's the most important project in the Hudson Valley, west of the Hudson. 
uh, you know, perhaps um, you can uh, share your insight on whether you agree with that insight on whether you agree with that first. But but my my concern continues from last year. I, I, uh, my first question is, has there been any progress in trying to secure the funding for that it, project? It is still scheduled for 2017, and um, you know, it is one of the projects that I'm going to discuss with Bob Magna because it's right at the uh, juxtaposition of Route 17 um, and the throughway right there. Uh, Woodbury Common is doing a major expansion of their development, and uh, we've had discussions with the developer um, and the local governments uh, regarding various ways to uh, to fund it in addition to state uh, dollars. So we will continue that discussion, but right now it is still on target for 2017. And, and are there any discussions about accelerating the project in light of the casino that's been cited in Sullivan County up the road? You know, again, one of the, uh, uh, you know, it, it's sort of the concerns are accumulating at this point. Um, you know, we're going to be seeing thousands of additional cars moving through that interchange because of the casino daily, millions probably annually as a result of the casino. And uh, it's already a bottleneck, even without the casino there, because, largely because of Woodbury Common. So is there any discussion right now about accelerating um, and beginning phase one prior to 2017? There is not, but um we will be happy to sit down with the, the selected developers and see what additional uh, traffic. We, we, we actually, as part of the uh, input into the selection process, DOT looked at the individual traffic models. I'm not quite sure how far east that Sullivan County traffic analysis went, but uh, we'll take a look at it and, and see if it bears uh, changing the schedule. Okay. Would, would you agree with the assessment that it is one of I'm sure you know you're not going to uh, you know, sort of off the cuff rank projects, but would would this be at the top of your list as far as Hudson Valley capital projects go? I'm not going to at the at the uh, at the risk of uh, offending some of your colleagues in other parts of the state. I'm not going to uh, address it. it. It is an important project, but I I don't think it makes a lot of sense to say the top one, the top two, the top three. But yeah, you know, I I just hope you know the, my first more general question. You know, it, it, it jives with what I'm asking now, and I hope that during these fluid uh, conversations that DOT has, as you described, this does become part of the conversation, accelerating that date. Um, you know, phase one, $30 million. Uh, in, you know, in the grand scheme of a, I think you said, um, $2.3 billion capital uh, budget, it works out to about 1% of your capital budget, phase one. Um, you know, I happen to think this is an important enough project where it's worth considering um, accelerating. So I appreciate uh, uh, any, you know, further conversations we can have to that effect. We can do Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Panapinto. Good morning. Uh, Good morning, First Senator. of all, I wanted to thank you for uh, the DOT's uh, help in upstate New York. Uh, I've spoken to the uh, supervisors of the uh, towns that are affected in my district, and they're very complimentary of all the work that the DOT did in removing that, you know, uh, seven feet of snow from the, from the southern part of the district. So we really do appreciate that. Um, my question is on, um, there's Region 5 uh, funding issues. And um, there's great concern in Western New York amongst the contractors and the building trades unions that I've discussed that there was a error in the uh, uh, formula-based allocation uh, in state capital aid of about $167 million a few years ago. Um, do you know how that's been handled or if it's, if it's been resolved, that funding issue for Region 5? What, what we have been adhering to is uh, the MOU, which was signed by the legislative leaders um, and the executive branch um, in 2013-14. And that, um, that MOU is what has been guiding our capital pro program investments for the last two years. It's, it's, a, it's an MOU which outlines those uh, projects uh, across the state and um, that's that's what we adhere to so so so, th so there's no there's been no real investigation on that miscalculation no then. okay um, <clears throat> let me ask you just changing gears a little bit mm -hmm. um, does the capital program uh, that's laid out in the governor's budget does it contain uh, any dedicated funding for bicycle or pedestrian capital projects it, it doesn't contain dedicated, but I just want I don't want to quote the wrong number, so I want to get the correct number here. Um, 
Under the governor's direction, uh, state DOT, since January 2013, has invested more than $160 million in funding to support bicycle and pedestrian related projects. Uh, October 2014, $70 million. Uh, January 2014, $67 million. And January 2013, $26.5 million. We have been very aggressively making investments in bicycle and pedestrian projects across the state. Well, and I'm not questioning y y yep. your, your historical commitment to it. My question is, in, in this budget allocation, is any of that money earmarked for bicycle or pedestrian uh, Not going forward, and this wasn't earmarked either. This was part of, as I was saying, the fluid uh, budget discussions and capitalizing on federal dollars uh, that we received and um, uh, putting them together and putting it out on the street. So I guess what you're saying is we're going to rely on your historical commitment uh, moving forward. Yes. Okay. Um, a question regarding uh, sort of the, the, the DOT specifically for, from a manpower or a people power standpoint. Uh, Public Employees Federation uh, observes that the state has lost 850 engineering jobs since 2000 in the DOT. Um, how has this loss of engineering work been covered? in the last uh, 14 years? Well, in any uh, State Department, and in any agency, and in any organization, there's a churn. And um, as people uh, retire, we, we rehire. Um, before 2010, there were, you know, through the Great Recession, there were hiring freezes. Um, we have been filling positions. Um, you weren't here last year, but um, for the first time, uh, in five years, uh, civil service conducted the junior engineering exam, um, which has brought uh, new talent to our agency. And um, we continue to attract uh, engineering uh, positions, architects, um, and uh, we meet uh, the, the demands that the, of the department and the needs uh, that we have to. Do you know what the allocation for outside consulting services and engineering services has been in the last 10 years to, re to re replace these static engineering costs that used to be performed by, you know, state employees? We don't do an assessment of replacement. What we, what we have is approximately, uh, and this has been uh, almost, this has been pretty long standing, is approximately 50% of our engineering work is done by in-house forces and approximately 50% is done by consultants. And, and, and what's the benefit to the state in that? I mean, aren't we paying more for outside engineering costs than we would be for having engineers in-house? We have not seen an increase in our uh, capital project and capital program delivery as a result of that. And, is, and, and what's the plan going forward? I mean, are we gonna, are we gonna continue to let engineers fall by the wayside through attrition or are you gonna expand the existing engineer force that the DOT has? Well, we, we absolutely are not going to let them fall by the wayside. As I said, um, it's very important that we continue to, um, uh, to hire um, and to have uh, a robust workforce to, uh, uh, to meet the demands of our, of our program. Do, do you know what your planned, uh, you know, people power is for this year as compared to, you know, 10 years ago? Uh, DOT has approximately 8,200 employees. Um, and I think that is uh, the right number. How many have you lost in the last 10 years? I can't give you that number. I'll, I can check and get back to you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Assemblyman Abernathy. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for joining this, Commissioner. Uh, first, let me start with a, with a general comment. I know several years ago, you and I, um, uh, met, I guess, when we were both coming into office. Yep. And my experience from the local government uh, uh, formed the basis for my comment to you that uh, DOT was a department that everybody loved to hate. <laughs> I will I compliment that. you that I think you've done a lot of work to change that image. Thank you. Uh, I find your office uh, very responsive uh, in, and cooperative. Doesn't mean we get the stuff done, <laughs> but at least we're working together, and I think that's, that's a good first step. Uh, there, there are three, three items I'd like to cover quickly. Uh, first, um, capital budget projects. 
Uh, I wasn't here when you started because I was out checking my facts. But I'm understanding that our staff has not yet gotten the project list. And would it be possible to get that project list sure. as, as soon as possible so that we can take a look what's on there? Yep, we'll make sure you have it. Um, one of the things we've been cooperating on, as you know, is the 9A bypass exactly. in Elmsford. And I wanted to see if it was on that list, but we don't have the list to see if it's there. And that ha we have been making great strides in that project, and it's a real uh, cooperation. So we'll get you that list. Okay, thank you. You can't tell me if it's on there or not, can you? I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, and I don't I want to give that you misinformation. But, but, but we'll if, we, if our staff right could get the list, that yes. would be helpful. Yes. The second thing is, uh, is again, uh, something that we've been working together on, but we don't seem to have come to a final solution. Uh, and that is uh, sometimes environmental impacts in a neighboring area uh, intersect with uh, roadway right-of-ways. Uh, we have this situation with the Sawmill River Parkway that goes from, the, the, from one end of Westchester to the other end of Westchester, running along the Sawmill River, obviously, and the Sawmill River just constantly floods. It's not the fault of DOT, it's not the fault of DEC that it floods, but I do think we need some effort to resolve it. Your department has valiantly, every few years, come out, repaved the road, tried to raise the road to try to keep it above flood level, but we all admit that's a temporary solution. Is there a, I have to believe that this is a problem my colleagues have in other parts of the state. Is there any way to set up some kind of a program to work with DEC and the other departments to evaluate where work, environmental work, combined with DOT work, could resolve these problems once and for all? Uh, you know, I, I don't have any of the specifics, but DOT has been working very closely with, uh, with DEC on these issues, and um, it really came to the forefront uh, after Irene and Lee, and then even further after Sandy, when we've seen, you know, when a, when a roadway floods or a bridge is washed out due to water, it's generally not the bridge's fault, right. it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the waterway. Water. And we have, uh, you know, many programs have been announced uh, where DEC is, is uh, uh, shoring up those, uh, those waterways, and it's all done very, very closely with us. We've, we're, we're doing a lot of work um, in the Mohawk Valley. Um, I don't know if we've had a specific conversation with them about the sawmill, but um, Can we I put that, that on that the is, list? I will put that on and, the and list. And I would really like to see, perhaps on a statewide basis, I don't know what you set up a joint task force between the two of you or something, because we're spending a lot of money repairing roadways, mm -hmm. and, and we could be using that money in, in, in just fixing the environment in the first place. And the, the Sawmill River situation, um, I'm understanding from the Army Corps of Engineers <coughs> that they've already done a study, they're willing to do another study, they're willing to put money in to fix it if we could only get the state and local match. And the locals say that they'll put some money into it, but they don't have enough to really do the match so they need the state input. And from what I'm understanding from DEC, there's no money in their budget for this. And I'm not hearing anything from you that says there's money in your budget for this. So how do we get everybody together, rather than having you come out every five years and raise the, you know, spend money on raising the, the road and not solving the problem? Because all that does is funnel the water down further right. downstream, and, and people downstream now are underwater. And, and like I said, we have, you know, in those areas that were affected by Irene Lee and Sandy, we've we've had some great success. Right, but that's, but that's, not that's a an emergency that's response. Very, right. That's no. It's also it's 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 recovery, but it's also making investments in long-term resiliency. And um, um, we that's, you know we true. did it on uh, on Long Island with Ocean Parkway. We've we've done it in some of the in the Mohawk Valley areas. Um, I need to look at uh, the sawmill specifically to see right. what we it, can It do has there. a major impact. I mean, part of Elmsford is underwater. I mean, yeah. it, every, time it, every time there's a major rain, it's not just the size of Stanton. Agreed. Agreed. So uh, I would appreciate it if, there's, if we could set up some kind of a formal structure okay. so that we're not just doing an ad hoc <coughs> process. Uh, the last thing is <coughs> I'd like to pick up on what the senator asked you about was the balance of, of engineering in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just ask that perhaps your department take a serious look, a, a study, on which is the more efficient way to do it. We went through this when I was on the Westchester Board of Legislators, and there was a move uh, to, 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 to go to outside consultants. And for a period of time, we diminished our engineering staff and did go to outside consultants. And eventually, we reversed that because we realized it was costing us more. 
even with the benefits and all of the other things that you have for public employees, we were actually better off having the expertise in-house and keeping it in-house rather than going to the outside. So I would ask that your department do a serious study of that to see if in the long run it's not better, <coughs> excuse me, to keep the expertise in-house. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, <coughs> Senator Montgomery. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, almost. I just want to comment uh, and ask a question um, on the other part of the BQE that uh, Senator Savino and uh, Assemblyman Ortiz mentioned, and that is, uh, I see in your in your report to us that uh, you have one of your largest uh, bridge products projects is the Casquiasco. Are you talking about our bridge? That, that okay. is the, the cost I just want to make sure I'm asking. Well, yes. Uh, okay. So, um, that being the case, obviously the Kosciuszko Bridge is extremely critical um, to traffic moving between from wherever uh, uh, south of it. I, I am, I'm always confused about direction over there. But um, into Manhattan, into Queens, Long Island, and Brooklyn, Long, Queens, Island. Long Island. Yes. Exactly. Yep. And it poses a, an extreme bottleneck problem always. There's always a traffic uh, jam there. Um, I'm just wondering, one, what is, where are you <coughs> with that bridge? Uh, and also, um, just sort of related to an update on wh where it is, um, how that's planned to relieve some of that bottleneck. And also, um, what is your, MWBE uh, target and how close are you to reaching it? Uh, the project, uh, the contract was awarded um, in uh, uh, August. Uh, it is a joint venture of, it's a design build contract. It is a joint venture of uh, New York firms, Skanska, Echo 3, um, and it is well underway. Uh, construction has begun. Uh, you will start to see uh, much more aggressive construction as we get into the spring. The goal of the project is to do two things primarily. Uh, number one, um, the, if, if, if you know the bridge, the current bridge well, uh, the steep grade uh, creates uh, fender benders, which oftentimes leads to the congestion because there are no shoulders for a, a disabled vehicle to come off the road. So the, the new bridge will have wider lanes. It will have uh, shoulders. Uh, so it will relieve that congestion between uh, Brooklyn and Queens. The grade will be less steep, but it will still accommodate, uh, hopefully, a lot of vessel traffic on Newtown Creek. Um, and the, one of the other issues is the weave to get onto the LIE once you get in Queens, mm -hmm. and that will be straightened out as well. So um, we are very proud of that project. Um, we are excited about it. It uh, uh, straddles Brooklyn and Queens, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know the, the community boards, but they have been actively involved. Uh, in the in the planning of that project and are part of the stakeholders committee during the construction of that project and um, there will be uh, additional park uh, facilities that will be uh, built uh, there will be a bicycle pedestrian lane on the bridge um, and um, it, it is it is a signature project for the department and the MWBE, yeah. I don't know what that number is off the top of my head, okay. and we'll get it to you, but the, uh -huh. the contractor is, the uh, contracting team is very committing to meeting or exceeding the goal. We've, right. uh, we, we have monthly partnering meetings, and they are very aggressively pursuing the MWBE portion. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I guess it's okay. Uh, Samuel Lehman Brennan. Commissioner McDonald, hello. Hello, Assemblyman. Uh, 
want to talk about uh, upstate and downstate uh, non-MTA mass transit systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they're not happy with the budget proposal. The uh, those I think systems. they're scheduled to testify a little later mm -hmm. today. Yes, mm -hmm. they will probably express that point of view in a moment. Uh, but um, so the upstate transit systems get no operating aid increase and no new capital funding, although there was some from last year, which is rolled over. And the, the downstate uh, non-MTA systems get no new operating aid, and then they get this uh, peculiar $17 million uh, additional funds for capital, which they have to spend on capital. So, so last year, uh, the upstate systems were expressing the concern that because their source of funding is the petroleum business tax, uh, which has been uh, flat or declining for a number of years for various reasons, uh, that they were asking the legislature and, and the governor and the department to come up with a change in formula to assist them, and then we, we didn't do that other than to add this general fund amount and then uh, set that cost of living uh, from this, this account from the general fund starting at three million, so the extra cost of living adjustment for this year is 70,000 uh, bucks. So, um, you know, so these systems, a lot of poor people ride these buses in the urban and suburban areas, at college students, their cost of service continue to rise. Their ridership, in many cases, is actually rising. There are more people using these bus systems. So why, why can't you propose some kind of policy to assist these transit systems? You know, wh where is, why isn't there any uh, proposal to help these systems out? I mean, okay, yes, you're gonna give them some more capital, but you know, they need capital, they need operating aid increases. The, the, the problems uh, were discussed extensively last year, and there's nothing. You raise a very good point with the increase in ridership. Um, you know, what uh, demographic trends are showing is that um, uh, as urban centers, whether they're the city of New York, city the of Buffalo Rochester, billion, Syracuse, yes. mm -hmm. right. or smaller cities such as Ithaca um, and others, uh, people are want to have the choice of transit. And um, I don't disagree with you that we haven't taken a fresh look at how we how we look at our our transit systems, particularly in these areas where uh, ridership is growing, and what the right mix is. Um, but it's a complicated issue because uh, uh, there's a fair policy, uh, there's uh, operating costs, there's uh, uh, investment decisions in the capital, and um, it's not an easy, there, there's not an easy solution. Um, uh, I don't have the answer. Um, I think it does need to be part of a, a broader uh, discussion because um, uh, as population grows, uh, which we hope it does, and uh, as people choose to take transit, which we hope it does, um, it's we can't use the you know the formula uh, literally and figuratively from the 1970s. It's 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 time to take a, a fresh look at all of that, and I we have not done it, um, but uh, happy to 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 put it on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Senator um, Senator um, Kruger. Thank you, Commissioner. A lot of the questions you've gotten for quite a while now seem to be specific to individual projects, and I don't have those kinds of questions. I'm not going to ask the question I've asked you in the past, tell me what the projects you plan on funding in this year's budget are, because you always tell me we don't know yet. So I'll just, so just shake your head. We don't know yet, so you can't tell me the projects for your capital master list coming going forward? We, we have our list going forward because we're starting to 
put projects out on the street. Okay, so can you get us a list of your projects we going can. forward? We Thank can. you. We're ending the 2010-14 capital program. Can you get me a list of all the projects funded through that capital plan and what status they're at? So whether yes, they're can. completed, whether they are continuing. Will you need money from the going forward capital plan to complete projects that are underway from your 2010-14 plan? All of the projects that were in that plan, um, except for some that, as I mentioned, sometimes projects get deferred um, if we substituted, uh, all of those projects have been funded um, and have been advancing through the process, either uh, through construction or about to be let by March 31st of this year. Um, just, as, just as every year, you know, we have, we have a one-year capital appropriation, um, but we can't wait uh, till April 1st, because that's really the start of the construction season, so we, we get the projects teed up and ready to go. But all of the projects that were included, um, assuming there was no reason uh, that was outside of our control for it to be delayed, are, are, in, are in process. So that's 10 through 14. Are there still projects from the 2005-9 plan in process, uncompleted? I don't know the answer to that, but I will, we, will, we will look and, and find that out. Great. And the reason I'm asking is because obviously capital projects don't get done in a 12-month period. Right. So trying to hold things up in a budget year versus a continuing story of what is or is not on a list, what is or is not in a process. Right or even what might have actually got done and we didn't know it. That's why all three of those will be valuable yes. to look at together. And in that context, because it's always very hard to figure out where there are funding gaps and where there aren't when it comes to capital because it doesn't match up with one year periods, are we transferring money from general fund to fill short fill, shortfalls falls in the dedicated highway bridge trust fund or are we doing the reverse what's happening there i believe each year in the last two or three years there has been a general fund transfer because uh as vehicles have become more efficient the the dedicated fund has not been as robust um but money from the dedicated fund has not gone to the general fund. And we will get you the specifics of those also. And does dedicated highway and bridge trust fund money, you just said it doesn't go to general fund, does it go to pay for things besides highways and bridges, such as DMV or is that stopped? They have a portion of the dedicated fund, but I'm, again, I don't want to give you the the specific breakdowns and give it to you incorrectly, but we'll get you that. Okay. Those are my questions. Thank okay. you very much for your help. Thank you very much. Assemblyman Gant. Yes. Always on this side. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Thank you. I was going to ask all these personal questions earlier, but I thought <laughs> I better let everybody else get their stuff in before I did. One is, as you know, on was it Monday night we had the nor'easter. We did. Well, based upon that, uh, my CEO of my local bus company, uh, RGRTA, uh, could not stay. He had to get back home to make sure that people could get to work the following morning to school. So he did exactly that, and he told me to ask certain questions for him. Okay. So I'm asking those questions, and I assume those questions are also for me. And that is um, that they need, uh, as, as uh, Jim Brennan discussed earlier, uh, quite often we get answers. He was going to be here to ask them separate. We get those, those uh, questions from them. And so I've been asked to ask a direct question, and that's whether or not you guys can afford to come up with six million dollars of operating expenses that he needs. Uh, you don't have to give me the answer now. The guy right back there, I know that guy's gonna send me, you're gonna give me the answer. So I expect that answer soon. 
and I will tell my, commission, my CEO that you have it coming. So I expect that I'll have it by Monday, and I can tell them when I, on my way back down here to Albany. Um, the other thing I have, and, and I, you and I have agreed that we have a right to uh, disagree over this design bill stuff. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know exactly how many uh, contractors we have under contract to do this stuff and how many we have across the state. I mean, because it just boggles me that we would even be over that way. So if I could get that from, you're going to do that again? Look, okay, you're writing already. So you're going to send it to me. Uh, Sam Roberts was, oh, he's here now. But I have a list of stuff because I have to go through the same thing, Commissioner. And the issue is whether or not uh, where we are with I-81. Because every time my friends come over to my house in Syracuse, they ask the same darn question. When are you going to get I-81 solved? So to make sure they're probably going to look, look at this over the news, that you're going to tell us when we're going to get I-81 solved. So right. Sam, uh, I neither get beat up. See, if I, <laughs> if I get beat up, Sam has to protect me. So. Uh, the the, the I-81 project is, uh, is a an exciting project. Um, we are in the final stages of what's called the public scoping process. Uh, we are adhere because we will use uh, some portion of federal funds on whichever alternative is selected. We are adhering to NEPA, uh, the National uh, Environmental Protection Act. Uh, we work very closely with our partners at Federal Highway. Uh, the public scoping process requires us to have an aggressive uh, public input. That public input process closed on September 2nd of 2014. We received over a thousand comments. Uh, those response to those comments are being finalized right now. Uh, and we expect uh, very soon to release the final public scoping document. Uh, there were 17 alternatives that were proposed, plus some additional ones that, were, that came in through that public comment period. We are narrowing those down, and then we will get into the full-scale um, uh, environmental review process to look at things such as uh, uh, construction impact on the environment, environmental justice, um, one of the things that the connectivity is, is a big issue for this project uh, uh, because it is an interstate, so that's something that we have to very carefully consider. Um, and we're also working closely with uh, the city and the county and the surrounding counties um, so that it fits into their land use plans, et cetera. Commissioner, I hate to say to you to your face, I don't believe you. And I say that only, and that nobody get excited about that. The only reason I say that is every time I see those people, them darn people from Syracuse, they ask me the same question. What's being done about I-81? Now, I don't understand how you got this big, beautiful thing out in front of me now. And you're explaining to me how, what you've done and how you're going to do it. And I keep getting the same thing from the public officials. Not saying, but from those public officials from Syracuse. So please get whatever information it is, please get it to them for me so I can stop having to answer, answer the questions that I can't answer. Okay, if you just do me that little favor, I'll, just, I'll thank you forever. Okay, okay, I will do that. And the, the last question uh, comment I have is, in terms of the surplus, is it five, five billion that the governor has in his pocket? Uh, I, you can't answer I that. I can't answer that. One. I thought you could. I can't answer That's that. That's why I sent him and uh, my speaker, Sheldon Silver, a letter saying, I don't know, since we missed out on the money from before, why we aren't putting money into transportation. Could you, by any chance, get that answer for me, why we're not putting additional? I, I, I will convey it to the, uh, to the new budget director, Mary Beth LeBate. Okay, and you will have him? Send yes. it to me. I'll have Ron He's make sure that happens. To me. Yep. Ron, what's your last name? Epstein. Epstein? Yep. He's my I, expe I expect to see this on Monday. 
We'll, we'll make sure you have it on Monday. Thanks very much, Commissioner. He smiles, so that means he's going to send it to me on Monday. Okay. Thank you again on our, Thank you. My, at least my behalf. Thanks very much for coming in and making your comments. Uh, and thank you for thank doing you. the good job that you do on behalf of all of us in this state. Senator. Commissioner, you know I'm one of those darn legislators. And I, you know, we've been going around and around in this project for a long time. And um, um, it's important to Syracuse, just so Assemblyman Gant knows what we're talking about. It's an interstate, 81, going through the center of the city. And the question is how we're going to, that's going to be redone because it's either got to come down or be fixed. And it's a huge, huge issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so when is the, your next report coming out that I thought was supposed to be January of 2015 that would outline the final list of possibilities uh, and uh, which you'll investigate further? It will be done this quarter. First quarter of 2015. It, there were there were some issues we've had to work through with Federal Highway on the connectivity side. Um, this quarter, didn't you at one time say January, or am I dreaming? I don't know if I said January at one point. Maybe right. I did. In any event, uh, whenever it comes out, uh, the process from there is that the final recommendations that you have, the final conclusions you have. There'll be much more in-depth study as to the feasibility of each and what's the recommended one. All right. Correct. You mentioned you had some issues with the federal people. How much have the, since you got to get money from the feds, because uh, we probably won't have a big bank settlement for some time now. In 27, we need that big bank settlement in 2017 to oh, start okay, construction. Oh, okay, but if we don't get it, you need substantial federal money. We do. Okay, have you, been dealing with the federal legislators uh, that represent the area that this goes over? I've had conversations with uh, the new congressman, Congressman Katko. Um, I've had conver we've had uh, discussions and meetings with uh, Senator Schumer on the project. Um, you know, uh, Senator, or excuse me, Congressman Hannon is on uh, the TNI committee. Um, we have not talked specifically about this project of late, um, but uh, uh, he has been a strong advocate and a good partner um, on transportation funding. So I think between Congressman Hannon and Congressman Katko, uh, we have two strong advocates who are both on the TNI committee. Okay, and so obviously, uh, every, probably every, anybody you talk to is a different ideas to how this should be done. That's part of the problem. Uh, but wouldn't it be important that, that uh, in order to get federal funding, that those individuals weigh in on what they think would be best, which would be the best, it may not be the ideal solution for anybody, but be the best chance of getting substantial funding, which is absolutely necessary. Is that yes. a fair statement? Okay. Yes. And you intend to do that? At the, on an ongoing basis. Okay. Yep. All right. Now, with respect to, um, without getting, into, I won't get into the specifics because uh, it's too boring for anybody to listen to. But um, I want to get into some more general issues um, with respect to the budget. Okay. How much new capital money from whatever part of the budget, doesn't matter, total new capital money from the governor's budget? Approximately. Okay, our capital budget all in is approximately three and a half billion. And uh, on top of that, there is the proposed uh, 750 million, of which 150 million will be this year, which is we are proposing to do 100 bridges in those uh, key corridors. Uh, there's an additional 60 million for ports, um, and that's that's basically what the, the capital budget is for state DOT. Okay. And uh, obviously your backlog is probably in the billions. Is that fair to say as far as things that have to be done? We, we, have, we have a large backlog and we keep chipping away at it. Okay. Now, with respect, do you know if any of that money that's being uh, directed, the additional money being directed to the DOT comes from these, this bank settlement? 
We, the, the 750 million is from additional um, uh, bond cap within the capital program. Uh, the 60 million for the ports is from the settlement. Um, and uh, those are the, the two pieces that come directly to, to DOT. From the settlement? Right. 750 plus 60. Right. Now the 750 is not the settlement, it's additional um, bond cap. All right, but as far as directly from the fund, this the settlement, you expect 60 million if the budget passes as proposed. Correct. All right. Um, I happen to be someone who believes strongly that this should be used for infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. You say you're doing 100 bridges right now. Uh, and how much are you dedicating money for it? How much will that cost, the 100 bridges? Well, that. That 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 hundred the hundred bridges will be paid for out of the out of the seven hundred and fifty million in, oh, in bond I see. cap. Yeah, yeah, okay. right. and and that that's in addition to our our core program. That's in addition to the hundred and fifteen bridges that we're doing from FEMA, um, and some of the additional, you know, work that we're doing. Don't you think it'd be a great <laughs> idea to take a since the Thruway Authority is getting over a billion dollars for one project, one project, don't you think it'd be a good idea for regional balance to take another billion dollars from that fund and chip away at your, t uh, do it, do it uh, per, uh, per capita, as far as the number of people in the area, kind of divide it up by population, and go chip away quicker at your list. Wouldn't that be a great idea? I leave that up to all of you as part of the budget negotiations. But you're guiding us as the Commission of Transportation. I, I just think it would be a terrific idea. But well, I, I think Would you that mind if I propose that as we go through? I think that you have to propose what, what you want to propose. Okay, but you would not, you would accept the money if it happened. I, oh, that's a tough one. All right, okay. I mean, if you don't say yes to that, then... I'm, all right, but seriously, that I think is a good use of the money. In any event, uh, do you have a five-year capital spending plan right now in existence? We have... We, we look at various different um, alternatives, uh, and right now we have a program that fits into... Uh, the governor's uh, proposed budget. Do you have a five-year capital spending plan in existence right now? Our five-year capital spending plan assumes the the 2.3 billion in each year. That's so you have a written plan in existence right now? We do. Um, and is that available to the uh, public? I think we can make it available. I, we're, we're Putting the fine tune, you know, we're fine tuning it, but I'm sure we can we can get that to you. Uh, how long would that take? And I guess you might probably know why I'm asking. That. I do know why you're asking. Um, I will go back to the office and and check, and I we will okay. get back to you All right. quickly. Thank you. Um, now, uh, I guess my time is up, and Marty Delon has another question. Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. But if I can follow up on his question, um, what is the amount of your five-year capital plan? Our, what we plan for is what's in the five-year executive budget. Which I want is, a dollar amount. Which is basically a dollar which amount, is, please. Which is approximately a dollar amount. Two point three billion a year. For five years, okay. For each year, yes. For each year. Okay, I, I just have two points. I wanted to follow up again on uh, the Capital Review Board because I don't know that your answer was sufficient previously. I know that um, when the MTA came out with its capital plan, you actually have 90 days to review it, and I think you rejected it immediately, and I still want to know how can you reject it without reviewing it. Because we didn't think 90 days was sufficient. And that's why we reject, and that's why we disapproved it. But that without means prejudice. you did not review it. We, 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 at the time, we decided it, in consultation with the other members of the capital program. Well, I review think board you did not consult any members. You, re, you rejected it on your own. No, I did not. I, I rejected you it. You have with, a veto vote. I'm on the capital review I, board also. But um, just one member rejected it. One member it. can reject it. Yeah. And so, we, but I think I you, you rejected it probably before even it came out, I believe. No, I did not reject it before it came out. 
-hmm. rejected it shortly after it came out because we did not believe that 90 days was sufficient. But you had 90 assess. days to review it and you did not exercise that. You rejected it immediately and I don't know what basis you had to do that. I mean, there is a gap in that plan. I agree with you on that. There's a huge gap, and yeah. we did not believe that 90 days, I did not believe that 90 days was sufficient to make that assessment. And that's why we, I rejected well, it I just Well, I just feel that someone who makes a decision like the one you made has to be held accountable for it, and I think that you owe the public. Uh, I, don't, I don't disagree with that, and I've given you my reason. And accountable, I, yeah, think I don't think acceptable, but that's your opinion. Yep. But um, secondly, we'll move on. Um, <clears throat> in this year's uh, Opportunity Agenda, um, it's proposed uh, shared resources between your department and the New York State Thruway Authority. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that for us and, and let us know what that's about? And secondly, I would like to know what employee protections are within that since two different agencies are involved. One is a state agency and one is an authority. Sure. Um, We've, we've just begun the discussion, you know, as you know, there's a new executive, new uh, uh, acting executive director of the Thruway Authority, and we just think it makes sense that um, uh, between our pool of engineers, his pool of engineers, um, that we can share design services. Um, we have not looked at the employee protection issues yet, um, but we will make sure that as we look at shared services, that is a factor that we look at. Mm -hmm. um, but it just makes a lot of sense um, that uh, we've got a lot of engineering expertise between our two agencies. We've got a lot of architecture expertise between our two agencies um, that folks have the opportunity to, to work on different projects and make that happen. Do we anticipate any uh, savings as a result of this? We have not quantified those yet. Mm -hmm. So what are the benefits? Uh, the benefits are, I think, a lot of the benefits are directly to uh, the employees. They get the opportunity to work on different projects that if they were just working on, say, a throughway project, they might not. Um, and we, we believe there will be savings, and when they're quantified, we're happy to share them with you. Thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, just wanted to go back to the, uh, the five-year bridge uh, plan or the, or the uh, 150 that would be targeted for 100 bridges. Have those bridges been selected? Do we know how many of those will be state bridges, how many local bridges? I don't know off the top of my head what the, the breakdown is across the state. Or what uh, percentage of the dollars will go. Again, if I give a percentage, then it, if it's not correct, I, I don't want to do that. But as they, as they become final, we'll share them with But you. clearly, we're going to be ahead of where we would have been if we weren't. Uh, if we weren't uh, doing those 100 doing bridges, that, uh, absolutely. Chairman DeFrancisco uh, spoke some about, you, you know, putting the, the how we uh, focus the dollars and uh, both for this and the others. I, I do think that the, the CHIPS formula uh, has been one that has driven dollars, uh, you, you know, across the state and certainly last year with the winter recovery money uh, doing that along those lines. I think that that was a, a smart decision. I might, uh, you know, I would check off, you can get my support, Senator DeFrancisco, for that and, and hopefully uh, budget negotiations might lead us to driving, uh, whether it's some additional dollars. You know, we see local governments uh, pressured, obviously, by the tax cap and others, and, and for many, especially small communities, those dollars, uh, highway dollars, make a large portion of especially small community budgets. And uh, certainly anything we can do along those lines are, are helpful. Yes, and that's why we don't just use uh, vehicle counts when we factor in and that this uh, these corridors whether they're agriculture freight commerce um, they may not necessarily have the highest traffic volumes but they're an important economic consideration for that community thank you thank you senator i'm going to close with a few more questions and a different okay. topic um, 
Assemblyman uh, Brennan had talked about upstate transit. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you know the numbers as far as uh, comparing it to downstate transit dollars by the state of New York? I, I have the, I have the abs, I don't have it broken down in front of me by upstate transit system. Um, the total number for the upstate transit systems, which is in Albany, uh, Utica and Syracuse, which are combined, right. is 180.7 million. And I'll get you the breakdown um, mm -hmm. by locality. And do you, do you, uh, uh, I don't need the breakdown, but do you okay. have, is there, do you have an idea how much new money is for operating expenses the upstate transit got in this budget? That is, uh, that is I believe, flat. Flat, so that nothing was provided. Nothing additional. Um, now, how about in capital assistance? Down, downstate yeah. got so capital, upstate did not. Operating upstate got nada. Capital upstate got nada, correct? Well, now tell me what downstate got in operating and capital. Call. Downstate, operating, uh, the downstate suburban transit systems got 290.4 million and 17 million capital. He's got a good stage whisper, doesn't no, he? No, he's good. <laughs> I've been watching him. He's got good, good information. Uh, so uh, did you present a budget to the governor before he made his overall budget? We submit our budget through the, the, the budget division. Okay. And my question is, uh, when you submitted a budget, I'm not going to ask you what you asked for or whatever, did you consider this disparity as something that might be something that should be addressed? Well, we live within the overall 2% cap. And so we all have to make some hard decisions. I, uh, as I've said on you know a couple occasions when we talked about NFTA, we talked about upstate transit aid overall. Uh, happy to continue the conversation about what the formula should be. Um, but my budget lives within the 2% cap. I understand that, but zero operating, zero capital upstate, and then the, the increase that you just mentioned. So I think Assemblyman Brennan had it right on the head. What's needed, and we tried to do it last year, is a new formula, mm -hmm. uh, because the formula isn't driving what it used to drive to upstate, and they're getting deeper and deeper and deeper in the hole. I know, the only one I know clearly about is, is uh, Centro in Syracuse, they're going to start cutting roots, and we're going to hear that. That's a preview to the upstate uh, uh, transit making their, their presentation in a little while. So I just wanted to bring it out on the mm -hmm. table, and if you enter into or ask your opinion or you're getting involved, the key is another formula so that each year we don't go deeper and deeper in the hole. I don't deny downstate what their needs, but zero is not good when there's increases downstate. And, and as, I, as I said in response to some, Assemblyman Brennan, and, and I'll re reiterate, uh, a 1970s formula doesn't work in 2015, and we okay. do have to address it. And if you could come up with one, that would be <laughs> terrific. I will, I will do my best. <laughs> All right, great. And would you also, as you start to talk about that, talk with the RGRTA? Absolutely. Who seems uh, yeah, to have a system? The upstate who seems systems. to have a system that works much yes. better than anybody and else's the in the state? Yep. I think, uh, the, and I think the, that's part of it. The Best level practices. is uh, a dollar per trip, so yep. I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Rather than having a, a system that we simply ask that you give us more money, I, I think efficiency should also count. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. We, Sir, no, no, I got to respond. Syracuse charges, or what Central charges, a dollar for per ride as well. But number two, uh, if Rochester's in such great shape, maybe you can send your money over to the other transit. <laughs> I will leave that to the two. You, of you. Senator, you don't want to start that one with me. Okay, you better, you better, you better not start that. Thank you very Thank you. much. And Commission, I think you're doing a great job. Thank you, Senator. I really do. And I want to thank Senator Montgomery for bringing up the Cosco's coverage. 
Thank you. My we'll district. now do the 11 o'clock <laughs> version. <laughs> New York State Department of Motor Vehicles, J. David Sampson, Executive Deputy Commissioner. Look at that. So you know what happened with the one on the right? Tom. took over the MTA. Yeah. And they hired yeah. 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 They used to figure two and a half to three buses a day would be fine maintenance wise. So the only one took it over. They're standing across the street. It was over four. Right? And it's hard to get them. It's hard to get them convinced that they can do better. Take care. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We were looking for you earlier this morning. <laughs> I'm sorry if I held you up. No, you didn't. We were just getting nervous. <laughs> Would you like me to begin, sir? <clears throat> yes, begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairperson DeFrancisco, Chairperson Farrell, and other members of the legislature for inviting me here today. I am David Sampson, the Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Motor Vehicles. I am pleased to have the opportunity to address you and answer any questions you may have regarding the fiscal year 2015-16 executive budget as it applies to our agency. Governor Cuomo's executive budget plan allows DMV to continue to build upon the innovations and efficiencies achieved over the past four years. It provides $325 million for DMV, which will enable us to continue our efforts to improve overall customer service, promote traffic safety, and protect consumers. For fiscal year 2015-16, revenue collections from all transactions are projected to total more than $1.7 billion. We will perform more than 28 million transactions including over 5.5 million internet transactions, many completed through My DMV, DMV's personalized web portal. The executive budget includes legislation to amend the vehicle and traffic law to facilitate New York State's compliance with federal requirements relating to the issuance of commercial learners' permits and the disqualification of commercial driver's licenses and commercial learner's permits. In addition, the budget includes legislation to amend the vehicle and traffic law to allow an overweight vehicle permit issued by DOT to serve as sufficient documentation without having to also receive an updated registration from DMV as currently required. Through the Governor's Traffic Safety Committee, DMV will continue its outstanding traffic safety initiatives that have made New York's roadways among the safest in the nation. DMV distributes approximately $30 million in federal funding annually to support traffic safety initiatives, including enforcement efforts by state and local law enforcement agencies to combat drunk driving and distracted driving as well as other dangerous driving behaviors. Over the past two years, DMV has been involved in an agency-wide customer service initiative, which consisted of 10 separate projects that added new technologies, upgraded equipment, and instituted best practices in customer service in our call center and 27 state-operated DMV offices. One of the principal goals of the customer service initiative was to decrease average office wait times from 60 minutes in 2013 to 30 minutes. I am pleased to report that we were successful in doing so, and that in 2014, the average office wait time in state-operated DMV offices was reduced to 25 minutes. Several of the projects in the customer service initiative were designed to meet the requests of our customers that we offer more online transactions and become more efficient in our offices. 
Here are some examples of the projects that we have now successfully implemented. A new modern, dynamic, and easy to use website that is also optimized for use on mobile devices, including smartphones and tablets. DMV's website now receives more than 28 million site visits per year and 5.5 million transactions, a 10% increase over its prior usage. 20, 25 self-service kiosks in 19 of our state-operated DMV offices enable customers to perform many transactions that previously could only be conducted by a DMV employee. Customers are now performing more than 2,000 transactions per day at kiosks located in state DMV offices. A new office queuing system that includes an option for customers to make online reservations for a day and time that is convenient for them. Our reservation system has proven very popular with more than 350,000 reservations made since April 2014. A new call center technology to improve services to our phone customers. This new solution routes calls more efficiently, enabling us to answer nearly 4.5 million calls annually and reduce on-hold wait times. A callback option allows customers to leave a name and number and receive a callback to avoid waiting on hold. Improved internal processing of other operations, including applications for new auto dealers, inspection station or repair shop licenses, and applying for a title or driver permit. On average, as a result of these projects, we were able to reduce our processing time by 53%. In total, these projects have also helped us move closer to achieving another long-term goal, with 50% of our customers using self-service alternatives, including the web, mail, and kiosks to perform their transaction. This budget will allow DMV to continue to build upon the innovations and efficiencies achieved over the past four years. Once again, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. I welcome any questions you might have about DMV and our plans for serving the people of New York. Thank you very much, Assemblyman Dan. I'm not familiar if you could tell me more. You're not familiar with it? Well, they are. They send a ton of information. They send a ton of information to my office concerning hearing impaired people receiving commercial driver's license. You have no information I'm, around I'm, that? I'm not familiar with that correspondence, but I will be glad to look at it and get back to you. Well, we'll make sure Anthony Orfe from my office will get you that information, and you can get us an answer for it because I'd like to have an answer, or you, at least your thoughts on that. Yes, we okay. will certainly do Thank you that. very much. Yeah. Hold on, man. Senator. Thank you. Senator Marty Delon. Yes, Commissioner. Um, I've always been trying to figure out this issue between DMV and the bridge and highway trust fund. Every year it comes out that the trust fund is subsidizing DNB. Uh, I believe in this year's budget, we're talking about $200 million. However, I would like to know from you, uh, your agency is a revenue producing agency, I think to the tune of maybe $1.7 billion a year that goes towards the general fund. So can you explain the relationship between your agency and, and that trust fund? Yes, I'll be glad to, Senator. As I understand it, of the $1.7 billion in revenue that DMV will generate, $800 million of that will go to the dedicated highway bridge traffic fund. Uh, the general fund will receive approximately $211 million, and the remainder of that $1.7 billion goes to various other sources. Mm -hmm. I just bring this up because, you know, every year we have a debate in the Senate floor 
where the bridge fund is funding your agency and I just got a little confused considering that your agency is a revenue producing agency and I just wanted to clarify that for the record. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. McDonough. How are you and welcome, welcome today. Thank you for being here. A little different question. DMV still provides the motor voter registration service? That's correct, sir. And what does, a, what does an applicant, <clears throat> excuse me, what does an applicant have to show at that point? I mean, to get a driver's license is one thing, but in order to register to vote through DMV, what does that person have to show DMV? It is, it is a part of the application for a license. It is also part of the application when you renew your license that you can check off if you are interested in registering That's right. to vote. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, I've seen that and it says, are you a citizen of the United States? And you say yes, but there's no proof that that person is a citizen. There's no passport, as I understand it, or birth certificate or anything like that. So once somebody goes to get a driver's license and they say, I am a citizen of the United States on that form, then they say, okay, you can register, or they will register you to vote. Am I correct? Yes, when, they're, when they are coming to get an original license, I'm confused by your question, sir. Well, when they come to get a license, they come to get a license and they show, I think, a social security card or something like that, right? Yes, uh, they what have I'm to saying, show I don't six think, points of identification. I don't think that. anybody shows actual proof of United States citizenship. Did we ever do it I will show proof through their birth certificate, which is also required at the time that they apply for a license. They have to prove that as well. Oh, I, I wasn't aware. The birth certificate is required? Yes. Okay. So that would be checking also to see where they were born if they are a citizen too? Correct. Okay. Then I might be misinformed. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Senator. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator. Now, you talked about your improvements in your technology and your modernization, um, but we occasionally hear complaints about the customer service hotline having particularly long wait times for customers. Do you evaluate that? Do you have any data you can share with us? We do, and, and Senator, that was one reason we were very anxious to uh, put in our new call center technology uh, to replace the old switching operations that we had because we had no way to know how many people were getting frozen out of calling in or being left on hold. And now as we implement this, this new system, it gives us the ability not only to handle more calls, as I mentioned, but it will also give us the ability to monitor the wait times more accurately. And it also provides people with the option, if they don't want to remain on hold, you can simply leave us your name and your telephone number, and it's programmed that it will call you back immediately as soon as one of our operators is available, and then you can complete your call that way. And that whole system is now up and running? Yes, it is. So have you been able to track whether you've seen improvements from the beginning of the exercise through today? We are seeing improvements. Uh, the, the total system went into effect in December, so we're still gathering some of the metrics on that at this point, but our initial results show that our wait times are dropping closer to our goal. So far, much better downstate than upstate, but we're hoping to improve both as the months proceed. And that's for the phone system. Are you also <coughs> improving access uh, via the internet for people to be able to do certain transactions via internet rather than having to come into offices or through the mail? Yes, we, we are continuing to expand our, our use of the internet for transactions as we are able to, and that is one other reason that we've also installed the kiosks in our offices because many of the internet transactions can be performed on a kiosk and for those individuals that don't have ready access to a computer, they can come into a DMV office and instead of waiting in line for one of our motor vehicle representatives, they can quickly go to a kiosk, complete their transaction and leave. You project 46 um, more, we're losing 46 more full-time positions this year, I think, in the budget. So those 
positions are no longer needed because why? Primarily through or as a result of the new technologies that we've been able to implement over the last four years and, of course, the other projects that we have performed internally to become more efficient and innovative in how we handle things. So as, as employees uh, leave the agency, we, we can uh, continue to offer the same level of service because the technology allows us to. So these are attrition, you're not replacing people as opposed to laying off? No, we are not <laughs> laying off anyone. This is solely through attrition. And so these 46, um, excuse me, this loss of 46 jobs are in the more the direct service arena of DMV rather, the, rather than the management of DMV? Well, through attrition, we can't necessarily dictate where that will occur. Uh, but by and large, most of the technology improvements have taken place in our offices operations. So in that area, we are able to handle more attritions and then we can allocate the employees that we have to the offices that need them more effectively as we monitor things such as office wait times. I'm embarrassed because it could be a year, it could be three years, my brain doesn't keep track. The DMV had started a pilot of some um, longer hours on weekdays to allow working people to be able to get to the DMV after work. How has that program gone and how many places do you have that now? Well, we have continued, we have continued the expanded office program in three offices uh, since the pilot uh, ended. And we, those offices are open from eight in the morning till six o'clock at night. And what we uh, have done is to continue that because customers found that very convenient, especially between the hours of four and six when we otherwise would have been closed. If it's been successful, why don't you do it in more than just three offices? Then it comes down to managing our budget and what we're able to, able to do. Um, and what we tried to select were offices located in each of the localities, for example, in Yonkers, um, in Massapequa, as the other, so that we're hitting areas outside the city of New York as well, so that people have a location they can go to if they want to go to an office after hours. And the volumes of customers have, have been at a comfortable level that we don't see an indication that there is a huge pent-up demand that we expand that to additional offices at this time. So where's the third? You said Yonkers, Massapequa. In, in our Midtown office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner, and good afternoon. Uh, my first question is, uh, has to do with, uh, as, uh, with the Lawrence Law, you know, the organ donor uh, law. And uh, my question is very uh, simple. It's about how uh, that law has been implemented and how also has been promoted to make sure that people know that they have the option to register uh, to, uh, to donate their organs. Well, like the voter registration that I mentioned earlier on the original license application as well as the license renewal application, there is also the checkoff area for someone if they wish to be an organ donor. And as a result of Lauren's law, that was expanded to specifically ask them if they wish to do so. Um, and it's my understanding through statistics provided to us by the Department of Health that 90% of people who do sign up to be organ donors, 90% do so through a DMV. So we feel that we have a very large role in helping to promote that and, and we do the best that we can within our offices to do so. And we partner with our county clerks uh, who operate DMV offices in 51 counties uh, that they similarly do what they can to help promote organ donation when people come into their offices. 
Do you also uh, partner with the uh, legislators, like for example, if you have information that we can have in our office to promote it as well? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't do hear you, your question. Do you also uh, promote? Uh, do you <coughs> also have a partnership with the legislature, uh, the members of the legislature, where we can get information from your office to make sure that may be able to be on our website, <coughs> or we can have information. And also, uh, my question go about uh, what in what language do you have the information available about organ donor? It's just in English or is, is My understanding is we have it in both English and Spanish and we would be glad to provide you with the documents that we use in our offices so that you can also help promote this. Thank you very much. And my second question and my last question is, as, uh, as you probably know, it's been a, it's a trend uh, throughout the country and different states are beginning to pass uh, uh, to allow, to allow uh, non-citizens to have uh, driver licensing. Uh, do the Department of uh, Motor Vehicle, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, prepared or to, uh, it's moving to be prepared in order to issue this kind of licensing for non-citizens? Uh, licenses for undocumented immigrants is not a part of the governor's budget proposal. We are aware that in the legislature there are proposals and we are certainly willing to sit down and discuss those at the appropriate time. Thank you very much, Commissioner. But he was leaving. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Uh, I just wanted, I have no questions. Your testimony was fine. I just want to tell you, you're going to have a, you're a, a tough act to follow. Uh, Barbara did wonderful work over at the DMV. All the innovations, all the customer service capabilities, the efficiencies. Uh, we have virtually no uh, calls to the office about complaints about the DMV, which was the opposite before her term. She, she did a wonderful job with the, uh, with the uh, customer in, in, in mind, and uh, um, I'm sure you'll do just as well. I'm waiting for your first innovation. Thank you, Senator. She provided great leadership to our agency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Assemblyman McDonald. Give me Don Donna. Question. This is a, not a budgetary question or something, but it's something I advertise through my media communications. How successful do you find the media, the uh, organ donor program going with the driver's license registration? You know, you can check there each time you renew. Do you know offhand? Well, what we hear from the organ donation uh, groups is that it has proven to be very successful and, and uh, they assist us in ways uh, to help promote it and market it. Okay. So far, it's working very well. Okay, thank you. Oh. Any further? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thomas Prendergast, Chairman and CEO, Metropolitan Transportation Authority. That's the 1130. We're catching up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sirs. Okay. Senator DeFrancisco, Assemblyman Farrell, and members of the Senate and Assembly, good afternoon. Thank you for holding this hearing and inviting me to discuss the MTA's finances. Last week, as you know, Governor Cuomo released the state's 2015 to 16 executive budget, and we're pleased to see that once again we'll see increased state aid. Total funding to the MTA increased by almost $141 million over the state's 2014 to 15 enacted budget. This increase includes an almost $37 million boost to our operating budget and more than $104 million being transferred to the MTA capital program. 
It also provides more than $1 billion in new funding for the 2015 through 19 capital program. In addition, the MTA's 2015 budget and financial plan, approved by our board last month, prevents a fully transparent view of our current and four-year financial outlook. It strongly reaffirms our organization-wide commitment to cost-cutting, and it shows that we've already cut more than a billion dollars out of our annual operating budget. But we're not finished. And I want to tell you that some of the ways the MTA can become more efficient and better managed than ever before in 2014. By incorporating modern strategies for office space, we were able to move our entire headquarters into, to 2 Broadway in Lower Manhattan. Through this move, we will monetize our former headquarters at 341, 345, 345 Madison Avenue, generating hundreds of millions of dollars for our capital program. We issued $479 million of refunding bonds and completed associated restructuring of existing escrows for a total savings of approximately $110 million. And we successfully concluded labor settlements with most of our represented workforce. Thus, to our cost-cutting efforts, we were able to fund these settlements without additional fare and toll increases or service reductions. New savings initiatives are being identified in the areas of prompt payment discounts, workers' compensation, energy management, consolidations, purchasing inventory, and employee benefits. These initiatives are increasing our total savings target to $1.6 billion a year by 2018. And the savings we've realized have improved our operations in three critically important ways. These are the most aggressive cost-cutting uh, activities in MTA's history. Firstly, without these savings, we would not have been able to reduce projected fare and toll increases from the about 7.5 percent every other year to about 2, 4 percent every other year, or roughly 2 percent per year. Second, these savings have allowed us to add 157 million back into service and service quality enhancements since 2012. And third, they helped us put $290 million a year into a pay-as-you-go account beginning this year that could generate up to $5.4 billion for the 2015 through 19 capital program. That's a lot of money, but we're still well short of our extensive capital needs. Before I discuss that, though, I want to tell you about a few important cost-saving and efficiency initiatives. One I'm particularly proud of working with is the undertaking with our partners in the construction industry to not only reduce costs, but to make it easier to do business with the MTA, because that we know that lower costs will be passed on to us and to the public at large. Asset management is another area we're tackling head-on. Through a system we call enterprise asset management, we will better understand the value and useful life of our assets and get as much of that useful life out of them. And for a system that has a combined value of almost $1 trillion in assets, better asset management has the potential to quietly revolutionize the way we do business, saving us hundreds of millions of dollars and making sure that we can pass off these in terms of better processes, technologies, and training. These savings can then be put right back into our system through strategic initiatives and the MTA's indispensable capital program. This program, as you all know, is a series of five-year investments through which we regularly maintain and improve our entire network. It began in 1982, and today, more than 30 years and $100 billion later, the capital program has given our nearly 9 million daily customers a system they can depend on while delivering real value to the millions more. This program revitalized our transit system in our region enabling improvements that have brought customers back to our system in droves. Today's ridership is at all-time highs. Before October 2013, we had never recorded 6 million daily subway riders on the system. Last year, we exceeded that number five times in September, seven times in October, nine times in December. And in October 2014, total monthly subway ridership has been the highest it's been in the history of the entire system. Metro North's ridership of more than 83 million has almost doubled since its founding in 1983. And the Long Island Railroad's ridership of another 83 million as well make them the two most heavily traveled commuter railroads in the nation. We're looking closely at where our ridership growth is coming from. Until recently, it was mostly from reverse commutes, travel between service, uh, suburban destinations, and off-peak hours, evenings, and weekends. Today, we're seeing ridership growth in, all, growth in all of those areas, as well as during peak hours. We're seeing more and more times that customers have to wait for two, three, and four trains before they can get on a train to get to their destination. This means our network is almost stretched to capacity, trains are more crowded than ever, and commutes are more difficult. A minor delay on one train in a rush hour can have a massive ripple effect, leading to overcrowding on the platform, doors being held open at every station, and ever-increasing delays for the trains that follow. If that happens on a regular basis, the impact would be severe for millions of riders, their employees, and our region's economy. These ridership trends show no signs of abating in the foreseeable future. 
And with the future in mind, Governor Cuomo asked that I convene a panel of experts to inform the development of our next capital program, especially with respect to two important areas, one with respect to global climate change and the other with changing demographics. The Transportation Reinvention Commission stated in the very simple terms, truths in their report, more than two million additional people are expected to live in the MTA region by 2040, a million in New York City and a million outside of New York City in the region. The MTA needs to adapt to fundamental demographic shifts that need to new and evolving expectations, service needs, and accessibility requirements for those who use a system who are somewhat disabled. The current system is simply not fully equipped to meet any of these changing needs. Additionally, the Urban Land Institute and the Permanent Citizen Advisory Committee to the MTA are working on another report that examines the intrinsic connection between a healthy transit system and a healthy, vibrant economy. Early drafts of their efforts included the fact that since 1982, the MTA capital program has transformed the region's public transportation system into a crucial economic asset, helping New York achieve global economic preeminence that few could have imagined during the economic crisis of the 70s. Investments in the MTA have generated economic benefits for communities across all of New York State, with major vendors opening plants to both fulfill the transportation needs locally and across North America. Indeed, capital program investments create hundreds of thousands of jobs throughout New York State. According to the New York Building Congress, the MTA alone accounts for 25 percent of New York City's construction industry in some years. But the program impact reaches far beyond downstate. It is a profound effect of economic development in every corner of the Empire State. Capital program investments are powerful job creators, but they can't create jobs, can't power our economy, can't keep New York globally competitive, and can't keep our transit system safe and reliable if we don't make them. This past fall, the MTA submitted a capital program to address our extensive needs. The plan was vetoed without prejudice by the Capital Plan Review Board. One concern shared by all parties is funding. We have identified half of the money needed to fund this plan, and discussions on this top or critical, uh, topic are critical and we need to bring all parties to the table. Those are our federal, state, and local partners, as well as stakeholders who benefit from the system. All have a stake in ensuring that the New York's economic engine continues at first full strength. The state of New York has one economy, and the MTA's 12-county regional transportation system is one we must never take for granted. We move ne nearly 9 million people a day, enabling a $1.4 trillion economy, second only in the world to Tokyo. Our network's expansiveness gives people options, makes a huge pool of employees available to New York businesses. It allows our region to comfortably, comfortably accommodate millions more people. It makes it possible for people to live wherever they want within our region, regardless of where they work. It allows employees to bring home paychecks that support local schools and other services, creating jobs wherever they live. It enables and supports job development across our entire region, giving employees a system that their own employees can count on. Every major world city, London, Paris, Hong Kong, and others, are making significant investments in transit to improve the quality of life for their residents and to maintain their status as a global financial and business center. New York needs to do the same because the past is not prologue. We must continue to invest. invest. Chairman DeFrancisco and Farrell, we appreciate the support you've given the MTA in the past and your continuing support, and we look forward to working with you regarding funding for our capital program. It's that important to us and that important to you as representatives of the great state of New York. Thank you for taking your time to hear from me today, and now I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. To begin with, Assemblyman Ortiz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm here, Chairman. Right here. <laughs> okay. So, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, being here uh, with us. And first of all, I would like to really thank uh, your team uh, you know, for uh, the work that you guys have done on, on uh, reconstructing a ninth street and a ninth avenue and street and a, a Smith Street, as well as uh, the partial restoration of B37. Uh, that's uh, I represent the areas of Red Hook, Sunset Park, uh, Peace of Bay Ridge, and, and Paslo and, and Caro Garden. So, as a result of the partial restoration, you know, I'm going to be asking you that we hope that we can get a full restoration for B37. And as well as, uh, you know, you mentioned something very interesting within your speech about um, job creation, business developments, and in areas. So we do have an area that is booming very, very quick, and it's called Red Hook in Brooklyn. Uh, this area really has only two buses that go through Red Hook. It's a B67, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and also a B, 
61 and B57. And, uh, and we, need, uh, we need to make sure that uh, while the governor is talking about enhancement and a more development, a more uh, extension about the trains and, uh, and, and more mobility, that we would not forget the people of Red Hook. Especially that community is moving very fast. Uh, we do need more transportation and transportation that can, that can be more reliable. We need people to make sure that they can move from the back of Red Hook, what they call, through to Smith Street and at night. Uh, uh, if we can have at least some kind of, uh, of, uh, of transportation that is uh, express for the people on that particular site where they can stop in one area and go directly and keep the other two sites, the other two buses running, that will be very helpful for the people of Red Hook because right now we have a lot of people that are I've been on 9th Street and Smith, and I've been standing right there, and I can see how many people not only go and have to walk all the way to the back to work, but also I see how many people are coming out of Red Hood to work in the city. So if some consideration to that can be taken, I will appreciate. The, the other thing I would like to add is uh, Carroll Garden, uh, Union Avenue, uh, Union Street, and, and in, Carroll, in Carroll Garden. We do let we do we did uh, uh, cut the uh, the B seventy seventy five. That B seventy five used to go from New York City Tech all the way to Red Hook. That was a very good road to take because the people in Carroll Garden will go to Fairway. So now they don't have access to Fairway. And we have a lot of seniors. Uh, I will tell you that I knocked a lot of doors this summer, uh, and I saw a, it's a lot of seniors that was requesting more than middle class, that, that middle aged people that this bus get restored. So it's something to that extent can be taken into consideration also, I would appreciate. And the um, B75, 70, 77, that was Fifth Avenue all the way to Red Hook, that cross section, which is so helpful for the people that had to go to Methody Hospital. So, you know, this kind of, uh, of accessibility is very critical for not just for the fo folks on Red Hook, but Carroll Garden, Paslo, as well as hopefully the extension uh, to Atlantic Avenue for uh, B, uh, uh, B37 uh, for the people of, that, of, of Bay Ridge. So if any of these items can be taken into consideration, uh, we will really appreciate as uh, we continue to have a budget negotiation and we continue to expand and enhance from JFK LaGuardia down to the city. Uh, you know, this is, uh, we're talking about economics, we're talking about impact, we're talking about job creation, and we're talking about mobility of children going to a school. So this is a community that I hope can be taken into consideration to be looked at it very close, that they can have the, me the means and the medium of transportation that they need in order to commute. Thank you. We, we will do that. Uh, I can tell you that uh, after we came out of the dire situation we were in in 2009, 2010, where we cut a lot of service and we started to, to come back financially, we've looked at every point at the half point in the year with respect to how are we looking from a budget standpoint and where can we either add back service that we cut or more importantly in some cases add new service. With the changing demographics in New York City it's essential we do that. If we're going to see a million more people in the city we need to work closely with the city in terms of where that commercial and where the residential development will occur so that we can have a transportation service that can service that community and hopefully do it in a coordinated way so that we don't have to build a lot of new facilities. But certainly Red Hook and a lot of the areas along the water uh, in Brooklyn and in Queens are areas that are focus areas for us, and we'll make sure we do that. And I'm looking forward to continue working with you. You have a great team and you've been very helpful to me and my office, so I hope that we can continue to keep that together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you. Senator. Uh, Senator DeLon. Good afternoon. Your microphone is not. Is it on now? No. No. Hello? There you go. There you go. got it. I said I was not going to ask you as to why you shut down the subways. That's the subject of another hearing. But um, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, capital, your capital plan, which was rejected by the Capital Review Board and the 15 plus billion dollar gap there. But I also want to know as to the sweeps, the first $20 million, $30 billion, uh, 
30 million last year, and I believe another 20 million this year, and what impact that would have on your bonding authority in, in the future. In terms of the sweeps and the detail level, I can't answer it. My chief financial officer, maybe, maybe he can, but we have seen an increased level of funding each year based upon what we expected to get from the state. Mm -hmm. And by and large, we have not had any issues with respect to our ability to use the funding that we have to be able to get done what we need to get done. Mm -hmm. The capital program is a separate story, but in terms of the annual appropriations and the money we get from the state and from the executive budget, we've been able to work within those. Mm -hmm. Now, in, I believe in the capital or it, in the proposed budget, there is uh, money for pen access, I believe $750 million, and that, I believe, goes along with the east side access, and east side access is not uh, believed to be uh, completed till 2023. So why is there a need to put the $750 million in the five-year capital plan this time around if it's not within range? The proposal for Penn Access for Metro North would involve creating four stations in the Southeast Bronx that do not exist now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an area of the city that uh, there have been promises made for decades with respect to an extension off the Second Avenue subway that has yet to have been built. Uh, and the process of environmental review, design, and construction are such that, you know, 2023 is eight years away. Uh, that's about a general time frame to be able to get there. So from a so stand, from a standpoint- So my whole point is, why do we need to put $750 million into a five-year plan now when we don't have to? Because if it's eight years, it would be, if we rolled it over into the next plan, we wouldn't be able to have it ready at the time Eastside Access would enable the new slots So we'll just have the open. money sitting there? For five, we'll have the money sitting there for five years for no, no reason? No, we, we would be doing going past environmental review, doing design, and, and doing construction. So, uh, you know, those monies would be expended probably in the latter parts of the five-year program, but to be ready to have them done so that when uh, the east side access gets done and those slots at Penn Station get open, we can prov provide that service. Thank you. Senator. Assemblyman Brennan. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Uh, welcome, Mr. Prendergast. Uh, the MTA uh, is one of the most extraordinary transit operations in the world, I'm sure, and uh, the uh, economic vitality and of the downstate metropolitan area, which appears to be increasing, you know, is directly linked to the ability of the transit system to move millions and millions of people around. So that agency is pretty important. And uh, let, let's get into the capital plan. Uh, and I know that many issues associated with the operating budget intertwine with ultimately how much money is available to the capital plan and vice versa. You know, but uh, so when you submitted the $32 billion proposal in October, you had identified $17 billion uh, where you had identified funds of that amount available to cover that part of the $32 billion with a leaving a $15 billion shortfall. Is that correct? It's about, yeah, that's correct. And uh, so the plan was vetoed. Uh, the governor called it bloated, but I, I would assume that when you made a decision that $32 billion was the amount or the cost of the assets that, that the agency needed to continue delivering uh, adequate service and complete the expansion projects, you were not deliberately inflating those costs, correct? No, All we're right. not. So you didn't view it that way. Uh, so the governor's provided a uh, billion dollars in this budget to get you one billion towards the $15 billion shortfall that, that 
the MTA had identified in October. Um, have you I identified additional efficiencies in acquiring these assets such that you could, you think you could acquire these assets for 31 or 30 billion dollars or anything to that effect? In my testimony, I referred to an enterprise asset management system. Uh, large organizations, I would compare ourselves, especially on the rail side of the organization, to class one railroads, where they don't go to some other party to get money for their capital program, they generate their own money. So from their standpoint, they're incentivized to make sure that they're getting as much useful life out of the assets that they have. If you have cars usually go 35, 40 years, if you'd retire that car and replace it, as much as people would like it, you may have higher reliability, but it still has three or four years of useful life, and one could say that you're wasting an asset and you're having to spend money. So the idea with enterprise asset management is after 30 years of having a capital program where we're trying to determine how much useful life is left, start to apply the science of that technology and that, that, that application to our system. So in answer to your question, yes, and we're much better than we were five capital programs ago, but when you start coming to the legislature and you start coming to the executive and you start talking about $30 billion, I was born and raised in Illinois and my senator was Dirksen. You remember the phrase, a billion here, a billion there, sooner or later, sooner talking later, real, get money. Me real money. Yes. So we have an obligation to make sure that we're squeezing as much useful life out of the asset without crossing the line of affecting safety and reliability. So you're, so, you're, so you're taking a look at the life cycle of yes. uh, the system, the various, the subway yes. and rail and so on, and seeing if there's any potential savings there. That's correct. Okay. Um, there, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, real estate value capture as a potential source of funding, meaning that, uh, so for instance, uh, the Hudson Yards Infrastructure Corporation uh, issued bonds based on prospective uh, uh, real estate development uh, in the far west side of Manhattan. Uh, and. Um, or there's, uh, and I'm not, or there's this East Midtown zoning proposal where possibly many new large residential or commercial buildings or, or even just general growth in real estate value. Do you have a proposal uh, or is the MTA working on a proposal, perhaps in consultation with the City of New York and the Governor's Office to uh, enable us to review uh, something that could provide additional funding for the MTA? We certainly have uh, a proven end, a way of doing that that was 7 West, and that's how it was funded for the extension of the number 7 line. The Transportation and Reinvention Commission, which were 24 international experts, both from the United States but around the world, looked to see what other funding sources were available for these types of transportation systems, and under the heading of value capture, where an investment uh, is being made in a transit system that will increase the value of real estate around that asset, sharing in some of that uptake. So, you know, certainly the Transportation Reinvention <coughs> Commission uh, identified it as one of the areas to look at because it's not just one that we think could bear fruit here, it's been proven other places. And there was a focus from a standpoint of that's one of the areas that we would have a dialogue started if we needed to look for new funding sources. All right. Um now, one thing that, that I would like to ask the agency to do to help us, uh, help you uh, in these next couple of months is, so, so I know that in this 17 billion, you are proposing to borrow some additional money backed by the fare, backed by your revenues. Uh, and that may lead you to reach the cap, your existing bonding cap. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And so um, I know that the legislature would have to increase the bonding cap if you were to borrow more, at least down the road. But could you provide an analysis to us of what it would mean for the fare and for the system yes. uh, if you were to 
borrow certain sums of money uh, beyond what you're pr currently proposing? Because, th and the reason I'm asking for it is because when, when it becomes clear that you, ha that even, that you borrowing even more money, uh, the impact on the fare becomes ever greater, so that instead of 4% every two years increase in the fare, which is the current model, which is certainly better than 7.5% every two years, uh, if we see, well, if you have to borrow more money than you're currently planning to do, we're going to have to go back to 7.5% or 10% every two years or, or some other problem like that that's going to make mass transit very difficult to afford for the ordinary person you know, it, it gives us more information about uh, the necessity of finding additional sources of funds for you. We can do that. I do think one of the things that, that needs to be part of the dialogue is the size of the ask. The MTA board has approved a plan at that size. Uh, I think if we're coming to you and you have questions, is do you really need that much money? We have to start the dialogue. Do we really need that much money? Okay, we believe we do. That's why the board approved it. But that provides the frame discussion in terms of what that gap is and how you need to find ways to fill that gap. Um, so we can do that. We can give you that information. But I think in a vacuum without that other dialogue going on in terms of what's the size of the ask, yes, because you've got competing priorities, I assume, across your entire spectrum, uh, there's got to be some dialogue at that, at that level. You know, I, because we firmly believe that from terms of renew, enhance, and expand, that's the size of the ask. But we need to get concurrence before we get into detailed discussion on what that gap is. All right. So, uh, so going back to the operating budget for just a sec, uh, the your operating aid uh, increases by a minimal amount in the in the budget. Uh, it was nine million enacted budget to enacted budget, and you said thirty-seven million, which is related to your forecasts and so on. Uh, and then the other hundred and some million dollars uh, is now to go to capital, uh, meaning uh, a very tiny operating aid increase. Um, how does the MTA view uh, that those sources? Does this put a crimp in your continued uh, capacities to fund your operations and the capital plan? Or do you think this is manageable? It's manageable. The primary pressure right now is the capital program. Okay. Let me ask you this. Do you think that uh, when you look at all of the options out there uh, in relation to currently available state funding uh, and uh, your revenues that a new revenue source, whether we call it a tax or not, is essential to uh, enable the MTA to, continue, to move forward? In my testimony, I referred to three areas that we have to go to talk to, three plus one. It's our federal partners, it's our state partners, it's our city partners. Um, for a whole host of reasons, on a prorated basis, we're never going to get the exact amount of money that we think we should get from the federal government. That's part of another process. Uh, and the dialogue and the pressure needs to be on all of those fronts, as well as other stakeholders, real estate development. Uh, because they all share in a healthy MTA network, and they all need to be able to Jim. take part in being able to fund it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Senator Kruger. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Commissioner. You're not leaving, right? I'm not what? You're not leaving your job. Unless you know something, I don't know. No, no, no. You, you, you promised you weren't no, no, leaving no, no, when no, we no. confirmed I, I you, but it. there's a rapid turnover. I, I just wanted it. to make sure. Make yeah. an offer. <laughs> I enjoy my job. You told us you were going to stay, so I'm glad to see that you are. Because we, we went through the top of MTA too quickly, um, too frequently. Second Avenue subway scheduled to complete on time December 2016, true? Yes. Phase two Second Avenue subway in your five-year capital plan? It's in the five-year plan. Uh, it's in the proposed five-year plan. Going north or south? North. What's the estimate of that cost? Um, I should know off the top of my head. $1.5 billion? 
1.5 billion. 1.5 billion. Yes. How many years estimated? Um, I, I don't know. Do you know? But what, what date? Five years for the first phase of phase two. Lexington Avenue timing upgrade so you can move more trains on the tracks? Where is that? I believe that's underway right now. Uh, those are signaling improvements. Uh, and then there's also proposals uh, with the Midtown East rezoning to make improvements at Grand Central that would benefit uh, dwell time at the station. So that would improve too, because right now the maximum load point is 42nd Street. Although in our lifetime it may become 14th Street because the city's changing and you know that. Uh, but those are high-level initiatives. That's the hev most heavily traveled line in the country. Uh, we actually schedule more trains than uh, you would normally schedule because of the volume of customers. So additional dwell time at stations in 10 and 15 second increments make all the difference in the world. So that's one of the highest priority areas for us to be able to uh, do things to improve the flow of trains. 500,000 people today use that line. You and I know that that's all my district, so I'm very yes. aware of these issues. Bus camera lanes, I've been having many, um, I think, very helpful meetings with New York City Transit on bus issues. Um, still desperate for faster bus service, more buses on our lines. Um, but the bus camera pilot was a hope that with the ability to give out tickets to those who were um, parking and double parking in your bus stops in the bus lanes, has there been any kind of evaluation and do you want to expand that? It was a focus on it a few years ago. Um, I honestly don't know the latest status on that. I'll okay. If you could get back to me with yes. that. Thank you. It's not in the governor's budget, it's a, but it's announced that the MTA and the Port Authority will do a train to the plane um, model, I guess monorail from Willits Point to LaGuardia with an estimated $450 million cost. Are you expected to pick up some or all of that cost, and if so, how much? Uh, at a speech that the governor gave to the Association of Better New York uh, last Tuesday, he talked about infrastructure improvements that needed to be made and the intrinsic relationship between those infrastructure, transportation infrastructure improvements and the need to support New York City and the economy. And there were a number of things that lined up with things in our capital program, communication-based train control, the replacing of the bus fleet. But the one you're talking about is a rail connection from one part or two parts of our network to LaGuardia. We do have a rail connection now from both Jamaica and Howard Beach to JFK. So the idea is to replicate functionally that connection. This is something that's been studied probably 30 years. Uh, there have been a number of different proposals. It's exceptionally environmentally sensitive. Some of the proposals, the one that we're looking at right now, is from the area of where the World's Fair is at Metz Willett Point, in between the Long Island Railroad Station there and the number seven line, and then go slightly west and up the median of the Grand Central Parkway and then access LaGuardia Airport. Not with a monorail, though. It would be more likely, the, the tech, more likely the technology that was used at AirTrain uh, in Jamaica. And that would connect with, the, it would be the seven line connecting into? Two. Two different, uh, the, the number seven line would connect there, as well as the Port Washington line on, the, on uh, the Long Island Railroad. So for the seven line, it's one of our older and narrower subway, subway lines. It's not particularly conducive to dragging your luggage on, on and off, at least in the Manhattan section. Do you have an estimate of how many people are actually going to use this new line if it's built? There, there are a number of different reasons why you build a connector to the airport. You build a connector to the airport for the employees that work there. You build a connector to the airport for the business travelers. You build a connector to the airport for other passengers. Uh, for the ones that are, that are the most successful, they try to attack the, not attack, they try to deal with the issue of the employees at the airport as well as the business travelers. Um, but, but certainly we would have to do studies with respect to you know, what market we're trying to get and what market we think we could attract. I will tell you that the air train expect, uh, expectations for Jamaica have been exceeded, but that's, that's a, different, it's a different model, a different issue. Uh, but that would be one of the issues that we would have to cover off to make sure that we're, we're building and designing to a budget that makes sense. How many miles would this line be? 
It's a Plus little over minus. a mile and a half. It's not that great a distance. It's relatively short. If you didn't have any highway impediments, I think uh, Senator Savino said you could almost walk it right from that distance. But, but, but you've got highway impediments and you've got all kinds right, of things. Right, right. I've actually never seen an MTA proposal for a new rail line that would only cost a half a billion dollars. I know to all of us here, a half a billion dollars is a lot of money. But in subway building, train building, that's actually not. Do you actually think that's a reasonable cost that's estimate? That's probably the low end of the range. I mean, the range of costs is probably from half a billion to a billion. Uh, I, w I worked at a system, SkyTrain, in Vancouver, uh, where the unit costs are lower for a variety of different reasons. Uh, but certainly one of the things I think we need to do is make sure we do the analysis you're talking about in terms of what market we were tra expecting to, to attract. And then uh, two things. It's a project that is ideally suited for design build, and there's some economies of scale there. It's also a project where you, you do what you call design to budget, and you try to put a constraint on, uh, not to affect safety and reliability, but put a constraint on so you don't over-design, and you, you get what you want functionally without paying more for it. You've moved out of the building on Madison Avenue. Is yes. that for sale? Yes, it's part of an RFP. 341, 345, 347 Madison. It's the half block between Vanderbilt and 44th and 45th facing Madison. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're looking at proposals to see what we can get in terms of maximum real estate value. And whatever we get out of that, we'll put into the capital program. My time is up. Maybe I'll come back to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Assemblyman Cusick. Uh, toll and fare increases. Uh, you had mentioned in your testimony it was 4% uh, uh, rather than 7%. Is that, did I hear that correct? Prior to, prior to this fare and toll increase, they were in the range of 7.5%. Uh, sometime last year, due to a variety of different factors, uh, concerned uh, legislators like yourself, uh, the governor's uh, commitment to a 2%, no more than a 2% increase in the state budget, and other factors, we, we made a decision that we were going to limit uh, fair and toll increases to the range of 2% okay. uh, you know, a year. Uh, and that was a major departure from the 7.5. Okay. Is there a plan to have any increases in the near future? If I'm not exactly sure when this happened, but it was part of the whole issue of the transparency of the MTA budget. We committed to have a four-year financial plan. That financial plan is first looked at it in November of a given year, then it is approved in December by the board, and then in July of the following year we take a look at it. So we look out projected uh, every four years. Uh, and the last, uh, we always have, you know, every two years uh, on, on the table, a fair and total increase depending upon what the finances uh, require. So there's a, there would be a possible increase in 2017 then? Yes. But we don't know any specifics on that, on how much? Uh, I think we're percentage. still committing to living within the 4%, but if we're doing better, it could be less than that. Okay, and, and with, with uh, fair and total increases, I think I brought this up before, are there any economic impact studies done uh, when the decision is made to make a, uh, to make a toll or fair increase? Uh, we have, we're acquired by statute to do a number of different things. Uh, we have to do what they call a dis disparate analysis in terms of impacts on different levels of the economic strata. Uh, we have to do some environmental reviews in terms of what impact toll increases have. They're different for tolls than they are for fare increases, right. but they're all driving toward the same thing in terms of what, what, what are the impacts on the economy and on the people. Uh, and those, those are analyses that are required for every fare and tolling. Are, th are those analyses made public? Like, I, I've we can, never, we I've can never make seen them public. There's nothing, we, there's nothing we don't have. That, so if you want them, we can give you those analyses. That'd be great. I, I'd, I'd like to see the latest. Sure. Um, also, on uh, the question I get a lot on Staten Island in my is, where does my toll money go? Um, is is there a is there a um, something you could tell me today or maybe your staff as to when someone pays the toll, uh, where that money then goes? Uh, you know, there's so many versions of where it goes. That money goes to pay for other MTA projects or, uh, but. I'd like to be able to uh, 
tell my constituents, you know, specifically where their money goes on this? We can do that. Uh, in a general sense, we have a number of different revenue streams, uh, petroleum business tax, payroll mobility tax, fair, uh, fair revenue, toll revenue. They all come in, uh, and then they're distributed out by the MTA. So um, what you might see is a dollar coming in from one source from one locale here, right. and then going out dispersed. Um, so in, in the case of bridge tolls, they're excess, what we used to be called TBTA revenues, and there is a, a formula that's established in terms of how that money gets distributed. It's a formula that's been around for decades. The first 24 million, I believe, goes to New York City Transit, and then the rest gets dispersed 50% 50, 50 between the commuter rails and, and New York City Transit. But we can, we can show you uh, all that. Okay, I'd like to follow up sure. on that. Uh, to, to change topics uh, for a second also, uh, the, the North Shore BRT, uh, could you give me an update on what's happening there or what's not happening there? The North Shore BRT, we've gone through the, uh, the processes of the initial environmental reviews. Preferred alternative that was selected was a busway. And preferred alternative doesn't mean preferred alternative by a vote. It's the formal process that the FDA right. requires us to go through. Um, and it did not make the list in terms of what was in the capital program. But a number of people, including one of our board members, have expressed concerns about that. And in, in, in former discussions on capital program, there's a discussion whether it should be in or not be in. Order of magnitude cost, I think, is a little less than a half a billion dollars. Staten Island has some unique challenges that we must address. It's probably the, it is the fastest growing part of New York City. Yep. Uh, when I lived there, I think it was a little over 300 or 350,000. It's approaching 500,000. Okay. So whether it's the busway or whether it's just even taking a look at how the, 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 uh, the bus system is laid out from a local express bus network, we need, to, we need to really take a, a good look at that because uh, it's going to be critical to Staten Island's further development. Right, and, and I know my colleagues uh, are pushing already for uh, the need for the BRT, and uh, I wanted to be on record on that. Uh, I also brought up with the state DOT commissioner earlier uh, the, the, West Shore, uh, the West Shore Rail, uh, which I know is not fully uh, MTA, uh, but I think in the long run we'll need a partnership uh, MTA, DOT, possibly Port Authority. Uh, and we realize that rail may not happen immediately, but in the meantime, what we'd like to do is to study that corridor uh, on the West Shore Expressway, that West Shore area. Uh, if it says that we cannot at this time go forward with light rail, some sort of BRT may also be fitting in, in that, that spot. So we're requesting uh, this budget uh, process uh, to have a study done. Uh, and we estimate the study would be about $5 million. And I would ask that the MTA work in partnership with, with the legislators and, and state DOT and see if, if we can get something done in this budget. I think that's been communicated to us already. Yep. Uh, I've had some very limited discussions with Pat Foy, the executive director of the yep. Port Authority because they would be, if the alignment would go over the Bayonne Bridge into, uh, into New Jersey, they may be the more likely lead agency than us. But we'll work with right. them in either case. Right, and, and I think we already have buses that go over to Bayonne. Yes, and we have so buses that's that go what, into New Jersey for sure. Right, right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Sabino. means. I don't have to reiterate all of the questions that he already asked you, because you've asked, or asked them. As you know, he and I are like minds on issues of tolls and uh, the Verrazano Bridge and BRT on the North Shore. Um, I also understand that my other colleague, Assemblyman uh, Ortiz, already addressed the issue of the B-37 bus, and let me just echo my support for his position on that. I want to ask you um, about something that happened just this week, and to kind of get your opinion. You know, I've lived in this city my entire life. A um, little more than a half a century now, just slightly over a half a century. In my entire life, I have never seen the New York City subway system shut down for weather, except for Hurricane Sandy. And so the question that I have for you is not just what went into the decision to shut down the Iron Horse, but what can our constituents expect in the future? As you pointed out in your testimony, there are parts of the city that are growing now in areas that we never anticipated. And some of those areas are already um, 
not served particularly well by the MTA because of historical investments. You know, so the communities I represent, not just Staten Island, but South Brooklyn, areas like Coney Island, it already takes 90 minutes to get home from Midtown Manhattan on the train. You shut down the subway to Coney Island, how do these people get home? You shut down the subway to, you know, Southeast Queens, how do, we pe how do people get home? And in the 111 years that the system was running, we never had to shut it down for snow before. And I can remember massive blizzards in the city of New York. I remember the blizzard of 78. I remember 96. I mean, I can tick them all off. I'm that old now. I can remember them. And never did we shut down the system. Shutting down service to certain areas makes sense. I get that. You know, you don't want to send trains out to the Rockaways in the middle of a blizzard. But the entire system, was it necessary? And what can our constituents expect from the next storm? Should they assume that they're going to stay at work or not go to work? What can we say to them? We, we have shut it down twice formally. Irene and Sandy, those are the two. Um, and Irene, it just, it, it, it actually hit further upstate New York. Uh, the decision to close the New York City subway system is not one that we take lightly. Um, we have been faced with a number of serious weather events in an ever-increasing amount. We have had cases where we have stranded trains. We had a stranded train after De on, on December 26, 2010, where three or 400 people were on a train for 12 hours. They boarded a train at Howard Beach, went a couple thousand feet, it stopped. The outside portions of our system are extremely exposed to bad weather events. We had a stranded train up at uh, Southeast on the, on, the, on the Metro North network and one at Windanch on the uh, Long Island Railroad network. And we had people either with medical conditions or women who were nursing and we were really anxious about the position we put them in. Once we put somebody on a train, we, we're responsible for them and we are accountable for making sure that they're safe and secure. Um, with respect to going back into long time history, uh, it's hard to know whether or not, it, whether the, the system was never formally shut down, um, with the exception of a couple blackouts, and they were totally stopped. Um, I remember that too. But, 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 <laughs> but uh, we need to move forward from a standpoint of where we stand today. The events of December 26, 2011 were very informative of us. I remember that night clearly. I was president of the Transit Authority. Carmen Bianco was the senior vice president. And inside of a minute, inside a period of about 45 minutes to an hour, the system was running well, and it all went south fast. 37 trains stranded, 400 buses stuck in New York City streets. And we went through a paradigm shift. Because not only did we expose people to dangerous conditions, when the snow stopped, you couldn't clear tracks, you couldn't plow streets until you got those vehicles removed. This particular storm was one in which we were faced with some very daunting challenges based upon the weather predictions. First, they set 18 to 24 inches of snow for New York City, then they upgraded it to 24 to 36. And they said rate of snowfall after 11 or 12 p.m. would be two to four inches per hour and wind gusts of over 50 miles an hour. That identifies a blizzard in snow terminology. That's where the potential for trains becoming stranded and trapped occur very fast. We knew we were going to go into what we call a plan four, where we lay up equipment undernight. And what that does is it, it, it fills up all the express tracks. It starts to limit our ability to move trains throughout the system. And then, if something were to happen outdoors, we need to move equipment from one borough to another. We need tracks to be cleared to do that. And we were looking at something that was going to come into the system around 11 o'clock. A lot of people were telling people, if you need to come into work Monday, come in early, go home early. Uh, we said we'll accommodate you for sure until 8 o'clock, and then we made a decision that you better go off the system by 11 o'clock. It was not a decision we took lightly. Uh, Long Island's still digging out today because the storm tracked further east, but they got the full 36 inches, and they're just now finishing up digging out. So we were presented with something that put us in a position where we did not want to take risks. Um, especially at that hour, and a lot of people were left. Now, there's always someone that will be stranded because if you get off work at 11.30 or, or 12 on a Monday night and the system is shut down, uh, that person can't get home. But to take them partway home and then strand them, that may even be worse than if they stay where they're at or they, or they can, we know for sure we can take them to, to their final destination. 
we're going to review this. We're going to take a look at it from the standpoint of is there anything we could have done better. Um, but that was the decision making well, process. Well, let me just say, I, I, don't, I don't dispute the information that you were all operating under. You know, we watch the news up here too. We were, you know, given, you know, apocalyptic, you know, declarations from the National Weather Service that, you know, we should all get good with God, that we were on our way out. So I don't doubt the information you were given. The only question I have is, this has happened before in the past, and it never you know, precipitated an, an entire system closure. And so I think what, what I'm really asking is, is this something that we should expect regularly going forward, that when you have you know, uh, reports of dangerous weather patterns, that this is going to be a new paradigm for the MTA, that you will shut the system down? It's a very good question, because we're asking ourselves that question. Uh, you take a look across the United States in terms of highways. I mean, for those of you that remember some of the bad snowstorms in 78 and I met, lived in the Midwest, people died on interstates because they didn't close interstates. And so if people are inconvenienced, and we really take that into consideration when we do that, that's far better, though, than, than talking about somebody dying in a vehicle or being stranded somewhere and having a problem. But it's a, I can tell you that we're going to evaluate because we take the issue of shutting the system down very seriously. Uh, and we, at a minimum, we need to try to improve the weather forecasting techniques, see what we can do to keep elements of the system operating, and give people as much advance notice as possible. Well, I think that would be the most important thing because you're, you're talking about re-socializing the way people think about transportation in New York City. There's one thing we always believe that we could count on is that the subway will run no matter what, unlike other systems that have a normal shutdown time. So if this is going to become the new normal in the MTA, I think it's going to be very difficult to translate that to the ridership who believes that the train runs no matter what. And they'll no, wind up being stranded right. somewhere. And you're absolutely right. And even the decision to close the streets, and there was a number of states. New Jersey tried to shut down earlier mm -hmm. than we did. Uh, Boston did, and they had to. Uh, the state of Connecticut had total closures. Uh, and so, and, and I honestly think those are the right decisions, but we shouldn't take them lightly. We should message them much better, and we have to constantly evaluate, is there a way we can do it better? Thank you. I'm out of time, but. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and welcome, Chairman. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, I was going to ask that question about shutting down, and I think that I would add to what you said, is that I think you, if it was an error, it was erred on the side of caution. Uh, the weather forecast was very, very bad. And, you know, I know in Nassau County, we didn't get what they had predicted. Suffolk, as you said, is still digging out. but. When you mentioned the fact that people being stranded on a train for hours and hours and hours, it's a tough call. But anyway, I had just two other things if I could ask you. East Side Access, what's the status of that? East Side Access is uh, scheduled to be completed in 2023. Uh, the construction contracts were in the last drove awarding the last construction of contracts. Uh, the major tunneling work is done and digging. It was really a mining project. We moved a lot of underground. Uh, you I, know, I've, I've been, been down out. there. I okay. went down there a couple and we're of now, years we're ago. We're now in the process of doing the shells, completing yeah. the shells, building out the stations, and the terminal underneath Grand Central. It's a city down there. Yes, it's <laughs> phenomenal. Amazing, right. Okay, so that's, you said 2020? 2023. 2023, okay. And the other thing about the Metro North and Long Island Railroad in Penn Station. Yes. About the amount of space that Long Island Railroad may lose when you start bringing in more Metro North. Well, right now, Long Island Railroad doesn't have a terminal. They, they've got terminals at Atlantic Avenue, uh, Long Island City, uh, for some diesel trains, but mostly Penn Station. And they have 37 slots into Penn Station. Uh, when Eastside Access gets built at Grand Central, I think they originally start with about 18 or 20 trains, but they'll ramp up to 24 trains per hour. Uh, they railroad. won't need Long Island Railroad, Long Island railroad right. to, 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 the, to, to their terminal at Grand Central. They won't need all 37 slots. So the initial proposal for Penn Station access from Metro North is eight slots. But it can't possibly happen until east side access is operational. Which will come first, Metro North or east side? No, no, east side access has to be completed first before Metro North goes oh, into Penn Station. Okay. We can't, right now, we've got 10 pounds of grain in a five pound bag. Uh, we can't be adding more trains to that, so because we're sharing that we're sharing those uh, 21 tracks at Penn Station with uh, New Jersey Transit and Amtrak. So the first thing that has to be done is Long Island Railroad starting to operate into Grand Central before we can even bring uh, Metro North trains into Penn Station. 
Is there going to be more revitalization of the Penn State Station there, location? There are proposals that are out there by a number of the real estate uh, developers that have interest in that area. Uh, and yes, there are, and especially in concert with Hudson Yards development. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kruger for another round. Thank you. So you're, we've been discussing what happens with new lines coming between Long Island to New York City, then up through the west to Metro North in the future. So I keep also, and I know it's not MTA directly, but it's all direct interrelated. So there's these two new tunnels that are going to be dug under New Jersey. I'm sorry, excuse me, between New Jersey and New York under the Hudson. How does that impact your system if they ever get done with, and with the governor of New Jersey? I don't know what that means. The largest transportation complex in our country is Penn Station. Uh, between Amtrak, New Jersey Transit, and Long Island Railroad, uh, the number of customers is by far, and train movements is by far the most. The original plans when the Pennsylvania Railroad built Penn Station, conquering Gotham, if you've read the book, were four tunnels under what they called the North River, Hudson River, four tunnels under the East River. For a whole host of reasons, they never built the other two tunnels. That's the choke point for the system. If they can build, not only do they need it for additional capacity reasons, but they're gonna have to take some of those tunnels out of service to do rehabilitation and repair. So under a project that has been referred to as Gateway, uh, there are a whole host of infrastructure improvements along the Northeast Corridor, but primarily the central piece are two new tunnels under the uh, Hudson River and provide additional uh, capacity at Penn Station or in that area in terms of traffic capacity. How are those different than the ARC tunnel that he rejected? They're different in the sense that they have different alignments and different issues, but functionally they're the same. <laughs> and so the MTA will have no responsibility for any of the costs of the tunnel but then those trains will come into Penn Station where everybody will interconnect with your system. Is if that you fair? take the Gateway project that I talked about in its entirety, there's some things we will have no interest in and no responsibility for. There's others that we will have some interest in and some responsibility for, um, especially when it comes to if we're going to now have two tenants there, our Long Island Railroad and Metro North. Uh, so we may have some investments, but not for anything that we're not getting utility from. However, the west of Hudson service for Metro North that comes down and it will want to access and they're going to have to build a loop in Secaucus to access the Northeast Corridor. Uh, if we want to provide a one seat ride for the west of Hudson customers and there's a, there's a lot of pressure to do that, uh, we would have to pay part of that cost. Then recently there was an, an announcement that was made and then pulled back that path trains between New York and New Jersey were going to stop certain times of the night. And I think they changed their mind and are not stopping them, but what kind of impact would that have had? Because every time I've ever taken the path train to New Jersey, I've just gotten on a subway on the New York City well, side. Well, on the New York City side, it would have meant that people uh, would have come to our element of the system. But crossing the Hudson, it would have impacted NJ Transit or Amtrak. But from what I understand, they, they withdrew that proposal. And you don't think that's coming back? I'm not sure where it's at. Okay. Several years ago, because of Sandy, it's not that long ago, feels longer, you got a large um, lump sum of money from the federal government to both fix things that went wrong and strengthen your system going forward. Where are you in the status of the various assignments? With the well, money was identified over $10 billion to deal with resiliency issues meant, and recovery issues. You meant billion, issues. right? Pardon me? You said million, but you meant billion. Billion, billion, I'm yeah. sorry, 10, okay. 10 to 13 billion. But we've got 1.7 billion committed and $453 million spent. Uh, but we've got another 2.7 billion to be committed by the end of this year. Any of these processes that you have to go through, and I'm not complaining about it, where, where you have to go through a process that's going to be audited, because there was a, a heavy level of audit oversight for this, uh, have been in place, but works well underway. The replacement of the Montague Street 2, for example, out of face replacement of the tunnel bench walls was, was done with that money. Uh, the uh, Cranberry Street tubes and the Rutgers Street tubes are underway right now. Then it'll be Clark and Jerolaman, and the last one will be, Monty, uh, will be uh, Canarsie. Um, 
and we're just, and we can't do all the work at one time anyway because we can't take that many tubes out of service. Mm -hmm. And we took Montague out for 14 months. Cranberry and Rutgers will be weekend closures to minimize impact on customers. And does those con those continuing projects do they intersect with the five-year plan that you submitted to us? Yes, I mean what we want to make sure is is that we're getting maximum value for not only the expenditures we're making, but the outages we need to take to do the work. So we don't want to do work one year for resiliency and come back two years for state of good repair and impact. So we're trying to align that work to get as much of it done as possible. Um, but in, 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 and in some cases, we're even adding to our own scope of work to deal with re resiliency. Within our own capital program, if we're going to do a state of good repair, and we know for a fact that the example I use is we call them submarine cables, but they're not like a submarine boat cable, a submarine cable that goes underwater. All of our under river tubes now will be specced with a submarine cable standard because we have every reason to believe at some point in time in the life of that tunnel it's going to be flooded. So we make those kind of things. But there's a high level of coordination between our own capital program work and the resiliency and the recovery work that we're doing. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Otis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Glad, glad to see you here. Um, Keep going. I am calling in, um, com uh, want to comment in relation to Metro North and especially the New Haven line, but all the lines. And, and this has now been going on the Metro North line for a couple of years where the level of service is so unsatisfactory that especially rush hour commuters, the morale is terrible because the, the, the consistency of service is such that so many trains do not have enough seats, so many trains are basically r late every single day during the rush hour. So on, on the seat issue, I'm just interested in, um, and you probably do not have this with you, but if we could get a comparison of the number of seats on the three different New Haven, uh, Metro North lines, the number of cars and seats that we have related to the number of uh, monthly ticket subscribers or what, what your estimates are. Because it's not true on the Harlem and Hudson lines from, from what I'm hearing from people in terms of the, over, the lack of capacity issues where it is a constant on the New Haven line. There also have been news reports that, that on the New Haven line there are cars that are available that aren't being used. I, that may or may not be true, but it's been in the press. So uh, if you could comment first, and then I have some other Metro North issues, but if you could comment first just on, sure. on the capacity issue and the number of seats on that New Haven line, because, uh, and I represent a lot of the New Haven line stations, so I hear about this often. and and. As I say, this has been going on for a couple of years. Couldn't we have fixed some of this by now is sort of the question that's out there. Um, Metro North went from the railroad that was best in class in the country to a different place. Uh, and, and the stark occurrences of a number of incidents in terms of derailments uh, and loss of life actually focused us to make sure that we get safety and reliability right before we have an overfocus on on-time performance. The line that was probably the most heavily affected and still is affected is the New Haven line. Um, as the performance of the system degraded and the on-time performance was dropping, a number of things happened. Uh, we're not going to force an on-time performance number until we, we're, we're sure of the safety and reliability issues, and you've heard that dialogue. But what will happen in terms of the selection of trains, as the running times take longer because they're slow speed orders and we're doing work, people will start to select to take earlier trains because they want to get to their destination at the same time. But if they can't get that on the train that they're normally riding, they'll move up an interval. So you have to constantly watch if there's changing ridership patterns. Um, what I'd like to do is, you know, I'll offer the services of uh, having come in and, or we'll come to your office and we'll, we'll lay out what's going on in terms of ridership, what's going on in terms of performance. Uh, and it can not only talk about ridership and on-time performance, but also talk about reliability of the new fleet that we've got in there. Uh, there's certainly a focus that Joe Gelletti, the president of the railroad, has is to get it back to where it was. There's no doubt about that, but not at the, spec at the expense of safety and reliability. Um, and it's, we're taking it a step at a time. And uh, we need to get it back to where it was. Well, in terms of, and I understand the dynamic in terms of safety and, and on time, and one of the things that was done 
The schedule has been uh, adjusted slightly in some circumstances to uh, allow, in a sense, more time for trains. But even with the adjusted schedule, we have a lot of trains that aren't making their marks even on an extended schedule. But let me stick with the, the capacity issue first. And I, I would assume that um, you have an ability to switch how many trains you have. Uh, you know, if, if you get a trend that more passengers are hitting an earlier train, you can make some adjustments. But is, do we have just a hardware capacity issue as well, where we just have um, that, we're, are we short on cars on the New Haven line compared to the number of riders as compared to the other two lines? No, I don't believe so, but I, I would defer the, the discussion, and I'll take it back, and we'll set up a meeting with you. With, there's an intrinsic relationship to the number of cars you run per, per train, per scheduled train, and the adherence to time schedule. Because the more you fall out of time schedule and people start jumping trains, you're getting higher loads on one train than another. So what you, what, you, what you really need to do from a good railroad performance standpoint is get the schedule right, adhere to the schedule. There's certainly enough cars in the fleet to handle the ridership we have. Uh, but there may be crowding on one train versus another train. Um, and it's just another example of when you lose that edge, it's hard to get it back. One of the things that has been brought up by uh, Metro North in, in past years is some of this problem is related to the uh, unwillingness of Connecticut to spend money either on track work or on equipment in past years, but you know what's the time frame to remedy that situation? Because you know we're just on a, an extended trend here that has to be addressed. So th these are the questions people are asking me, and the, the level of frustration is is high. And I just say, in my lifetime, the 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 New Haven line performance is is pretty much. Uh, as bad as it's ever been, and uh, what you said is true, it used to be the best line, probably one of the best lines in the country. So uh, what's the timeline to remedy some of these things? Timeline is to try to get back as soon as possible. That's the timeline. Uh, there are timelines associated with the track work that needs to get done. And while I will say that there, there are some impacts that, uh, that could affect the schedule with respect to projects that Connecticut needs to get done, We've got enough response. We've got enough issues that we need to control before I'll start laying the blame on them. Seriously. Then, lastly, in uh, there was another incident at Grand Central today, a derailment, and and we've had um, specifically in the Metro North system a, a lot of these, some of them uh, tragic loss of life situations. Uh, could you talk a little about how we're going to uh, end the the pattern of having these incidents because? pretty clean record up till the last couple of years, and it, it's sort of hard to explain, but what, what is being done to remedy that and, and deal with the safety issue beyond um, slowing the trains down a little, which is one of the things you're doing, but uh, there are equipment and infrastructure issues. I assume some of this is, is in the capital plan. That's correct. I mean, it's the basic bread and butter of state of good repair. You have to do track maintenance. You have to reinvest in the track maintenance uh, and, and the physical asset. It's cars, it's track, it's signals. Uh, and that's where it needs to go. And it's not rocket scientry. It's focusing on those issues. So my time, I think, is up. But I just say on the, I would like to get a car ridership capacity sure. comparison between the three uh, uh, Metro North lines and, and look forward to meeting with your folks on this stuff. Thank you. I think I'm last for the Senate. I only have, oh, oh, did you sign up here? I didn't know that. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thanks, Trump. Senator Montgomery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, how are you? Hello. Chairman Prendergast. I, I'm, there are a couple of things that I just wanted to raise with you. Uh, I'm looking at your, and I've been, I've been watching you, so uh, even though I wasn't here, I saw your uh, statement and I wanted to refer to a couple of the things that you sure. had said. Uh, one of them is <clears throat> looking at um, growth in the ridership you, yes. that you anticipate and that uh, new trends that you, you think you're going to have to uh, <clears throat> begin to deal with and certainly you know my, in parts of my district and by the way I want, just want to thank you for paying attention to some of the real critical areas in, uh, in uh, where I represent my part of Brooklyn. But in addition, there's been a huge influx, new people, 
with new needs and expectations in terms of uh, uh, transportation. So my question is, um, how do we um, get ourselves to the table to participate with you as you look at serving uh, the needs going forward of people? And um, you talked in your statement about the train service and how overcrowded, but we also, um, we, we, we really, I think, would like to see an increase in the bus transportation uh, access, uh, uh, specifically the bus rapid transit programs and so forth. So that those are the areas that we, we are looking forward to. And, and I, as I have said in the past, and I still continue to complain to you, those double buses, um, it just seems to be so crazy to have them running through uh, some parts of my district that are relatively small, narrow uh, uh, residential streets, brownstone neighborhoods, and so on. So, uh, but more consistent service, it seems to me, is better than having these long wait times between services, and then they come with a double bus that is really uh, not as functional. So I'm hopeful that we can talk to you uh, more specifically about our needs. And I don't know how that happens, how that works, and what you suggest, ways in which I could be helpful. Lois that. Tendler from our Government Affairs Group can reach out to you and we can have a dialogue. Yes. Uh, we are seeing changing demographics. Uh, more and more of the people that are entering the workforce and graduating school yes. are waiting longer to buy a car. Uh, they're becoming more dependent on transit. We can yes. show you pictures of our system that you would think would be in the afternoon. It's really 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they're equally dispersed in some cases in some neighborhoods between bus and, and, and subway. Yes. Uh, and we need to do as much as we can to be able to respond to that need. Um, especially if we're going to see another 200,000 housing units in the city, we need to make sure we coordinate well with the city in terms of where they go so that we don't have to build a brand new transportation system. Mm. We can just build upon the one that we have right now. Exactly, yes. And <clears throat> let me um, also thank you for restoring B37. Uh, very critical, but um, it only goes to the um, arena. So I'm just wondering, uh, what do we need to do to to get that bus back to being uh, transportation that links downtown with all the neighborhoods that it goes through? Because right now, it doesn't really quite do the job. I know they're still looking at it, and I, uh, I, I'll defer to uh, Carmen Bianco and New York City Transit, but it was very clear that while, it, while you and others were appreciative of, of the restoration to where it got, yes. uh, there's still uh, a need on the parts of people saying it needs to go back downtown. So we would appreciate your we'll look continuing to look at that. Sure. Thank you. Assemblyman Abenanti. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, sure. for joining us today. Um, I, think it's, I think there was a second derailment today. I was just trying to find it in the Bronx or something. One of the work trains also went off the tracks. Uh, Am I correct about Metro that? Metro North, it was uh, White Plains. It was in White, White Plains. Plains. It was one wheel, yeah. OK, so that's not good for No. We got through good. the storm, and then, not good. And then yeah. we're having, OK. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Metro North. Um, sure. I've been using the term community-friendly planning um, and I'm a little concerned that uh, the communities along Metro North are not as in as much contact with your office as we could have. I know you were kind enough to meet with the assembly members and the senators from the region. I would really like to see us meet with some of the uh, mayors as well. Um, I mean, one plan, I, I'm reading in the governor's budget a proposal to put a parking garage uh, allegedly to support Metro North in Sleepy Hollow. Are you familiar with that proposal? I'm not familiar with that one. There, there are a number of different places where we're doing parking garages for our commuters, but we're also doing it for transit-oriented development. But I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. With that I'd like to talk about that because it's nowhere near Metro North. It's halfway between two stations, and I'm trying to figure out how this is going to be helpful. I'll, I'll Maybe it's part of an economic development plan because there's other development going into that area. Uh, but it's, and, and neither mayor, Tarrytown nor Sleepy Hollow, knows anything about it. So if we could have some conversations sure. about that, that might be helpful. Um, 
I'm not quite sure whether to support it or oppose it because my mayors can't give me any advice because they don't know anything about it. Um, now, there is, there is another issue, and it ties in with the Tappan Zee Bridge. There's a big push for uh, bus rapid transit. Yes. And there's been some discussion as to where it should end. Yes. And there are many who believe, and I'm one of them, that it should go to White Plains. Mm -hmm. Is that feasible? And are you making any plans to facilitate that? Can you handle it on the, on the um, um, central line? First of all, it's feasible. Uh, to my knowledge, over a period of years, bus rapid transit across the new Tappan Zee Bridge has been looked at. Uh, one proposal uh, brings it across into Terrytown, which may not be the most popular. The other comes across all the way to White Plains. Correct. Another one comes across and then down to Deegan, uh, down somewhere in the vicinity of Ridge Hill. But I, I could be wrong. Or, or no, it's, it's, I think it's Gateway Mall. It's, it's further south. Um, and all of them are being studied. Um, and probably the one that, uh, you know, I, I, they need to be studied and they need to be looked at in terms of what do they provide in terms of benefit and total ride time for the people and the impact on the communities that would be affected. When do you expect you'll make some conclusions on this? Because we're trying to push this bus rapid transit. We would like to see something in place by the time the bridge is completed. And I right. think you're an integral part of this. Yes, and I'm not even sure who's, who, who, would, who would have the lead, and it may be us, but I, I don't know at this time. I can't answer the question for you, but I will get back to you on that. Okay. But, and, but I know it's been looked at, and I know those are the alternatives that have been looked at, um, but I'd have to refresh myself in terms of where it stands today. My understanding is that one of the motivations for your previous support of the Tarrytown destination was you had some excess capacity on the Hudson River line, and I was wondering if there was any progress on the discussions to fill that excess capacity by going further north. Right now, I think you end in Poughkeepsie, and there's been some discussion of maybe going a little bit further up the line. Is there any progress on those discussions? That's been looked at a number of times over 10 years. Once again, I don't know where that is at. Um, um, and there are a number of different factors with respect to the BRT in terms of where you bring it. Uh, and it's not just the issue of where there's capacity, but where you have a, a decent travel time for the people that are coming over the bridge. There's right. a number of different factors. Need, need right, but I'd also like to continue the conversations about going further north, because I think there are people who can be served. It's not my district, but I still think it's for the health of the line sure. and bringing more, more riders in. We could go a little bit further north, because I hear complaints from up further north that people don't want to have to jump on Amtrak to get to Manhattan. Right and uh, there's a lot of economic development going on up there. So if there's some way we could be supportive of your extending the line, uh, please let us know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Scoopus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Hello. Um, good to see you. Good and to see you. Uh, I first want to uh, Thank you again, commend you and your staff. Um, you've been uh, both very thoughtful and engaging whenever I've reached out and, and discussed the Orange and Rockland County issues that we have in the MTA. Um, I want to ask you, and I don't expect you to, to know exact numbers off the top of your head, but do you ballpark have an idea of what the proposed uh, ex capital expenditures are for the different divisions in MTA? Uh, in the 2015-2019 capital plan. So when I say divisions, I mean you know west of Hudson, east of Hudson, LIRR, New York City. Do you know what the proposed expenditures were in each of those divisions in the capital program? I, I believe I know them at the agency level. I don't know if I know them in terms of. Uh, yeah, and not system-wide improvements either. I mean, no, you know, I, no improvements I'll have to get those for you. I'll have to get those for you. Okay, I, I I don't have the New York City piece of it. Um, but I, I have some estimates here, uh, um, some r rough calculations. LIRR, about $3.12 billion. And maybe you can you know, say if this sounds about right. Uh, uh, $3.12 billion for Long Island um, in capital improvements in the proposed plan. Uh, east of the Hudson, $1.04 billion in capital improvements. And west of Hudson, Orange and Rockland counties, $70 million. Um, and, you know, again, those aren't system-wide improvements. Those are improvements specific to each of those uh, areas in the MTA. Um, you know, I guess first, you know, do, do those sound about right? And, and if so, are, are those numbers concerning? You know, obviously we have less ridership in Orange and Rockland counties. And um, by any measure, you know, we, we should have less capital improvements compared to, 
uh, Long Island, where you have many, many, many times more riders into and out of New York City, commuters especially. Um, but given the area's potential for growth, I think, you know, we, most people agree that Orange and Rockland um, has the largest potential for growth if we make the proper improvements. Um, but even that aside, I, you know, probably on a, on a um, per capita basis or per rider basis, whatever you want to say, those numbers seem pretty astounding for Orange and Rockland counties. Do you agree with that? First of all, the numbers don't quite sound right, but we'll get you the right numbers. Okay. And so I'll, I'll, I'll have the conversation from what I think the right numbers are. Sure. Uh, when the MTA tries to decide what the next capital program is going to be, there's a number of factors that come into consideration, the first of which is state of good repair for the assets that exist in the system. It's the primary priority that we've got. We've got to protect that which we own and, and have it available for the future generation. So that's the first thing. Size of asset, trillion dollars, the overwhelming majority of the assets in New York City Transit, by far. Sure. Uh, and then, you know, while they're, you know, while they're carrying around the same number of customers between Long Island and Metro North, I'm not so sure the actual size of the asset is about the same in terms of unit, of track mile, of stations, and, and things of that nature. Um, and then we try to, we don't, there's not an exact science where we parcel it out based on that. There's also factors associated with once you get outside of state of good repair and to enhance, improve the level and quality of service, there are other factors that come into play. Some of the things you say where rider growth potential may exist. Uh, and, and, and at the end of that process is how we decide how we're going to, what the size of the program is going to be, what the proposal is that we put on the table, and how we apportion it out in a general sense. Uh, and it's always, you know, a, a combination of uh, puts and takes from a standpoint of where we're putting our investments and where we're making our money. Okay. Um, yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind, uh, or your staff at some point, you know, no immediate rush, but when, when you can, see if you can break down those, uh, those proposed expenditures sure. per division. Um, that would be helpful. Um, you know, I, I, I've spoken with you directly about this, improvements um, in, in the capital program, Midway Yard, along the Port Jervis line, double tracks in Orange and Rockland counties in, in various areas. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can continue those discussions. I know negotiations, negotiations are ongoing um, through the budget, uh, and you know, I'm hopeful that we, we can get uh, some of those items in there sure. and um, take advantage of that potential growth that, that I spoke about. The other issue I want to mention and, and bring up, which I, I have also spoken with you about, but I want to see if there's been any uh, movement or progress, and that is uh, a loop at Secaucus Junction to create a one-seat ride for west of Hudson riders. Um, it is, I guess, sort of informally part of Amtrak's gateway, uh, gateway project. Um, the concern that I have, and that I know um, other area legislators have, is that the loop portion of the gateway project is the basically the very last thing in the project. You know, the tunnels are built, everything else is done, and then you know we look at doing this loop. And uh, you know, there's some <coughs> frustration that if this uh, actually happens at all, that this will happen in you know 2015, 2016, 2017. And that's when we might finally get a one seat ride into New York City. I know there are logistical issues with tunnel capacity. Um, have there been any conversations between the MTA, New Jersey Transit, all the stakeholders to see if we can do something a little sooner than the end of Gateway? The, the only conversations that have occurred so far today is the issue of how we get Gateway launched and how we get all the support we need at a federal states and local levels for the funding for Gateway. It's order of magnitude $15 billion. So it's a challenge, and the, the real stumbling block is the two additional tunnels that were discussed earlier and some infrastructure improvements uh, at two bridges, uh, Portal and uh, Dock on the other side. Uh, of, uh, and, and that's their liability, not ours. Uh, but it's just part of the dialogue. But the critical mass is getting that first thing done, the two tunnels under the, under the Hudson River. So you don't think it's possible to do one? Oh, we can thing? have a dialogue, but I mean, that's the first. We have to get critical mass on that issue first and get funding for that first. Thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Brennan to close. Yes, two, just a couple of updates on status reports on a, some items that haven't been mentioned. Uh, the federal uh, RIF loan for the prior, the three billion for the prior capital plan, what's the status of that? For the PTC? The RIF loan for PTC, positive trend control? No, no, the, uh, the, the, the RIF loan for the prior capital plan, there was a three billion dollar well, that was primarily for east side access, but uh, we've, we've tabled that to pursue the PTC 
for uh, Metro North and Long Island Railroad. So you do not anticipate that the RIF loan? It's been tabled, and, and we're really focused on getting the billion dollar RIF loan, approximately billion dollar RIF loan for the positive train control for Metro North and Long Island. Okay, so, all right. And then uh, the number seven line uh, expansion, what is the status of that? Oh, it's, uh, we expect it to be done, you know, this year, in the first half of this year, and, uh, and operational. Nearly complete? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator. I just have a comment. Thank you for taking this job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been here for I don't know how many years with so many different uh, chairmen. You are clear, you're precise, you're knowledgeable, you don't run around questions, and, uh, and I know you do a wonderful, wonderful job for what I heard. I just have one request. Sure. That mile and a half uh, train to the plane in LaGuardia is 500 million to a billion or somewhere along that length, 500 million being at the low end. From the experts that I've talked to, it's not necessary. How about giving it to upstate transportation <laughs> that are going to speak next so that they have My something to look forward you. to? Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next, the 12 o'clock person, <laughs> Frank Koblitsky, New York Public, Public Transit Association. Whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman DeFrancisco, Chairman Farrell, and members of the Senate of the, and the Assembly for allowing me to testify uh, today. I'm Frank Kobleski. I'm the Executive Director of the Central New York. Can you move York that mic up? And yes, sir. How's this? Good. Any better? Great. I'm the Executive Director of the Central New York Regional Transportation Authority, and I'm here today to represent the citizens of four Central New York counties and six cities who take 12 million rides on our buses each year. I've also been asked in the interest of the committee's time to be, for want of a better phrase, the poster child for the New York Public Transit Association member systems from Long Island to Niagara. Um, I'll get right to the point. There are three principal sources of revenue which together constitute over 60% of our CNY RTA annual income and over which we have no control whatsoever. These are the New York State Operating Assistance, STOA, which you've heard spoken of earlier today, a one quarter percent of mortgage recording tax levied in each member county of the Transit Authority. And as designated by the state, certain funds required to come from each CNY RTA member county as a match for portions of STOA. Over the past six years, those revenue streams in the aggregate have grown on average one half of one percent per year collectively. Despite substantial growth in costs of many large ticket expenditure categories such as health care, bus parts, and a high demand for use of mandated paratransit services, the authority has managed to keep its annual budget increase to an average of 2.2% over that six year period. So in order to sustain our operations with stagnant funding, we have, among other things, cut services and staff, raised fares and the fees for sponsored services, <coughs> reduced employee health care and retirement benefits, converted an unacceptably high level of our federal capital funds into operating funds, and have spent down authority cash reserves, along with a host of other significant actions. We expect to make it through 
the end of the current fiscal year this March 31st by the skin of our teeth, largely through the aforementioned actions and a couple of one-shot infusions. As of April 1, we will hit the wall. If there is no change to our revenue stream, we will have no choice but to initiate drastic cuts in service, especially but not exclusively in Syracuse and Onondaga County. This means, among other things, the elimination of all scheduled service and paratransit services for persons with disabilities at the following time frames. Sundays and holidays all day. Weekdays after 9 p.m., Saturdays after 7 p.m. Further, in the city of Utica, the, elision, the elimination of a significant number of bus trips along with elimination of certain services in our Oswego and Cayuga County operations. This means a serious impact on the economic and personal life of central New Yorkers and the disenfranchisement of many citizens. Over the years, with guidance and suggestion from various sources, we as a statewide industry have suggested ways in which the structural shortcomings of transit funding may be addressed. Bluntly speaking, nothing has taken hold and we are now out of options other than seriously reducing services to our communities. Such reductions run contrary to our sole purpose and mission and cause serious harm to our mutual constituencies and to our local economic conditions. Unfortunately, the 2015-2016 executive budget proposes no growth in operating assistance for upstate and downstate transit systems alike to help us deal with deficits. The New York Public Transit Association recommends an increase in state operating assistance to upstate transit systems of 25 million in the current the new budget to make up for flat funding since 2009 and an increase to downstate suburban systems of 17.4 million. The current structure of state funding created 30 years ago cannot sustain the transit services necessary to grow the upstate economy. A real long-term fix to upstate transit operating assistance is sorely needed. There is also a lack of tr transit capital investment in the executive budget. Despite a state budget windfall of $5.4 billion, the executive budget does not propose any new capital funding <coughs> for upstate transit. As a sidebar, we in, in the non-MTA service areas are grateful to the Senate and the Assembly for their planned distribution of certain capital funds from unspent Bond Act monies. Certainly that will help. We also call for development of a statewide plan to fund the five-year infrastructure needs of the MTA and all other transit systems. Transit is, after all, infrastructure. I'm leaving with you today, in addition to copies of my remarks, a six-year chart which includes the details of the CNYRTA's funding numbers to which I've just referred for illustrative purposes so that you can see uh, what we're talking about in terms of stagnant uh, funding uh, situation. I want to thank you all for this opportunity to discuss this critical condition of public transit, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. I I'm not going to ask you questions very quickly because it's late, and I've got a bet on when we're going to be done tonight. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you've heard all the dialogue that was going on. And what, at least one, for one person from upstate, I really believe we've got to change the formula like we tried to do last year. And if you can give me the components that you, we talked about last year that never got in the budget, it's formula for operating aid, and, and be more regionally balanced in how we approach this on the capital end as well. Yes, so, sir, Senator. There's a lot of people that feel that way, and I hope we can get something done. I certainly hope so, and we do appreciate your attention to our, our situation. Thank you very much. Jenny, Thank you. Jenny, just yes, so, Jim. Just uh, on the same subject, uh, last year you submitted a proposal to us. Uh, and it didn't get accepted, but would you resubmit it? I don't know if it will be, just, just to make sure that it, 
we're studying it and, and it's in the mix. Okay? Certainly. Yeah. And, and over the years, we've had other proposals too, whether it's mortgage recording tax or uh, uh, long lines tax. Throw them all on the table, okay? It's, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Throw it up. Whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Thank folks. you very much. Scott Winger, Executive Director, Railroads of New York. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Scott Wigger. I'm the Executive Director for Railroads in New York. We represent the Freight Rail Association here in New York State. And um, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, try and summarize my written remarks there for you guys. Um, thanks for the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, Maroney represents four Class I railroads here in the state, CSX, Canadian National, Canadian Pacific, and Norfolk Southern and 33 short line and regional railroads in the state. Um, we employ approximately 3,700 individuals between our member railroads combined. Um, we also represent a number of rail related businesses such as surveyors, engineers, material suppliers, and industrial development agencies. With respect to the governor's budget proposal, um, Roni, we wish to exp express our support for the $10 million that is included for freight rail infrastructure projects and the separate $10 million that's included for a mix of freight rail, passenger rail, and port infrastructure projects. Um, if this funding is included, it will represent the third straight year that this essential freight rail program has been uh, funded after having gone the previous three years without receiving any funding. Um, the past two years, this has resulted in 26 um, important rail, freight rail projects being selected for funding. So on behalf of the membership, I wish to express uh, our thanks to the governor and the legislature for uh, funding this essential program. Going forward, we would like to express our request um, to fund this program at a level of $50 million for the year. Um, this will help enhance the rail network and bring it to a state of good repair. Um, it will help statewide economic development efforts by helping to connect our customers with major U.S. and Canadian markets all across the continent. Um, it also helps attract new businesses to New York State who are looking for rail access as a condition of uh, locating their facility. Um, put in perspective, according to the 2009 New York DOT rail plan, they identified a need of $1.9 billion over a five-year period in needs in the rail system, which breaks down to about $375 million per year. And over half of those identified needs relate solely to bringing the existing rail system into a state of good repair. Um, as you'll see attached to my uh, written testimony there, we also did a uh, survey of our members internally um, looking for shovel-ready freight rail projects that are ready to go but need state funding in order to commence. As you'll see in the attached chart, um, we listed, there's 61 projects listed totaling over $160 million worth of projects. So just to illustrate the need that is there. In addition, we request that uh, New York State DOT be primarily responsible for scoring these projects and not uh, the Regional Economic Development Councils in that infrastructure projects are unique from most uh, economic development projects. Um, especially with freight rail projects, the benefits of any one project are usually realized across the entire system and not necessarily in one particular region. Um, it's not like uh, building a factory where, in addition like building a factory where it'll result in X number of direct jobs being created. Instead, any sort of job creation and retention figures are often realized by our customers throughout the system. In addition to that, we also wish to express our support for the two other infrastructure-related economic development proposals contained in the governor's budget. Um, that's the $1.5 billion um, upstate revitalization account and the $115 million general infrastructure fund. Um, we agree with the position that um, the settlement funds are most best spent on infrastructure capital projects, and uh, we like to request, of course, that freight rail projects be eligible for this funding, and also that New York State DOT be the main entity re responsible for scoring the infrastructure projects, as, um, as mentioned before. Our members um, have a very strong commitment to safety. Um, freight rail transportation is safer than truck tra transportation by all accounts. Um, as a result, federal law requires that railroads um, transport certain hazardous materials and not trucks to keep them off the roads. And key stats have shown incredible safety number improvements across the board uh, recently. For example, um, since 2000, the rate of train accidents has dropped 42% overall. 
Um, in addition to all these economic and safety benefits, freight rail also provides environmental benefits when compared to transporting freight by truck. Um, as compared to trucks, freight rail transportation results in less pollution, less fuel consumption, and less roadway congestion, which also helps ease uh, the wear and tear on the roads caused by trucks. Um, overall, just to kind of put that in perspective, according again to the DOT's 2009 rail plan, a 1% shift in goods from truck to rail would save approximately 111 million gallons of fuel annually and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 1.2 million tons. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Nadine Lemon, Policy Coordinator, Tri-State Transportation Campaign. And the next person is William Bonds, Empire State Safety Council. Are you here? Yes. All right, just be here. You just said uh, no? Okay, just want to make sure you're close. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman DeFrancisco and Chairman Farrell and members of the Senate Finance and Assembly Ways and Means Committee for giving Tri-State the opportunity to present testimony. My name is Nadine Lemon and I am the New York and Federal Policy Coordinator for TSTC, a nonprofit policy and advocacy organization working for a more sustainable transportation system. I'd like to address statewide transit needs, the Thruway Authority's budget, and NYSDOT's capital plan. Concerning statewide transit operating and capital needs, we urge you to assure that the needs of our transit systems, up state and down, are met. The executive budget falls far short of that goal. Most importantly, the governor's budget fails to fully fund five-year capital plans for the MTA, nor for the suburban and upstate transit systems. Ahead of the release of the executive budget, these systems identified 33 billion in capital needs over the next five years. Roughly half of, of those 33 billion have identified revenue sources. Across the state, transit systems are dependent on the state to fill the gap. For the MTA, the, bu the executive budget proposes using 400 million of the bank settlement funds for transit infrastructure. There is an additional 750 million general fund transferred to the MTA for capital. And in an unprecedented and troubling move, the, MT the budget takes 121.5 million of dedicated operating revenues from the MTOA account and repurposes those funds for capital expenditures at a time that the suburban and county bus systems could use that money to avoid service cuts. The final sleight of hand in this shell game is yet another diversion of dedicated funds to pay off state debt, this time 20 million from operating and a promise to repeat those diversions through 2019. All totaled, this leaves a gap of roughly 14 billion in unfunded capital needs over five years, about 3 billion annually for the MTA and 141 million taken from the operating fund that should go be going to downstate operating needs. For upstate systems, the picture is equally bleak. Five million from New York Works Fund will go to matching federal dollars for upstate capital needs, leaving a 95 million annual gap in their capital plan. The state operating assistance, STOA, is flat, as been discussed, despite increasing costs and despite rising ridership. Since 2009, they have increased their use of capital funds to fill operating gaps by 45% a fiscally shaky move that essentially destabilizes their future. We support the structural reform that has been discussed earlier today. And in place of addressing the nuts and bolts of our transportation infrastructure, the executive budget allocates $450 million on an air tram to LaGuardia, a proposal that is not included in the $33 billion capital plan for the MTA. This is a short-sighted proposal that siphons money away from critical transit needs today without having made time savings case that this investment is warranted. A new bus service launched in the spring of 2014 has increased the transit trips to LaGuardia by 
the price of this service will likely be much less than air tram service. At a minimum, we propose that this air tram money be used for transit capital programs upstate and down. We request that the legislature stop the diversion of MTA operating funds. Both the new proposed 121 million used for capital and the 20 million used for state debt and find a way to fully fund capital and operating needs across the state. Additionally, while expanded capacity for Metro North is big news and progress to jumpstart development opportunities around the four Bronx stations is undermined by the fact that the governor's de definition of transit-oriented development in the suburbs appears to be limited to vertical parking only. While the governor does acknowledge that vertical parking structures free up land for mixed-use development, he fails to note the indisputable fact that providing parking encourages driving, thus negating the value of development near transit. We encourage the legislature to make sure these funds are used for true, equitable, and affordable TOD. And a good example is in our Connecticut neighbor um, and the, the uh, TOD funding programs that they've done um, over in Connecticut. Concerning the Thruway Authority and the new New York Bridge, as you have noted today in your questions, we still do not have a financial plan for this bridge. The lack of disclosure about how this bridge will be paid for and how high the tolls will need to be to cover the costs is a severe impediment to any kind of public policy discussion about the bridge. The budget takes 1.3 billion of the bank settlement funds for New York State Thruway Authority and uses it to help subsidize drivers' toll costs for one year. What happens after that year? Also notably absent, our capital funds for the seven new bus routes proposed in the Mass Transit Task Force recommendations for the new New York Bridge, despite the promise that this bridge will launch in 2018, which falls within the five-year capital plan window. The budget documents state that federal funds are being sought, but no matching state dollars are provided in the budget. We ask that the legislature assure that capital funds are included in the transit capital plan for this crucial bus service and for the suburban counties on both sides of the bridge. Additionally, we feel it is imperative that the legislature secure the public disclosure of the financial plan um, before the budget deal is reached this year. Concerning NYSDOT and local roads, the MTA has a statutory date on which they must release their five-year capital plan. NYSDOT does not. With the last two-year capital plan, not even key transportation staff within the legislature saw the 50-page Memorandum of Understanding before it was signed. We call on the legislature to establish a more open budgeting process for NYSDOT's operating and capital budgets, including an established date for releasing the project list and the budget. We have concerns about the proposed $150 million for state and local bridges, it is not clear who will be selecting the projects that will be tackled, and it is not clear whether these dollars will be spent on the highest need projects in the state. Additionally, local, town, and county highway superintendents need the flexibility to use this additional funding for roads, culverts, pedestrian, and bicycling infrastructure. In addition to the 150, proposed, 150 million proposed for bridges, we ask that the legislature assure that there is dedicated funding for pedestrian and bicycling infrastructure. 20 million annually for 2015 and beyond would be a solid investment in the vibrancy of our local roads and our downtowns. Finally, I'd like to read a paragraph of testimony that has been submitted to you from the Southern Bronx Watershed Alliance concerning the construction of direct highway access to the Hunts Point Peninsula. This project can be a game changer for hundreds of thousands of residents and hundreds of businesses in the area and region, as well as serve as a turning point on the path to a better, healthier, and more economically vital future for residents and businesses of the South Bronx. This is a crucial moment for all parties involved and the solutions are clear. Specifically, $5 million are needed to perform the environmental analysis that is necessary to take the next step in making the rec these recommendations a reality. This will be a good use of the settlement funds to support economic development in the Bronx. 
The businesses of the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center and throughout the Hunts Point Peninsula have been waiting for decades to, to, to get direct highway access. The South Bronx community has been suffering under unhealthy and dangerous conditions just as long. Consensus has been achieved on the solution, and the time is now for New York State to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Next is William Bonds, and then after that will be Russ Page and Tracy Eldridge. Are they here? Come on down. Good afternoon. May I begin? Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Farrell and uh, members. Empire Safety Council is a New York-based offensive driving sponsor. Uh, we've been in business for over 20 years. We have 800 active instructors, classroom instructors in New York State, and we trained approximately 120,000 students in the defensive driving program last year alone. Yes, Empire conducts both classroom and online defensive driving courses, although a very small percentage of online. I am here today to speak to you about the administration of the online or the internet point insurance reduction programs. Empire is all about highway safety and improving the skills of New York drivers. That's why we're so concerned about the administration of the internet point insurance reduction program in the state. The effectiveness of these programs are supposed to be evaluated by a statistical analysis of driver improvement. New York's analysis of the internet point insurance reduction program is flawed and its evaluation scientifically worthless. The effectiveness study of the internet point insurance reduction pilot conducted in December of 2013, that's a five-year pilot program, which uh, sunset last year has been continued for an extra year, and now I see it's in the budget for one more year. It should be dropped from the budget. There's no legislative approval for it. In fact, it is outrageous that the Department of Motor Vehicle is renewing the Internet Point Insurance Reduction Program based on fraudulent and flawed studies coupled with failed user identi identity validation measures that allow anyone to take the internet course for someone else just by using a telephone. Uh, they've dropped the requirements for biometrics. They also dropped the requirements for testing. If you take an internet course, you don't even have to pass a test. Talk about low student involvement. These effectiveness studies are titled and represented as being conducted by the Institute for Traffic Safety Management and Research at the University of Albany by contract. I have a copy of the study right here. I have never in my life seen a research document, scientific research document, without an author's name. This study is written by a ghostwriter in the Department of Motor Vehicles for some perverse incentives, because this study, this program, internet program, brings in approximately $2 million to the state budget. As I said, it was a pilot program supposed to be passed by the legislature. Uh, the only thing, the only legs that this program has is that it slipped into this budget process. That's the only thing holding it up. It should be discontinued immediately until this program can be studied by verifiable research. Further, in a letter to ESC in a response to a FOIL appeal, the Vice Chancellor for Policy and Chief of Staff for FOIL appeals at SUNY wrote, this evaluation was conducted by the New York State Department of Motor Vehicles, not the University of Albany. Now this research document, which I'll leave for the chairman, uh, says that it's conducted by the Institute for Traffic Safety Research at the University of Albany, and it was not. 
and it was done under a contract number, C000784, for which the university received $51,000 in state funds and never did a single thing. They denied doing the study, but they took the money anyway. We've asked the state controller to investigate that, and we have a meeting coming up with the state controller, hopefully soon. But again, <clears throat> tragically, these studies by deceptive authors are knowingly using invalid methods to perpetuate and promote a state-sponsored program being held out to the public as improving their driving skills and justifying insurance and point reduction benefits, when in fact there is no credible evidence that that is the case. You know, <clears throat> if you take a defensive driving course, you get a 10% discount. If you took it online, somebody else might have taken that course for you. But you still get the discount, even though the online courses are not effective. So who pays for that? Everybody else that has insurance pays for that. And I think that's unfair to everybody else who has to buy insurance. It's also unfair to insurance companies, to say the least. In light of the irregularities involved, at the New York State Department of Motor Vehicles and the Institute for Traffic Safety Management contracted research, I'm urging that the language be included in the budget to suspend the Internet Point Insurance Reduction Program as was proposed by the legislation introduced last session by Senator Ruben Diaz and Assembly, Assemblyman Marcus Crispo. A legislative review should be conducted so that it can be verified as to whether or not the work that New York State DMV had contracted was actually conducted. And I can tell you, gentlemen, uh, Senator Savino also, that it was not. They did no work, and they received $51,000 in state funds. And I think you should be outraged about that. So I'm asking that this be dropped from the budget immediately and let the legislative process, the way the program was designed, during the five years, the pilot program was supposed to be studied by verifiable research, then the legislation decides whether it's continued. Well, it's been continued past the five years, six years, and now going into the seventh year. It must be stopped. Uh, thank you for attending, your attention to this criti critical public safety matter. And I think that this program, the classroom program is good public policy, obviously. Uh, the overall uh, effectiveness of the classroom program is 18.7% of people who take and complete the course uh, have fewer accidents and almost 60% reduction in recidivism, repeat traffic offenses. So that program works, I'm not here about that. I'm here in, in the most timely way regarding the internet point insurance reduction program. It does not teach. And driver safety is the point, and that is the point. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonds. Questions? Any questions? Senator, Senator Savino. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bonds, for your testimony. You know, as you were sitting here, I, you know, I reached into my pocketbook because I just recently took one of the courses online. Um, I, I had a 10% discount on my GEICO policy that expired at the end of the year. They sent me a notice in the mail and said, you know, your 10% insurance discount is set to expire and you can, uh, they gave me a list of uh, internet, you know, online testing companies that I could get a discount on the course itself as a GEICO member, and they recommended them. So I took the test. It's quite tedious, actually, online, because, you know, there's time that has to elapse in between the questions so that you don't television. skip through. Um, and there's this constant, you know, you have to set up a whole uh, uh, identification process, and then every so many questions, it stops and they ask you to dial a number, and then you have to call in and verify that you are who the person is. But as a consumer, if I received that from my insurance company with a list of potential defensive driving courses that I could take both in person or on the internet, 
should we question whether or not those are good programs, or should we assume that they are? Are you? Well, is there a place where a consumer could find an office? Because not everyone has five hours to go to a class. They want to sit in their home and take it, because you can take it over several days if you do it online. We, sure how would you direct people that. to do that? Uh, I might be giving you some bad news. <laughs> it's my understanding from uh, Assemblyman Gant's office that mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Senate does not allow their members or employees to take the online course. What, at, at, in the Senate, but not at home. What you do in your own house is your own business. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Um, so is there a place where consumers can look? Right. How no, would I know? I, it's, up to this, it's up to this budget committee right now. What was supposed to happen is you had a five-year pilot program. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be studied by verifiable research. And then whoever was opposed to it or for it, the legislature could continue it into permanent law if they wanted, but there would be verifiable research. What we've got now is the only thing that's, make, that, that's making this thing stand on its own legs is this budget process that the, the uh, governor has put the in Internet Point Reduction Program into the budget. That's the only thing that gives this thing legs. It's not effective. It doesn't work. Anybody, did you use the telephone as the um, uh, mm -hmm. user identity validation? Senator? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you could have handed that off to anybody else and say, here, finish the course for me. Give them a couple of passwords and, you know, validation. Uh, so, you know, I'm asking you today. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's happened here is, uh, you know, we had an internet uh, pilot program that was supposed to have uh, uh, biometric measures uh, for user identity validation, all been eliminated. Now it's a telephone. That only lasted a few months, all right? Uh, in this study, you have DMV telling you in this budget process, in this document, that uh, they're still using biometric validation measures. They aren't. Every single company by the way, is an out-of-state company, companies, they're all using uh, the telephone, which is not a biometric. Anybody can hand it <laughs> off. And uh, talk about jobs. We have 800 instru active instructors mm -hmm. right now in New York State. They tell me they're losing students. Their class sizes right. are going down. They're losing jobs. They're losing incomes. These are dedicated people, and we're losing jobs in New York State for companies who use their lobbyists to come here and eliminate the crucial part of this program to have any benefit to any of the drivers, and it's just I got it. terrible now I understand. what's happening. So there is no place for the consumer. If any consumer is listening, if mm -hmm. you want to uh, get a benefit from a driver safety education, take a classroom course. And, but I'm saying to you, we can please eliminate this program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next uh, is Russ Page and Tracy Eldridge. And then after that will be Michael Giardino. Dino. 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 Irish. That's Irish. Thank you. And then will be Denise Richardson. James Meerdrink and Adrian Prizo. If you come down, if you're up there, come down. It'll make it easier to do it. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon uh, Chairman D. Francisco, uh, Chairman Farrell, and members of the Joint Legislative Committee. I am Russ Page, President of the New York State Association of Town Superintendents of Highways and Town of Leicester Highway Superintendent. Uh, with me representing the New York State County Highway Superintendents Association is First Vice President Tracy Eldridge with the Hamilton County uh, Highway Superintendent there. We appreciate, we appreciate this opportunity to submit testimony for your consideration as you review the 2015-2016 executive budget. We'd like to begin by sincerely thanking you, the members of the legislature, for your unwavering support of local roads and bridges. As you know, our collective membership is responsible for ensuring the safe operation of 87 percent 
of the state's public roads, half of its bridges, and plowing not only our huge system, but over a quarter of New York State Department of Transportation's roads. Every time there is a winter weather event, the hardworking men and women on our local crews ensure New York's drivers to get to and from work, homes, schools, hospital, and other destinations safely. With all due respect to our DOT colleagues, it was surprising to see in the executive budget include a $50 million appropriation for the agency to purchase additional snow plows since they are responsible for plowing only a fraction of the state's public roads. Simultaneously, the executive budget eliminates last year's $40 million appropriation of winter recovery funds, which is distributed through the CHIPS formula, which can be used by municipalities to purchase their own required snow control equipment. Our association members were extremely optimistic when nearly all of our state's leaders spoke in support of allocating the majority of the $5 billion to the state received in foreign bank settlements, funds to the infrastructure. We were discouraged to see that the budget proposal allocates the bulk of this funding to one region, the MTA and the Thruway Authority. And to read the governor's quote that inf infrastructure today is less about roads and bridges, in my opinion, and it's more about broadband. It is very disappointed to see that funding for programs that provide vital state aid to local highway departments to maintain these roads and bridges are held essentially flat over the next five years in the executive budget. Working with you to guarantee the next five-year highway and bridge capital program truly meets the needs of our state's residents as our top priority. We believe it is essential that parity between the Metropolitan Transportation Authority and DOT capital programs once again be restored. The dedicated Highway and Bridge Trust Fund was created by Governor Mario Cuomo and the legislator in 1991. Then in 1993, the Mass Transit Trust Fund was created. To help fund the latter, they agreed that 34% of the petroleum business tax paid by drivers statewide would go to the MTA. To garner the support of upstate legislators, it was agreed that there would be ongoing parity between the DOT and MTA capital programs. Over the next two decades until 2010, the transit and highway capital programs funding levels were virtually identical. In 2009, the DOT commissioner, Stan G, requested a $25.8 billion five-year capital program and the MTA submitted a $25.9 billion capital program. Ultimately, the MTA adopted a $23.8 billion program and the DOT an $18.6 billion program. The DOT's 2010-2014 program received over $5 billion less than the MTA. Last fall, the MTA submitted its proposed $28.9 billion program for the upcoming five-year program for 2015 to 2020. But we haven't yet seen any capital need requests from the DOT, and this causes us some concern. In November of 2013, we conducted our own need study of the local transportation system. The analysis determined that on average local governments, excluding New York City, should be spending $2.32 billion annually on their highways and bridges. Currently, these municipalities spend about $1 billion annually on these facilities, leaving an annual shortfall of $1.32 billion. The New York State Comptroller studies indicate that a large number of road mileage is deteriorating and many bridges in the state are rated structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. According to a 2014 Comptroller's report, 34% of bridges are deficient and 48% of road pavements are rated fair or poor and getting worse. The Comptroller's estimates that there will be $89 billion in unmet local infrastructure needs over the next 20 years. With much of this shortfall on the already deteriorating local transportation system. Our association has recently formed a task force to assess these studies and to formulate our funding requests. We are realistic that closing a $1.32 billion annual funding gap all at once would be impossible. Therefore, we are urging your support to fund at a minimum CHIPS 
at $617 million and Marticelli at $39.7 million per, the, per year for the next five years. This translates into a $900 million increase over the five-year period it will help us begin to address some of the more critical needs of the local systems. This request, request recognizes that even with the higher CHIPS levels that we propose, there remains an overwhelming number of local roads, bridges, and culverts that require substantial rehabilitation, reconstruction, or full replacement that local, government, local governments simply cannot finance themselves. That is why we also urge the establishment of a multi-year $500 million state aid to local bridge, road, bridge, and culvert program, again, utilizing the CHIPS distribution formula to assure that all New York's municipalities can fund vital road, bridge, and culvert projects based on local need. The 2015-16 executive budget includes a $750 million five-year state local bridge program, $150 million per year that is supposed to repair 100 bridges over that time period. There has been no list calculated of which bridges are targeted, nor are the members of our associations included in the determination. Instead of what's proposed, we request about 67% of this funding, about $500 million, be reallocated by the legislature to fully fund our proposed state aid to local, local, local road, bridge, and culvert program. The state can use the remainder along with other resources available to it, including substantial federal funding for state-owned bridge needs. I'd like to reform the way the transportation is funded. The executive and legislature need to once again make CHIPS a cash-based pay-as-you-go program. Drivers on local roads contribute nearly half of the gas tax collected in this state. Unfortunately, CHIPS only receives a small fraction of these revenues. In addition, general fund transfer of about $726 million to the dedicated Highway and Bridge Trust Fund will be needed to keep the fund balanced again for this upcoming fiscal year. We suggest examining how existing motor vehicle taxes and fees are currently being distributed. 48% of the vehicle miles traveled in New York are on local roads, yet less than 12% of the taxes and fees paid to the state by these drivers go back to maintaining local roads. With the poor condition of both local and state roads and bridges, we believe it is time to consider establishing a more equitable distribution of the gas taxes and motorist fees, one that recognizes the role the local system plays in generating these revenues. In addition, there is currently a state sales tax on motor fuels that generates $480 million annually, none of which is dedicated to transportation. We support legislation to deposit a portion of these revenues in the dedicated highway and bridge trust fund to be used to maintain local roads and bridges. In previous years, even in tough economic times, the legislature has responded to the dire conditions of the state's transportation systems in augmented ships and other local transportation funding. We are now urging similar support in the next five-year transportation capital plan with a significant increase in the levels for CHIPS program to help extend the life of our assets and maintain our vast system. Our associations and the mutual constituencies and communities we serve appreciate the support of our state, local, state elected officials who partner with us to ensure we all get the job done when it comes to providing the public with a safe and functional statewide transportation system, one that supports jobs and economic growth for our communities. We look forward to working with you and your legislative colleagues to seek ways to make more state funding and resources available that more closely reflect the critical needs of our local roads and bridges. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Oaks. Yes, thank you. Uh, for your uh, presentation, and I uh, don't know how much you listened to earlier, but obviously questions that went uh, to the commissioner about, for instance, the 150 million toward bridges, how many of them are local, how many of those are gonna be state. Uh, there's a lot of things up in the air. Uh, Senator DeFrancisco's uh, sense that we ought to be taking some more money and spread it across uh, upstate for transportation, I think. Uh, those things and getting your particular and specific information about where some of the resources come from I think is helpful as we 
uh, get ready to, uh, you know, have this budget negotiated. So thank you for the perspective and for the work that you represent uh, across the state for the county and town highways. And thank you for the help you guys have given us. Yes, no, no. Mr. Brennan. I uh, just want to thank both of you for sitting there listening for some long period of time and let you know uh, I'm, I'm a Brooklyn guy, but I, I do think that the, the bonding of the CHIPS programming, it, program is getting more and more untenable uh, as a policy, uh, you know, because it's going to result in the dedicated highway and bridge trust fund running out of money pretty soon. Mm -hmm. So it's just getting stupider and stupider for us to keep doing that, and we, we must address uh, this, the, yeah. the local road and bridge system. The pressure My mother lives on the east end of Long Island, and she's involved in the campaigns for, how, for highway superintendent on a regular basis, so I know about <laughs> your, your operations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. You were here during the commissioner's testimony? Some of it, yes. Okay, well. I kind of outlined my position, and we'll see what we can do to do what's right. We appreciate that very much. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Michael Giardino, President, New York Aviation Management Association. After that will be Denise Richardson. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman DeFrancisco, Chairman Farrell, and other members of the committees. I am Michael Giardino, President of the New York Aviation Management Association, NIAMA, and Director of Aviation for the Greater Rochester International Airport. NIAMA appreciates this opportunity to testify on the executive budget as it relates to airports. NIAMA represents over 13,000 members and affiliate members. 120 commercial service and general aviation airports, fixed-based operators, consultants, engineers, and other aviation industries and professionals who believe that serious economic development efforts at the state and regional level necessitate strong public investment in our aviation assets and facilities. Airports are economic engines fueling growth in the communities they serve. According to a 2010 study, by the State Department of Transportation, the aviation industry contributes over $50 billion in annual economic activity in New York State, and almost 400,000 state residents work in aviation or aviation-related industries. The economic be benefits of New York State airports are impressive. As a whole, aviation generates $18 billion in payroll and $4.5 billion in state and local tax revenue annually. However, the efficacy of this powerful economic engine and its benefits to New York's citizens is threatened by a critical lack of infrastructure investment, competition from other states, and sluggish state and national economies. The study, New York State Economic Impacts of Aviation, advocated funding critical aviation-related projects NISDOC Commissioner Joan McDonald stated at the time, continued strategic investments in New York State's aviation industry will help rebuild the economy by attracting and retaining businesses that depend on aviation for shipping and receiving goods, while also providing business and recreational travelers with safe, fast, and reliable service. Ironically, this study was released just as the five-year New York State Transportation Bond Act came to an end, and with it, the end of state-funded capital program for airports and the f for the following three years. It was only in the most recent two-year capital plan, with your support, the legislature was able to restore funds, about $17 million total, for an investment through a two-year cap airport capital program. However, you need to be aware that this small level of funding is shared among 90 public use airports across the state. While this funding level in the current two-year plan has provided some valuable financial assistance for vital infrastructure at airports across New York, funding aircraft hangars, repair of existing facilities, 
safety enhancements, and other important projects, it represents about half of what the Bond Act had traditionally funded per year and did nothing to address the three years of zero fundings for airports from 2010 to 2013. In fact, this spending level represents merely 0.2% of the total two-year transporta transportation capital plan just ending. On October 20th, Governor Cuomo hosted Vice President Biden at an event to unveil a comprehensive plan to modernize and revitalize LaGuardia, John F. Kennedy International, Republic, and Stewart International Airports bringing them up to 21st century standards for service, access, and amenities. The plan includes a massive investment in these downstate airports. At the event, the governor was quoted saying, the number one job of government is to promote economic growth and prosperity, and one of the best ways to drive commerce is by investing in inf infrastructure that connects New York with local, national, and international markets. Nyama couldn't agree more. We also believe other airports in the state should be considered for targeted investments, as has been proposed for the downstate sponsored airports. In fact, according to a proclamation issued by the governor last year promoting aviation, it was declared that the state of New York has a significant interest in the continued vitality of general aviation and community airports and that business aviation is a critical tool for companies in New York to improve efficiency, save money, and open up opportunities for rural areas not served by commercial aviation, thereby bringing new business, investment, and jobs to all areas of the state. As you are aware, many upstate airports are constantly seeking to preserve access to commercial service and connections to major cities. Over the last 10 years, these smaller airports have seen their employments or passenger boardings decreasing at a slow but relatively constant rate. General aviation airports that do not have scheduled airline service play a key role in regional business and rely even more upon state funding for revenue producing projects like hangars and fuel farms. Many of these aviation facilities face a daily struggle just to continue. The financial needs of New York's airports are well documented. Based on analysis of FAA approved documents such as airport capital improvement plans, airport master plans, and airport layout plans, the New York State Department of Transportation has estimated that the state will need $4.3 billion to support its aviation goals for the 20 year period between 2010 and 2030 an average of $215 million per year. This investment is necessary to properly maintain the system and allow airports to attract passenger, cargo, and general aviation services, thus supporting the governor's economic development goals. Although federal airport improvement program grants help, they average a total of less than $100 million per year and are limited to certain types of projects with a large allocation traditionally going to the two Port Authority New York, New Jersey airports. Ultimately, this leaves us with an enormous funding shortfall for airport development needs statewide. For example, last year, there was a total of $33.3 million in funding applications filed for airport projects, but only $8 million awarded under the Airport Capital Improvement Program. This helps to demonstrate the huge gap between what is needed for airport development projects and what is ultimately available through the state budget. Lawmakers and the public can scrutinize these state grant supported projects as the awards are routinely publicized through the governor's office or in many instances reported by the local media. I know you'll agree that Niama member airports do a good job maximizing the benefits of these state investments to the traveling public, and to the communities they serve. Consequently, in order to meet the ongoing critical needs of airport infrastructure improvement and development, and address these growing needs going forward, NIAMA is seeking airport capital improvement program funding of $200 million over the next five years. 
as well as a fully funded state AIP program at $8 million a year to match the available federal funding under the FAA Airport Improvement Program. We believe the magnitude of the projected state budget surplus heading into the next fiscal year will help make this level of funding possible. NIAMA is aware of the difficulties and challenges state transportation policymakers face in trying to de develop a new reoccurring aviation, aviation financial assistance program at a time when all transportation systems are under stress from age, heavy use, and deferred maintenance. Similarly, much of the airport infrastructure remains or is becoming ill-suited to spur economic activity. The cost of addressing the growing needs of transportation systems is great, but will only increase if we delay action. New York State must invest now for effective aviation infrastructure programs or face much higher, perhaps prohibitive, prices later when decay has made the challenges far worse. In conclusion, NIAMA and its members across New York State support your efforts to ensure the state pursues policies that are pro-growth and pro-job creation in these tough fiscal times. Strong state investment in our airports is one of these strategies. We look forward to continue to working with you and other state elected officials to ensure that the next five-year capital plan estab establishes appropriate levels of funding, for a robust and permanent airport capital program and a fully funded AIP program. Together, we can enhance our airports and aviation assets in ways that will create new jobs, increase economic development, and improve airport services so that all regions of New York can compete effectively with other states for business aviation and scheduled commer commercial services for the benefit of all New York's citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Denise Richardson, Executive Director, General Contractors <laughs> Association of New York. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Um, you, you have in front of you um, a report that the GCA put out earlier this year about the state of infrastructure both within New York City as well as in the state, and I think the title uh, is self-explanatory. Um, the other speakers have all uh, amply outlined the state's needs, so I am going to, in the interest of time and your patience, uh, truncate my testimony significantly. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the MTA and DOT capital plans. I'm Denise Richardson, Executive Director of the General Contractors Association of New York. The GCA represents the state's unionized heavy civil and public works infrastructure contractors. Our 275 members employ over 20,000 unionized craft and professional workers that are the core of our state's middle class. These workers hail from all over the state and virtually every county in New York. They earn an average annual wage of $87,000 plus benefits and generate an annual estimated $553 million in state income taxes alone. The state's economy is critical to the construction industry, the construction industry which is supported in large measure by the MTA and DOT capital plans is also an integral part of the state's economy and the construction industry and something that is not often given uh, due process in terms of its vital role in the state's overall economic development. And I would like to touch on one thing that has not been mentioned today that historically New York's transportation network has benefited from federal funding. And both the NYSDOT and the MTA capital programs that are currently up for discussion assume the, the same continued level of federal funding. However, the MTA has relied on its federal funding to pay for nearly one-third of the capital program and approximately half of NYSDOT's program has been federally funded in previous years. But the, federal, the existing federal transportation bill expired in 2013 and the current extension expires in May. It is well known that the federal gas tax is no longer sufficient to fund the nation's transportation needs and there is no consensus in Congress on a future bill. It is now February. 
almost, and the bill expires in May. This means that New York must take a new look at our transportation needs and take the steps to fund our own program. We cannot cede our economic future to the whims of Congress, and it is unlikely that we will have a new federal transportation bill this year. New York must enact a fully funded five-year capital program for both NYSDOT and the MTA. The two systems work in tandem, not in opposition, and truly are the fiber that knits the state's diverse economy into the whole. The state's economic future and competitive advantage depend on a robust mass transit as well as road and bridge funded program. Our recommendations include funding and approving the fully funded five-year capital program for both the MTA, NYSDOT, as well as the Thruway Authority, and the programs need to be sufficient to address their critical infrastructure needs. The proposed $750 million in additional state investments for the MTA and the DOT capital plans over five years, or basically $150 million a year, is insufficient to meet capital needs. Second, we urge that the diversion of dedicated MTA taxes and fees for state debt payment obligations on, on service contract bonds that were used to support prior capital programs be stopped. It is no longer appropriate for the state to take dedicated funding and divert it to other commitments that it had previously made to fund the payback of those bonds. Finally, we urge that increase, the increase of revenues dedicated to transportation infrastructure investments. In 2014, 15 states passed measures that increased revenue for transportation investments, and an additional 13 states are now considering their own transportation funding legislation. New York needs to be one of them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jane Meerdink, projector, projected coordinator, Parks and Trails of New York. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of New York's bicyclists and walkers and in support of the infrastructure that supports their active transportation choices. You have my full testimony, but I'll um, summarize in the interest of time. I'm James Meerdink, project coordinator at Parks and Trails New York. For 30 years, Parks and Trails New York has been the leading advocate for parks and trails throughout the state. In 2013, we joined the New York Bicycling Coalition, Tri-State Transportation Campaign, and other bicycle pedestrian advocates to form New Yorkers for active transportation, a coalition dedicated to securing equitable funding for non-motorized transportation options. Today, I will be speaking on behalf of this coalition whose partners have reviewed these remarks. For more than two decades, federal <coughs> transportation bills have provided New York communities with the funds to build bicycle and pedestrian paths, sidewalks, bike lanes, and other infrastructure that encourages persons of all ages and abilities to engage in bicycling and walking. However, the future of this federal funding <laughs> is uncertain as Congress considers reauthorization of the current federal transportation bill, MAP 21, this spring. MAP 21 represented a 30% reduction in funding for bicycle and pedestrian programs compared to the previous federal transportation bill. Moreover, we may not see any dedicated funding for these projects in the next federal transportation bill. All of this comes at a time when we hear from local officials across the state that they are eager to build infrastructure that supports bicycling and walking in their communities. Presently, bicycle, pedestrian, and trail projects represent less than 2% of New York's transportation funding. With demand higher than ever, New York should be increasing the level of funding for these projects. We ask that pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure projects receive a continuous dedicated funding of $20 million annually in fiscal, fiscal year 2015, 2016, and beyond. This amount will return funding levels to those enjoyed in New York before the federal government's 30% decrease. Why should the state fund active transportation infrastructure? Because we must, sure that, we must ensure that all communities have complete streets with bike lanes, sidewalks, traffic calming measures, crosswalks, and nearby multi-use trails. Everyone, regardless of age or ability, should have the opportunity to safely walk and bike every day. However, currently, 29% of all fatalities on New York's roads involve bicycle, bicyclists and pedestrians. This is the highest rate in the nation. We need to change this. We also ask that the legislature close the remaining gaps in the 360-mile Erie Canalway Trail. Um, I want to thank 
Assemblymember Oaks, uh, Senator Ort, and Senator DeFrancisco for their comments and questions earlier today about the uh, canal system and the Canalway Trail. Stretching from Buffalo to Albany, the Erie Canalway Trail is the backbone of the state's trail system and a significant economic driver for upstate New York. We estimate that um, it results in $253 million in related sales and supports over 3,000 jobs. With 280 miles now open to the public, the Erie Canalway Trail is more than 78% complete and on its way to becoming a premier tourist destination for cyclists and other outdoor enthusiasts, as well as the longest trail of its kind in the, in the nation. It is our goal to have the remaining 80 miles of trail under construction or in design by the bicentennial of the start of construction of the Erie Canal in 2017. I'd like to just uh, share a few statistics with you today. Trails, bike paths, wa and walkable, bike bikeable communities are key assets in helping the state and loca localities attract tax-paying businesses and a high-quality workforce. In the new New York, trails and walkable, bikeable communities are what companies and young professionals are seeking when deciding to relo relocate. Of those millennials that we all want to attract and retain, two-thirds seek walkable places in town centers even if they prefer to live in a suburb, 26% do not have a driver's license, and 45% report making a conscious effort to replace driving with alternative forms of transportation. Sidewalks and other places to walk, such as trails, also rank as one of the top priorities with home buyers. The 2013 Community Preference Survey, conducted on behalf of the National Association of Realtors, found that 80% of those polled considered having sidewalks and places to take a walk one of their top priorities when, they, when deciding where they would like to live. Walkability ranked higher even than high-quality public schools in this survey. So while the future of federal funding for active transportation is in doubt, the state's ability to act has not been curtailed. In addition to dedicated funding, New York State can, do, can act through the Department of Transportation's five-year capital plan, which is currently being developed. As others have earlier today, I call, we call on the legislature to establish a more open budgeting process for NYSDOT's operating and capital budgets. The Metropolitan Transportation Authority has a statutory date on which they must release their five-year capital plan. NYSDOT should have a similar requirement in order to ensure ample time for full consideration of their plan. Finally, to support New York's expanding role as a leader in bicycle-related tourism, we urge the legislature to support roll-on bicycle service on all Amtrak passenger, tra passenger trains. Many cyclists wish to cycle one way and take the train back to their starting location. Unfortunately, despite the fact that bicycles are allowed on trains in other parts of the country, Amtrak prohibits bikes from being rolled onto all but one of its passenger lines. In closing, active transportation is an essential element of the state's historic commitment to a transportation system that prioritizes safety of users, economic development, and accessibility for all New Yorkers. This commitment must be matched by funding that enables local communities to build and maintain road, sidewalk, and trail networks that support quality of life for residents, regardless of the ebb and flow of federal transportation dollars. Demand for this infrastructure has never been greater. On behalf of New Yorkers for Active Trans of the I'm sorry, on behalf of the New Yorkers for Active Transportation Coalition, which includes the New York Bicycling Coalition and Tri-State Transportation Campaign, we look forward to working with the legislature and the state's transportation agencies to improve the effectiveness and safety of our shared transportation system. Thank you. Thank you. Adam Prezio. Management, manager of Governmental Affairs, Center for Disabilities Rights. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I will be brief. You have my full comments. Uh, my name, thank you to the uh, Joint Committee for this opportunity to speak. My name is Adam Prizio. I am the Manager of Government Affairs at the Center for Disability Rights. The Center for Disability Rights is a disability-led, not-for-profit organization in Rochester, New York. Uh, we advocate for the full integration, independence, and civil rights of people with disabilities, and we provide services to uh, assist people in exercising those rights in the context of an independent living framework. Um, the state of the state uh, contained important 
transportation infrastructure projects and improvements. And uh, my organization and the disability community, I think, generally tend to favor these sorts of improvements because and to the extent that they include uh, modernization and accessibility features as required under the ADA Title II. Uh, so the four new stations in the Bronx, the uh, air train to LaGuardia, um, the expansion of Penn Station, to the extent that these things will enable people with disabilities to more fully participate in the community, um, we think they're good ideas because uh, transportation is a key component of people living in the community. Um, more and more people with disabilities are coming out of nursing facilities and moving into the community and becoming integrated into, um, into home and community living. <coughs> Transportation is an important part of this because if we can't get to the store, if we can't get to our health care provider's office, uh, then we can't live. We're back to the institution. If we can't get to work, if we can't get to yeah. parks or the sports arena or to a family or friend's house, then we're not participating in the community. We're being denied by inaccessible transportation the opportunity to participate in community. Um, I want to bring to the attention of the committee two policies that are taking shape <laughs> elsewhere um, in the state. The Olmstead Plan, um, which is a product of the governor's Olmstead Commission to um, improve community living opportunities for people with disabilities. The Olmstead Plan calls for the Department of Health to transition 10% of the population uh, of long-term nursing facilities into the community over five years, which is approximately 1,800 people per year uh, that will be coming into the community and that will need uh, more accessible transportation. Uh, this is a statewide effort, um, so it's not just in the city. Uh, it's, it's it's across the state. Uh, if people can't live in the community, they'll go back to the institution in violation of both their civil rights and um, at more expense to the state. The second policy I want to talk about is community first choice, which the state is um, expected to implement this year. Community first choice provides for additional <laughs> funding for home and community based services and supports. Uh, my organization conducted a fiscal analysis. Um, and we believe that between $299 million and $439 million per year can be brought into the state Medicaid budget uh, through Community First Choice, depending on how many people are able to successfully transition out of institutions and live in home and community settings. So not only is this a civil rights issue, but it's an issue for the fiscal health of the state. Um, and if transportation, if ex accessible transportation is, is an obstacle to people being able to live in the communities, it's going to be a, it's a problem for the state's fiscal health as well as a civil rights issue. So in this context, I would point out to the committee that accessibility is not mentioned anywhere in the transportation budget, and neither is disability. Um, and I would urge the committee to um, take steps to make accessibility a priority in, um, in its sort of, in, the, in this budget procedure. It's nearly 25 years since the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, there's been, and there are still gaps in uh, transportation. There are still gaps. People with disabilities are still stuck in their homes, or if they're able to get out, they, they use paratransit, which in most parts of, certainly upstate, um, is not responsive. Uh, it's not uncommon in Rochester, New York, for a person to be on hold for 45 minutes to schedule a paratransit ride. Um, and paratransit operators have incentive to minimize the number of rides that they offer uh, because the, the fiscal incentives are, are against them. It, it costs between 35 and $45 per trip and they receive a fare of $2. Uh, so when paratransit is available, it's, um, people will often only be able to get a ride that's, say, two or three hours before their doctor's appointment. So you're talking about a three or four hour window of idleness um, simply to go to the doctor.
not in the transportation budget, but uh, worthy of the Joint Committee's attention. Uh, there are two initiatives in the health budget. The Olmsted Mobility Pilot Project, which is a Department of Health project to improve community living outcomes uh, by involving. Are you uh, scheduled to appear before the Health Committee? Yes. We don't have to hear it twice. Why don't you wait till that time comes? Thank you, sir. Okay. People with disabilities are coming into the community in greater and greater numbers. And as we get here, um, it's important not to let a lack of accessible transportation hold us back. Um, finally, I heard earlier today that uh, funding for upstate transportation systems will, um, may cause those systems to, to leave people with disabilities without paratransit access um, during Sundays and holidays. And uh, this means that people with disabilities will not be able to visit their families for Sunday dinner, will not be able to be uh, with their families on holidays. And in a budget this size, um, frankly, that strikes me as indecent, and I encourage the committee to do something about that. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. How long has your organization been in existence? Uh, my organization has been around for 25 years this year. And has it always had the same name, Centers for Disabilities Rights? That's my belief. Okay. The only reason I'm asking, I don't think disabilities have rights. People with disabilities may have rights. Does that distinction make any sense? <laughs> that's, all. I, uh, that's enough. <laughs> We've all had a long day. That's how I get off. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Yes, sir. Is there anything in this budget that makes life better for, for people with special needs in the in, from a money point of view? In the transportation budget? Yeah. I mean, only to the extent that the capital improvements projects um, improve okay. accessibility. But there's nothing directed to the needs of people with special needs in this budget. Not that we've seen. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, that's it? That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We are closed down until Monday morning at 9.30. Where we'll be seeing you again, I would imagine, at some point, the health budget. Okay. Thank